Habir Dugula was no stranger to death. He knew there were many ways to die in Somalia, most of them brutal. The land itself could kill a man without water in a matter of hours. Old age rarely claimed a life here. The parched and unforgiving earth produced next to nothing to feed ten million hungry mouths. Naive reporters seemed to take a morbid pride in denouncing his nation as a seething hotbed of outlaws, thieves, and genocidal maniacs. Intrusion by CARE, UNICEF, the Red Cross, and the United Nations inevitably followed. Starvation had laid waste to nearly a half million Somalis in the past five years, with another two million on the brink, if he was inclined to believe Red Cross statistics. Those numbers, Dagula thought, were greatly exaggerated. Propaganda intended to give the West excuses to invade his nation, strip him of power, and return Somalia to the control of white colonial imperialists. It was true that he was branded the exterminator by the United Nations and the hysterical Western media. To some extent, he was responsible for the plight of the starving, at least in the area he controlled south of the city. He had his reasons to limit the population. First, they would want food. Then, bellies full, they would want education, which would inevitably lead to a perception of monstrous injustice, and they'd blame him. Food would lead to an uprising at his front door. Not if he could help it. There would always be too many hungry mouths to feed, he knew. Always the poor and the needy who would fall by the wayside. And he didn't intend to let the great unwashed, the weak and the vanquished, hold him back from climbing the next rung up the ladder of power and glory. As long as he didn't have to look at the dying masses on his doorstep, there was no point in burdening himself with guilt. There was widespread disease, savaging mostly the children, but again, if he didn't have to see it, Dagula was willing and happy to ignore it. Then there was civil war, consuming another half million or so lives in the past decade, what with roughly 500 clans divided into 26 main factions, all of them heavily armed, shooting up one another in a running bloodbath with no end in sight. Why bother, he decided, to attempt to search for reason when madness and the law of the gun ruled his country? How could a man show mercy when his own survival was always in question? As leader of his clan, there was a bottom line, every bit as important as seeing the next sunrise. If death, war, famine and pestilence appeared destined to push millions of Somalis to the edge of the abyss, the least he could do for himself, and the continued survival of his clan, was to profit from the madness somehow. Even in the hell that was his country, Cash was still king. So was the power of the gun. Dugula had a busy day ahead. He rose from behind his desk, checking the wall map and factoring in the grueling stretch of miles needed to take him to the afflicted village and its refugee camp due southwest of Mogadishu. Three events were on the day's agenda. A long, hot twelve hours and more before him. Dugula knew that once he stepped outside, the sweat would start to flow free and unchecked. Discomfort he could live with, but uncertainty he wouldn't entertain. Since not having answers to certain questions, not knowing who or where his enemies were, could kill. Indeed, the first outbreak of sweat would be brought on by more than just the brutal hammering of sunlight. One of his men swept through the door, his AK-47 leading the way. They are on Aboiga Street. Perhaps three minutes remain before they arrive. <clears throat> Dugula picked up his own AK-47. Assemble everyone in the courtyard. Same drill as before. Do it quickly. And may God pity the first man who is not ready to fight to the death, if necessary. Because I will not show mercy to cowards. Understood. White men in Somalia were a rare sight. It was beyond strange, malevolent perhaps, how these whites had ingratiated themselves to a rival clan, even if they had thrown around large sums of cash. Who were they? CIA? Mercenaries? The first time he had met them, they had dropped off an envelope bulging with U.S. dollars, saying only that they would require his help, that he would be well compensated for some unspecified act. Dugula had some idea what they wanted, catching the whispers from his various informants around the city, but he needed to hear them say it out loud. <laughs> Slipping on his dark sunglasses, he marched outside, grimacing at the first blast of heat. Dugula was halfway across the courtyard, counting his own men, spread along both walls, poised to catch the visitors in a crossfire, when the first wave of the technicals rolled through the gate. The technicals were a common sight all over Mogadishu. 
the Toyota pickups or anything else on wheels with roofs chopped off to allow free and easy fields of fire for 50 caliber machine guns or tow rockets. The truck beds, he noted, were crammed with gunmen, most of them more young, teenage thugs. The glaze in their eyes from the amphetamine-like high of cot warned him they were edged out no telling what they would do. He saw their fingers tight around the triggers of assault rifles, ready to shoot for little or no reason. He stood his ground, dust in his face, as the 13 technicals lurched to a halt. The black minivan was last, carrying its mystery whites, two motorbikes with gunmen flanking the vehicle. Dagula waited, pulse drumming in his skull. Three men in brown fatigue stepped out. AKs were draped across their shoulders, spare banana clips wedged in their waistbands. Commando daggers were sheathed at their hips. As they cut the gap, Dagula found the black hoods concealing their identities unsettling for a moment. He wasn't sure what to make of this display, wondering if their desire to keep their faces hidden was genuine or some special significance. If he chose, he could have them followed again, but the word from his trackers was that these men bounced all over Mogadishu in the black van, changing vehicles in and out of safe houses, able to vanish into the air. It made him wonder how accurate the reports were, whom he could trust. Money always had a way of shifting allegiances. The man in the middle of their loose formation, the one Dagula thought of as Blue Eyes, held his stare. Dagula was certain he was grinning to himself. Arab bastard. Dagula stifled the urge to whip the assault rifle off his shoulder and blaze away. He felt himself being measured, blue eyes laughing back at him. We have to stop meeting like this, Javi. Your little slice of hell on earth is starting to make even me a little jumpy. And I've been down some dark alleys in my day. Perhaps you would prefer we do this on some sandy beach, sipping iced tea. Right, after a nice dip in the Indian Ocean. No, thanks. I'd rather swim with sharks of the human variety. And do me and yourself a favor when we leave here. Leave your own Murion at home. If I start seeing a bunch of your shooters on my bumper, I'm going to begin thinking ours can never be a working and profitable relationship. Perhaps if I knew exactly what you wanted? If I were to understand what is this working relationship to which you refer? The white, with the scar on his hand, produced a thick envelope from behind his back. It's this. $50,000 American. An advance, if you agree. But you need to understand the rules first, Hobby. Then we can play ball. You love money, you want power, and you want to be top dog on the block. You're on every shit list from UNICEF to the White House. Thing is, what we are, we're your three wise men come here bearing gifts. Dagula wondered if this act was scripted and who exactly was in charge between them. How magnanimous. To what do I owe this great honor? Number three had blackness behind the slit where his left eye was. Dagula assumed there was a patch covering some war memento. In the coming days, there are going to be several significant events within and beyond your borders. We prefer to not stand here in this heat and dust with sky spies framing our every move, answering a bunch of questions that only time and decisive action will answer in the first place. First, we're taking the human cargo you've smuggled in country. They're part of the plan. They go with us. Dagula's gut clenched. The thought crossed his mind that they were some sort of international bounty hunters or CIA black ops, come to either kill or capture the holy freedom fighters he had been paid to grant safe haven to. Relax, Hobby. We're not here to kill or arrest those who are under the care of your golden umbrella. Truth be known, their leaders are aware of our presence here. Call it a blessing from Allah, a strange union between infidels and Islam. But it's arranged, and your guests have already agreed to go the distance. Dagula bared his teeth, a half-smile, half-grimace, and waved a hand. This is all very mysterious and suspicious. You talk ten ways out of your mouth, but you say little. No time to stand around and gnaw on nerves or question what's damn near an act of God being dumped in your lap. You accept on faith, and you'll be well rewarded. There is a number inside the envelope. Call it. A cutout to a very important individual in a country better left unnamed at this time, but an individual you know well through your own website. He'll back our story, and he's backing us. You are telling me what, exactly? Rule number one. You're on a need-to-know basis. That is, 
until the time comes when your role will become larger than the scourge of Muhammad's head-lopping converters. Then it will be defined. A blinding light that will grant you, shall we say, instant transformation. Super Warlord. That could be you. I'm listening. You recruit some of these fighters for your clan from other countries, use them to wipe out rivals, help keep the iron grip on your turf. They train here, they plan their operations when they're not beefing up your troops. Surprised? Javi, we know everything that goes on in this neck of the woods. Hey, as far as some folks you know are concerned, we're the next best thing to Allah. Think of us as damn near supernatural. The Alpha and the Omega, that's us. And we're here to tell you what is in motion cannot be aborted. We don't need to spell out the organizations of the fighters you have in country. All you really need to know is they're with us. More truth. These fighters have already been contacted by their leaders weeks back. And they've been ordered to accept our terms without conditions. They know some of the score. Not much, but the truth will be revealed in due course. Their leaders know something of the endgame. All parties, down to you, have agreed. You want endgame speculation? What will go down could prove one of the most fearsome blows Islam has ever struck against the infidels. With or without you, it's a done deal. And Umi Hagan? You come to Somalia, three wise white men, and you go straight to my main rival. How much did you pay him? And if I said yes to this strange offer, ask no questions, go along. A blind man in the dark among the wolves and hyenas. What then? Do you set Hagen's men against me? It's like this, Abi. We hedged our bets. Hagen's giving up some fighters, and yeah, he's been paid. Enough to keep the troops in cot and whores for a while. But it's time to put aside all this petty squabbling over real estate. Fact is, you're stronger than Umir. More men, more guns, more contacts from Cairo to Karachi. But we'll pencil in the number two man on the roster if we have to. Hey, you need to start thinking more about your future. Leaving the hand ringing to the losing side. Now's the time. Think big. As in immortality big. Your name could end up being glorified by the entire Muslim world. Feared by your enemies for decades to come. You're a rising star. Could be bigger than Osama if you want. Let me ask you. You don't want to just be a second string warlord creaking around this shit all in your golden years, do you? I would think that your ambitions would be a little bit larger than exterminating all those hungry mouths you and the 20-something other clans won't feed. Why, you rip off plane loads of UN aid and resell it across the borders. Chump change compared to what we're offering you. Now you insult me in front of my men. No offense intended. Just the hard facts. We won't waste your time. Don't waste ours. We're thinking you've got a big day ahead of you. Probably heading out to exterminate some camp infested with disease. Or take down another UN plane. How did they know so much, Dagula wondered? Or were they guessing? Perhaps his secured phones and fax weren't so secure. Or maybe Hakan had infiltrated his clan with spies. In or out? No is no, and we're fine with that. You can go back to business as usual. Stay small. Decision time. Dump or jump off the crapper? Dagula took a few moments, peering into those slitted gazes. Eyes, he decided, without emotion or soul. It was true that he wanted far more for himself than remaining where he was, doing what he'd done. The suggestion on their part was that certain freedom-fighting organizations, of which at least 40 members were under his protective umbrella, had already agreed to some undefined role for some allegedly grand but mysterious events. If he declined, then what? Risk some long, protracted war with rivals who supposedly were ready to leap on board for this so-called big event? Let rivals grab the glory these whites were offering? The Gula felt curiosity and greed wrestle him to the brink of acceptance. How much money? Is that a yes? The money? Two million, deposited into a numbered account in one of several European banks of your choice. Half on acceptance, the other half when the curtain drops on the last act. I have a large clan, many men to feed, house, equip, arm. They say there are over two million assault rifles in Mogadishu. But you're right. My ambitions are bigger than just having my men ride around in technicals with outdated Russian machine guns. You demand much. Tell me next to nothing. I hear promises, words, big plans. I would like to hear how badly you are willing to enlist my services. Two million dollars is not enough. Four million, Javi. That's as high as we can go. 
de Gula already had an answer to give them. But the fact that they had upped the ante with little hesitation told him they had come to the bargaining table prepared to lowball his services. So be it, he decided. Depending on what the future held, how great the risk, whatever his undeclared role in this big event, he could always ask for, no, demand more money. If he was going to be allied with other Muslims for some glorious battle against the infidels, how could a mere three Westerners possibly dare to think they could deceive him into a course of action that would destroy him and the clan? When will you need these services of myself and my men? Soon. Carry on with your day. You'll know when it's begun. Then, the envelope, please. If it was true a man learned more from failure than success, Ben Collins knew he was in no position to test that theory. In his line of work, there were no second chances. Failure wasn't an option. Failure spelled death. In Black Ops, he made it a point to see to it that losing was for the other guy. The stack of boxes stamped CARE deep in the aft of the C-130 would be the last thing the Warlord's frontline marauders saw when they hit the ramp. The ruse didn't stop with this first strike, but what others didn't know wouldn't kill them. At least not yet. It was just about time to get down to dirty business. Murky waters, he knew, that had been chummed since the first bunch of Al-Qaeda and Taliban criminals had been dumped off at Gitmo. There was blood in that water again, flesh to consume. But it all went way beyond waxing a bunch of thugs and terrorists in some of the most dangerous godforsaken real estate this side of hell. Sure, there were bad guys to bag, chain, thrust under military gavel. There was a trial to consider, arranged to go down in secrecy. Collins caught himself projecting and pulled back. This was only the first giant leap. The goal line was way off in the distant horizon. No point in getting ahead. There were still details to nail down, and he could be sure, given the nature of black ops and the usual chaos and confusion of battle, that more than a few problems would crop up along the way. The ex-Delta Force Major raked a stare over the other six black ops in the plane. Seven more commandos on the ground were moving in right then, on schedule to help light the fuse. According to the two Hummers transponders, they were three miles out, closing hard with Dugula and 21 henchmen rolling across the plane. The latest round of the exterminator's methods of population control was framed live and in color on another monitor. Behind his ground force, two Blackhawks and one Apache were picking up the rear, covering all bases. All set. No blue UN helmets, doctors, or relief workers were on board. This was no mission of mercy, or another group of unarmed do-gooders from Red Cross or UNICEF getting ripped off by Dugula. He studied his men's faces, but there was no need to sound off with last-minute patent speeches to shore up resolve. They knew the drill, briefed thoroughly for days, the details gone over one last time on the company air base just inside the Kenyan border, before he put the radio call on the special UN frequency to Dugula that they were moving and to coordinate the drop-off. All of them were battle-hardened CIA men, specifically Special Operations Division, or ex-military, with more than a few Afghanistan forays notched on some of their belts. It was reassuring to know he was wading into the fire with pros. To an operative, they had on their war faces, togged in brown camos, M16, M203 combos, the lead weapon. Webbing, combat vests, all of it stuffed and hung with spare grenades and clips. Then on down to Beretta 92F sidearms on the hip, commando daggers sheathed on the lower leg. The blades were last resort. Collins had made it clear earlier this was blast and burn, the faces of Dagula and a few of his top lieutenants committed to memory. Once they blasted off the ramp, it was going to be a turkey shoot for the most part. Somali thugs hemmed in, turning tail when the flying hammer dropped on them from above. He glanced at their own two armored Hummers, one mounted M60 machine gun, belted and ready to rip. The other vehicle, with its tow anti-tank missiles, would be out of the gate first. Altogether, plenty of firepower, muscle, experience, and determination to win the day against a bunch of one-time camel herders who now had control of Mogadishu, because none of the other competing clans had the guns or the guts to stand up to them. He took a moment to ponder the sudden curveball thrown him by superiors. Cobra Force 12 was his diamond, with three successful missions under the belt. 
With his track record in Delta, and later on working with the company, he had made friends in high and powerful places. Hell, he was a damn hero, in fact. Enough medals and ribbons to fill a steamer trunk. But this one wasn't for God and country. What was now in motion, at least the campaign given the thumbs up by the White House, was pretty much his show. But there was a wild card out there with the ground team. It wasn't entirely true that Collins was solely in charge. There was this odd man out, preying on his thoughts, some hotshot hardballer, according to his dossier, dropped in his lap at the 11th hour. The order to put the man on the team had come straight from the president, wildcard inserted as co-leader of Cobra Force. Beyond some irritation and anxiety, a dig to professional pride that he was forced to share all tactical and command decisions, the tall dark man tagged wildcard made him a little nervous, what with the question as to exactly why the White House shoved him onto the mission in the first place. He wanted to believe the colonel, with a record full of deletions that left little doubt he was likewise black ops, was simply there as an extra gun, with supposedly all the combat experience in the world to aid, assist, and kick much additional ass. Or was it something else? Was Wildcard a watchdog? Had someone in the loop gotten cold feet, gone running to the higher-ups, if just to save his own skin? No matter. If Wildcard had some personal agenda, if he proved a threat to the bigger picture, well, Collins knew there was an answer for that problem. Dragon One Cobra Leader. Cobra Leader, go. You boys strap in, we're going down. Showtime. Roger. Stick to the plan, Dragon One, no matter how hot it gets out there. Aye, aye. Catch you on the flip side. Good luck. Dragon One, over and out. Collins grabbed a seat, fastened on the webbing as the bird began to descend. Round one was coming up, but it was only the beginning. Shortly, if nothing else, one question about Wildcard would be answered. And if the odd man out couldn't pull his weight, wasn't as good as advertised, he would just be one less hassle to eliminate with a bullet in the near future. The picture, small or large, both fuzzy at the moment, would clear up soon enough. Spilled blood always had a way of separating the lions from the jackals. In a perfect world, there would be no Habir Dugula. The latest in a long line of vicious warlords in Somalia, he was all the proof Poland needed that evil was alive and well on Earth. But Habir Dagula was only one reason he had undertaken this mission. They were almost there, in position to give Dagula's mass murderers and armed profiteers a dose of their own poison. Poland spotted the C-130 coming in for a landing on the plane, the giant bird vanishing from sight a moment later above the lip of the wadi. Gripping his M16 M203 combo, adrenaline burning, Bolin shot a look at his driver, a twist to Cobra Leader's original attack plan flaring to mind. On the surface, the strike could in all probability work, he reasoned. For openers, they were all seasoned pros, whereas Dagula and Goons were accustomed, for the most part, to slaughtering their unarmed countrymen. Sure, there was the usual street fighting in Mogadishu with rival clans. However, as a rule of thumb, Dagula's thugs outnumbered the competition, and any sustained shooting match was spurred more by hair-trigger impulse than skill and cold tactics on an even battlefield. Just the same, Bola knew a wild bullet, even one fired in haste or panic, could score flesh. Timing was the key ingredient, unleashing the lightning and thunder in sync. It was a brazen play, no two ways about it. Collins and company shooting their way off the ramp, Hummers rampaging into the stunned forces of Dugula, mowing them down off the starting line. The Blackhawks and the Apache, a mile or more to their rear, flying nap of the earth and jamming any atypical Somali substandard radar in the area, were a definite added bonus. If Dugula stuck to form, he would hang back while his thugs boarded the C-130, then load up the APCs and transports parked at the command post of the Warlord's airfield. They would stock their warehouses with food and medicine slated for the sick and starving, sell it to other lesser-ranking warlords or whoever else could pay the going rate. Bolin expected that once Dagula found they weren't faced with well-intentioned UN or Red Cross workers, the warlord would bolt. The soldier gave a moment's thought to the mission, the reasons why he had accepted. For starters, it angered Bolin deeply that in this part of the world, those who needed food and medicine the most were not only denied the basics, but viewed as a blight to be removed from the body whole. Dagula had been on the soldier's removal list for some time. 
in a land where lawlessness ruled, where there wasn't even the first fundamental institution, it was impossible to number Dagula's victims. Western intelligence claimed that entire villages had been wiped off the plains in a genocidal campaign to spread fear and terror. A little over three days ago, Bolan had been standing down at Stony Man Farm, the ultra-covert intelligence agency in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Hal Brugnola, a high-ranking official of the Justice Department, who was, in addition to routine justice duties, a cutout between the President of the United States and the farm, had presented the soldier with quite the unusual mission. How the channels ran through the various intelligence agencies to launch this mission, and who exactly had brainstormed this campaign, not even Brugnola was sure. But the man, who greenlighted all Stony Man operations, wanted what he called the best of the best on board a black ops team called Cobra Force 12. It seemed the president, or whoever had put the idea in his head, felt the need for a second holding pen outside Guantanamo Bay, which had gotten a bit overcrowded with bad guys. There was too much spotlight glaring on Gitmo, which could end up smacking Washington with a black eye. Prisoner mistreatment, abysmal living conditions, individual rights of terrorists denied, and so on. It hadn't been spelled out 100%, but Boland's gut told him the next prison camp wouldn't pop up on CNN. Usually, the soldier operated alone or as part of the two Stony Man commando teams. Working with unknown factors had proved perilous to his health in the past. Brignola, however, had convinced him to co-lead Cobra Force 12. Never one to unduly swaddle himself in the Stars and Stripes, the Big Fed had told him that 20 to 30 of some of the most wanted terrorists, depending on how many could be taken alive, could prove intelligence mother loads in the War on Terror. Somalia was first on the roundup list. Not even Brugnola had been told where this military tribunal would be held, and Bolan wasn't quite sure what to make of the lack of concrete details. It smacked of dark secrecy, and Brugnola had as much as said that if it blew up in the faces of those in the field doing all the hunting and capturing, then America would take a verbal shellacking by the UN, not to mention the Muslim world cranking up the heat for jihad. And even with intelligence operatives all over the map guiding them from hit to hit, they were on their own. The executioner understood and accepted his usual role as a deniable expendable if he was caught or killed by the enemy. That was acceptable. What wasn't were a few nagging speculations tossed his way by Brugnola before he headed out to Fort Bragg to introduce himself, Colonel Brandon Stone, to the Cobra troops. The file on Collins and Cobra was classified, but the cyber sleuths at the farm had unearthed a few questions about the man and his team. They were terrorist headhunters, with a trio of successful outings to their credit. Only a but in caps hung over their heads. The thing was, they had been in the general vicinity when a spate of kidnappings and murders of American citizens in Egypt, Pakistan, and Indonesia sullied their record. Coincidence? Another reason to hop on board. The soldier was there now, willing to let battle and time tell the truth. He turned to the driver, Asp, the op's mane of black hair and facial scruff, the portrait of a mercenary. The pager on Bolan's hip vibrated, the same signal transmitted he knew to the other ground troops. The bird had landed. Bolan shifted to make sure the lone black commando on the team, Python, heard him loud and clear. Listen up. There's been a little change of plans. Tagula couldn't will away the gnawing in his belly. Something was shooting him to new heights of fear, a feeling so alive it had become a living monster in his face. He had placed the call to the man in Saudi Arabia, more out of nagging paranoia than curiosity. Sure enough, the cutout, so high up the chain of command in the Islamic Jihad that disobedience was a death sentence, had confirmed what the whites had told him. There was, so the middleman said, a series of big events about to unfold. The Saudi had instructed him to comply with whatever the foreigners wanted him to do, no matter how bizarre their request seemed. He was to have faith as strong as steel and ask no questions. He would be an important, even a glorious instrument exercising the will of God in the coming days. He was being called, perhaps by the prophet himself, a holy decree he was to carry out.
once again on faith. And he would be paid more than he could ever spend in two lifetimes. Woe be to anyone who attempted to betray any of them, chisel out of the bargain, or so the Saudi had told him. The Gula was angered that forces beyond his control had assumed he would obey their mysterious dictates, even order him to relegate his power to the enemy. Being on an overseas line, though, the conversation was brief, code words and phrases that should leave any enemy eavesdroppers guessing. The Gula watched as the giant UN cargo plane continued to taxi. For a moment, attempting to calm himself, he marveled at the naivete of these relief workers. Surely by now, they knew what became of their cargo. Were they stupid? Or did they actually believe one more attempt to funnel food and medicine into this region would buy the masses a few more days before they succumbed to the inevitable? Fools. They had long since given up attempting airdrops, or trekking to the villages themselves, on foot or by truck, since a few relief workers had mysteriously vanished. It occurred to him that perhaps this time they had brought along a few guns to test his will. If that happened, it would prove no contest at all. If they made demands at gunpoint, they would all be shot on sight, and he would simply load the trucks with the cargo, burn the bodies, destroy the plane, take his chances. He was out of his jeep, standing his ground, ordering his clansmen to move up on the plane when the C-130 swung around, ramped lower, and the bay out of view. Strange, he thought, since the previous attempts were done in full view of the ramp coming down. It could have been paranoia getting the better of him, but something felt terribly wrong all of a sudden. Dust in his face, he found himself easing back toward his jeep. There was a faint and distant rattle, buzzing in his head but a chatter that blew the lid on his fear. The Gula knew the sound of auto fire when he heard it. Collins wished he could see the Gula's face, full of terror and confusion over why and who had come to yank his ticket. It was a fleeting impulse, wanting to be there, grinning in the guy's face, but Collins knew any gloating was on hold. Collins had a full shooting gallery before him to contend with. Getting hands on the Cupid doll was the ultimate prize, but since the moment at hand was no guaranteed bullseye, the Gula had to keep. The Cobra leader flamed away with his M16 to port, with Mamba on the starboard side, likewise clamping down with auto fire on the stunned opposition. So far they were on the money, shock appearing to put them on the verge of winning the first round. But the going would get a lot tougher once they were off the ramp. Perhaps ten of the enemy had ventured up the ramp. AKs not even up and out, their faces laughing, a private joke bandied about among them in their native tongue. But the Somali thugs lost all arrogant composure when the first few rounds had begun chopping into their ranks. White captains were shredded to red ruins before they were even aware they were chewed and screwed. Collins and Mamba, sweeping long bursts, port to starboard and back. Somalis tumbled and sailed down the ramp, a whirling dervish or two losing a sandal in mid-flight. Go! Oh! The Hummer known as Thunder 3 was a blur in Collins' eye as he gutted another Somali. Diamondback, manning the M60, cut loose. The 7.62mm lead erased the terror on the face of a goon peeking over the ramp, his head erupting. Thunder 4 was right on 3's bumper, Collins saw, about to bulldoze through a bloody scarecrow rising on the lip of the ramp, his arms shooting up as if they were supposed to slam on the brakes or veer around him. <laughs> According to intel, there were 20-plus more Somali gunmen, either moving from the command hut or sitting tight depending on Dagula's mood, but Collins hoped those numbers would be handled by his Apache and the Colonel. Collins was picking up the pace, Bamba on the march, both of them feeding fresh clips to their M16s when the Cobra leader sighted on a downed Somali. He was dragging himself through the pooling blood under his elbows toward the edge of the ramp, head cocked. The spurting hole in the middle of his back, the way he slithered ahead, legs limp weight, told Collins he'd taken one through the spine. But paralysis below the waist would prove the least of his woes. Whoever he was, Collins knew he wasn't one of the catches of the day. Welcome to the big league, son. <laughs> Halfway down the ramp, Collins leaped, landing on hard-packed earth, M16 searching out fresh blood off to the port side of the Hercules. The trick now would be taking Dagula and a few top lieutenants alive. Collins already had that figured out beforehand, though, ready to unleather the tranquilizer gun on his right hip just as soon as he made eyeball confirmation. The dicey part 
would be getting close enough to drop Tagula and the other trophies in the sleeping bag. As for his other commandos, the running scheme was to encircle Tagula's men before they could bolt. Thunders 1 and 2 would race in from the north, a sweeping left hook to their flank. It was a tactical page, Collins thought, with a moment's pride, ripped straight out of Genghis Khan's war book. If one of his troops got close enough to Dagula first, they were ordered to lob a canister of barbiturate-laden gas his way. Collins took a moment to watch the action. He saw that the noose was tightening, felt a grim satisfaction that it was nearly a lock. He grinned to himself. He was watching the Black Hawks soaring overhead to run down the rabbits, and the Apache strafing the troops and transports at the command post to the northeast, when he saw that only one of his ground hummers was barreling in from the wadi. What the? Scanning the plane, Collins spotted the other hummer. Thunder One was rolling slowly, nearly creeping toward the fleeing Somalis. The Cobra team leader figured out the strategy. A lone figure peeled off from the hummer, M16 blazing at the profiteers who were squirming out from under an overturned transport rig. The result of a direct hit from the Apache's Hellfire missile. Fuck. Colonel Wildcard's doing his own thing. Might as well have told me to kiss his ass, he'd do it his own way. Fucking prima donna. A few choice words, assuming the colonel survived, had to wait as Collins drew a bead on a Somali gunman still standing in the dust. The executioner, sensed Asp and Python weren't happy about being ordered to change the game plan right before the shooting started, but they did as ordered. The shift in strategy, at least on his part, had one goal in mind. Cutting off any retreat on foot was a dicier proposition than simply allowing the Blackhawks and Apache to blow the enemy off the plane. If the warbirds ground up the Somalis with lead and hellfires from above, then any capture of Pagula was all but lost. If their job was to cuff and stuff the world's most wanted international terror mongers, then anything short of bringing to justice Dagula and top henchmen was a mission failure. Bolin left the Apache to its hellfire and chain gun demolition. The soldier cut a wide berth around the hungry flames and oily smoke, his M16 leading the way, the stink of burning diesel fuel and toasted flesh filling the air, grinding into his senses. His vector would land him directly in the path of two technicals charging away from the ring of Cobra lead. It was a dust bowl near the C-130's nose, armed combatants blazing away, commandos then chasing down Somalis who had decided it was better to flee than stand and fight. It was hard for the soldier to tell which was which and who was who, but a split-second assessment of the numbers of bodies flying from technicals told him the Somalis were clutching the short end of the stick. Maybe ten Somalis came crawling or staggering out of the bed of their dumped transport. They were lurching to their feet, AKs jerking in different directions, uncertain where the next immediate threat would rear up. Boland took care of their confusion, finger caressing the M203's trigger. Out of the corner of his eye, Bolin spotted Asp charging the Hummer at a group of Somalis pouring AK-47 autofire from the bed of a technical, Python opting to help hose down the survivors with his M-16. Bolin cut his path hard and fast toward the racing technical, drawing target acquisition on three gunmen in the Jeep's bed. Rotor wash from the Blackhawks, hovering 30 yards behind, kicked up a cyclone of grit and dust, obscuring confirmation until the technical was nearly on top of the warrior. But Bolin pinned down their man, the Gula's face of terror and outrage framed from the shotgun seat of the technical. The soldier's attention shifting back to the M60 gunner, who swiveled the machine gun in his direction. The executioner focused on the big catch charging his way. The Gula was flailing his arms, his screamed instructions to his driver muted by the windshield glass when Bolin hit the M16's trigger. The windshield imploded, a crimson halo where the wheelman had sat bearing grim testament that Dagula was the last passenger. The executioner sidestepped the onrushing truck and shot out its tires as it went by. He saw Dagula's eyes bugging out, mouth venting a silent scream. Bolin watched as Dagula painfully shoved the driver's dead weight off of him and began scrabbling through the broken windshield glass for something. Whatever it was, Dagula found it, and he started to crawl through the remnants of the windshield, his clothes and skin tearing on the broken glass. As Bolin advanced toward him, he saw that the object Dagula had found was an AK-47, which he now swung around as he heard Bolin approaching. He drew a bead on the executioner, but they both knew it was too late. The last thing Dagula saw was the clenched fist heading for his jaw. <laughs> You want to Mirandize that asshole too, Colonel? 
Maybe find him a lawyer? Bolin wrenched the warlord's arms and the plastic cups behind his back. I wasn't looking to steal anybody's thunder. Is that why you took it upon yourself to seal off their rear when you knew my gunships were supposed to do that? It seemed the thing to do at the time. Is that a fact? Bolin watched Collins, holding his ground beside the Gula, who was coming around, legs twitching in the dust. The short right cross had branded a purple welt on his jaw, hardly the kind of punishment Bolin knew Dagula deserved. There was a village of innocents being butchered right then, weighing on Bolin's thoughts. The sky over the hills to the east had darkened, several more plumes of black smoke rising now since the battle here had erupted, bringing on a wide patch of unnatural dusk against the horizon. Time was wasting, lives were being snuffed. Bolin was sure they were being executed in droves by now. Up to now, he hadn't heard Collins mention any secondary objective beyond rounding up Dugula. This, Bolin knew, would prove a defining moment, grant him some insight into Collins's true nature. Bolin read the former Delta Major's anger beyond the tight smile. The other commandos were towing the dead or dying, ignoring pleading eyes and grasping hands. Collins slowed his pace, head swiveling. The soldier followed the Cobra leader's stare toward a commando, Tsunami, who was bent over a bloodied form, convulsing near a technical riddled with bullet holes. Turning further, Bolin saw two more Cobra ops flanking a Somali who was on his knees. He's nobody. Bolin kept the anger to himself over the cold-blooded killing. A kill in the heat of battle was one thing to Bolin, but when the enemy surrendered, execution on the spot was unacceptable. One act of outright savagery always led to another, more brutal act. If a soldier couldn't separate the difference, he was lost, no exceptions. Major, over here! Again, Collins peered at another Somali, whose face was forced up and aimed at Collins, the commando named Roadrunner wadding up a handful of hair and spearing a knee into his back. The Cobra leader gave a thumbs down. The commando stood and shoved the face back into the dirt. <laughs> Collins held up and rotated a clenched fist, signaling the Blackhawks to move off, presumably to recon the area for any gunman who had managed to slip away. So, is this where it starts, Colonel? Where what starts? Something flickered through Collins's eyes, a darkness stirring. Bolin sensed an angry animal presence in the savage he'd just seen carry out the executions. I don't have time to jack around with you, Colonel. From here on, when we map out a strategy, I'd like you to stick with the program. I need to know we're on the same page. We clear? Sudden interruptions in tactics, in my own experience, have a way of proving hazardous to everybody's health. And improvising? <laughs> Is that what you call it? Well, that depends on who's doing the improvising and why. I'm getting a sense here, Colonel Stone, that maybe you're not really a team player, or that you're a lot more than I've been led to believe. That maybe you're telling me I don't know how to do my job. Bolin nodded at Dagula. He's in the net, but there's a few loose ends still running around over those hills, Major. This isn't over. Collins glanced past Bolin. What's happening over there isn't my concern, Colonel. They're not part of the mission parameters. We're not some flying hospital or a bunch of Red Cross workers on a mission from God. Say we do what you're implying. Say we're successful driving out the rest of Dugula's bad boys. Then what? We're looking at slews of wounded, dying, and diseased mouths to feed. We're not equipped for that scenario. They're being slaughtered, Collins. Women, children. If saving them doesn't fit into your plans, chances are you could still take out a few of Dugula's top lieutenants and get yourself a few more awards for your mantle. Hey! This isn't some game show to me, Stone. I'm not in this to land a seat as some military expert on Fox and Friends when I hang it up. Then let it be about something right. A part of me can almost respect you for wanting to be a decent guy and all that, Colonel. In other circumstances, I might feel the same way. But do you know why whatever's left of Dugula's brigands are over that hump torching those people? They're carrying a plague, Stone. That's straight from the top. It's all been caught on sat imagery. And I've got the details in triplicate if you care to read the reports. The UN and WHO all know about it. And not even they will send relief. We've been ordered to leave it alone. What's over those hills is a bunch of Ethiopian nomads who caught some sort of hemorrhagic contagion. Some real wicked stuff. We don't know what it is. It could even be Ebola. 
You think I want to risk the lives of my men just to play some kind of Mother Teresa to a bunch of people who are going to die anyway? Whose own countrymen will march in right behind us and kill and burn them even if we do take out the rest of Dagula's rabble? For all we know, this plague could be an airborne contagion. You don't want to do it? I've got a lot to do, Colonel, before we move on our next objective. Then let me handle it. I won't just walk away. Cullens measured Bolan, bobbing his head. Okay. Tell you what. Just to show I've got some heart, take one of the Black Hawks. I'll even throw in the Apache, since my numbers show about 30 or more of Dugula's punks running around over there. I can spare four of my men, but that's it. You've got one hour, Stone, and then I'm in the air. I'll take back my men and leave you behind if you're not ready to fly. Will that accommodate your sense of mercy and compassion for the oppressed? It suddenly sounded too easy. Collins relenting, handing over his own man, even, despite his argument about the risks of infection. Boland sensed something else and prompted the Cobra leader to cave, but the Black Hawk was already coming back to pick up the soldier. The executioner watched as Collins snatched a gula off the ground by the shoulder. One hour, Colonel. Box ticket. No good luck, no kiss off, nothing. On his own. But he'd been pretty much on his own since accepting the mission. The executioner turned, forging into the dust as the Black Hawk landed. He couldn't put his finger on it, but there was a familiar churning in his gut, warning him that everything wasn't as it appeared with Collins and Cobra Force 12. Bolin hopped into the warbird's belly. Time, he knew, would separate truth from lies, the righteous from the unclean of spirit. Right then, there was another battle to fight, and hopefully a village, or part of it at least, to save. One hour, he thought. It could prove an eternity. As anxious as Collins was to put Somalia behind him and set the stage for round two, it wouldn't hurt to stay grounded for another hour or so. By then, a few questions might get put to rest, or perhaps better still, he could spare himself some grief in the future. No, it wouldn't cause him the first twinge of pain or regret if Stone, or the other four without the snake handles, didn't come back from the crusade. Stone the merciful. What the hell kind of warrior went out of his way to play savior to people who were doomed to die anyway? The diseased of that village had never been on the itinerary, but it might just help his own scheme of things if Wild Card was aced in the next 60 minutes trying to play savior. Something about the big colonel was nagging him as he pondered any number of possible scenarios. The SOB could be anything. A spy, a plant, a shooter with orders given behind his back to terminate all of them. There were calls over the SATCOM to make right then, last minute details to be ironed out before the next incursion. A date with another homicidal megalomaniac inside Sudan's border. Hot spots to ignite, more bad guys to stuff or cuff, and dreams to hold on to. Stone was on his own. He'd forget about him for the time being, and let fate run its course. Who are you? What do you want from me? Where are you taking me? Collins was up the ramp, kicking through a few boxes strewed before him, when he heard Dagula squawking for answers as Asp and Python snapped on the leg irons, removed the plastic cuffs at gunpoint, then clamped the warlord to the cuffs on the bench. He marched up to Dugula, slashed a backhand across his mouth. I'll say this one time only, Habir. Any more whining, any crap out of you at all, even give me the evil eye once more, and I'll put one through your ear and dump you off with the rest of your garbage outside. You'll know what this is all about when I'm damn good and ready to clue you in. So sit back and enjoy the flight. Colin stood, boring into Dugula with his no-shit stare, then left him to stew and taste the blood on his lip. Striding aft, he stared at the distant horizon. The warbirds were gone, wild guard six minutes on the clock already. What the hell was that big bastard all about, anyway? Angered still that the colonel had bucked the game plan, he recalled watching the tactical shift by wild guard for a long few moments. Sure, the big guy could move, but that transport truck had been indirectly dumped on its side by the Apache, it didn't take much skill to plow a 40 millimeter knockout punch into badly mauled Somalis crawling out of that rig, but Stone had bored in just the same, going for broke. It irked him that Stone had beaten him to Dagula, the new guy first to haul in a door prize. 
But he wasn't about to tip his hand that the old warrior pride had been stung. He knew a whole lot more than some glory on the battlefield was at stake. Bolin was under no illusions he could save the village. Given the length of time Dagula's genocide campaign had been underway, the thickness and numbers of black clouds rising to blot out the landscape, and the swarms of vultures that seemed to multiply out of nowhere the closer the Black Hawk bore down on the massacre, the executioner had to assume saving any innocents would simply prove an exercise in futility. If that was the case, Bolin had an alternative going in. Whatever Collins' reasoning for not participating in what the soldiers saw as the final solution to the Dagula atrocity, the least he could do for the dead was exact more than a few pounds of flesh from the savages. His calm link tied into the flight crews of the Black Hawk and Apache. He handed out the orders as soon as they soared over the hills. Bolin found utter chaos down there, black smoke cloaking entire areas of what he could only view as a vision of hell. He made out brief bursts of auto fire rattling throughout the village, spotted men and women still being run down, shot. Whether Collins had shown his true colors as a savage remained to be seen. Bolin put together his attack strategy based on enemy numbers, village layout, civilian body count. The majority of Somali thugs appeared to be wrapping up their grisly cleansing chore, a series of pyres confined to the far eastern edge of the campsite. He figured 15 to 20 still torching the dead. That hard force fit best for some Apache chain gun pronouncement of their fate. There were still pockets of gunmen on the move, lurching about between rows of beehive huts, combing for any survivors, skirting along a straight north to south sweep. With all the smoke taking to the sky, shielding the birds, and what he believed was their single-minded obsession to murder and burn, Bolin figured they had a few minutes to spare before the enemy noticed they were about to be hit. There was no time to lay it out, diagram tactics and such. The Apache was to strafe the pyre grounds and churn up anything that cropped up with a gun, take out everything on wheels. There was no time to question motives or ponder all that Collins had done and failed to do as far as this leg of the mission fell. Bolin was on his own, and he had told the four commandos Collins had handed over as much. They were to sit tight, help the M60 door gunner with firepower from the air. So tell me, why bring us along in the first place? We're supposed to just sit up here and scratch ourselves, Colonel. Contagion. The good major seemed real concerned about his guys coming into contact with some unspecified disease down there. Consider this a favor. You want to cover me from up here or play with yourselves, that's up to you. A shrug, a soft shake of the head. Bolin could almost read the thoughts behind the body language. He wasn't looking to play hero. He could use all the help on the ground he could get. The problem was he wasn't sure he could trust them. And if he pulled it off by himself, say cuffed and brought back a few top henchmen to Collins, perhaps, he decided, it was time to take a deeper measure of the Cobra's leader. His suspicion was that Collins had hung him out here to burn. If so, then why? Have it your way, Colonel. Good luck. The executioner jumped off. M-16 out and ready to announce his presence. Bolin didn't have long to wait as two goons in skullcaps appeared from between a row of huts already ablaze. They swung his way, eyes wide, confused and shocked, but just in time for Bolin to wax them off their feet. They were teenagers, 14, 18 tops, but Bolin knew painfully well youth received no special consideration in a world where anarchy and savagery dictated who lived. The executioner briefly felt a curious, distant, otherworldly sense, as light as the wind, slightly disembodied even as he waded deeper into this horror. It was as if he'd been here before, and he had, too many times, in fact, to tally. It struck him, as he heard the Apache unload Hellfire missiles, the stutter of weapons fire from the Black Hawk mowing down illegal combatants. All of this murder of innocence strewn before him, a nadir of man's inhumanity to man, had always existed, one way or another, throughout the ages. Human nature was the only constant. The guilty had to be punished, no exceptions, no mercy. High time, he decided, for a little Old Testament vengeance. Bolin melted into, then swept out of the drifting smoke. His gut knotted with a grapefruit-sized chunk of raw anger, despite the intention to roll into this a stone-cold professional. Unless he was a psychopath or simply evil, no man could fully digest without the first flicker of wrenching emotion the atrocity that had happened here. 
With the full slamming force of death in his face, the bile squirmed in his gut for a moment, urging him on to wax as many armed killers as quickly and mercilessly as possible. Flies and mosquitoes swarmed the dead. Vultures, brazen and impatient to gorge, descended now on bodies. He could ill afford to concern himself with unfeeling flesh, all these lives snuffed out so callously. If there was contagion here, he was willing to risk infection, if only to avenge this monstrosity, Collins be damned. They were running everywhere, dead ahead, trying to flee certain death from above, haphazard human or inhuman traffic rearing up in his sights as he came out of the thickest patch of smoke. Posing on the hungry bonfires consuming diseased flesh, a few of the gunmen fired wild bursts at the warbirds. Three, then four hard men wheeled around the corner of the firewall, dancing up a hut. They skidded to a halt, ten or so paces from Bolan, sandaled feet kicking up dust. The horrific pounding of explosions and the sight of their own getting a heavy metal dose of their own poison was too much for them to stomach, and they were fleeing now to save themselves. There was nowhere for them to run or hide. Two of them stared at the sight of the tall white man who had marched out of nowhere, staring ahead as if he were some avenging angel of doom that had materialized out of the smoke. Their eyes wide, the soldier read the looks, then heard the muffled cries from behind bandanas. It sounded as if they wanted their lives spared, a show of mercy from the lone invader. It was all just some terrible mistake. Two of them were on the verge and looked of throwing down their arms. There was no point, Bolin knew, in engaging in a long and protracted sweep of the village and its perimeter. Fire was eating up anything left standing. The smoke was so thick and so putrid that it left little doubt the savages had completed their task. What was left of the hard force was pretty much chopped up or blown into the firewalls next as a hellfire missile ripped through a motor pool. Ten or more broken dark figurines taking to the air above the blasts. A half dozen far from the epicenter were sent staggering about from the shockwave. The evil fumes pouring into his senses was enough to nearly knock even the most battle-hardened soldier off his feet. But Bolan wasn't above a queasy royal in his gut. He swiveled, searching, attempting to control any deep intakes of the foul air. He spotted an armed runner to his nine, hit the trigger of his M16. The executioner drove the gunner into his comrade, who was minus an arm just above the elbow from the Hellfire amputation. The amputee dropped in his tracks in an ungainly flop face plastered to earth. Bolan listened to raging flames, scoured the dead for wounded or live ones, bodies strewn and stacked in a circle when the warbirds had unleashed their final ring of doom. Two or three flaming technical carcasses seeming to float back to earth like some ghastly magic act. Blackhawk 1, how's it look from where you are? Looks clear of hostiles from here, Colonel. Come get me then. Nothing more we can do here. Roger that. Again, Bolan felt a part of his soul, his humanity, collapsing on itself. A sorrow welling up from deep inside, wanting to take him down into a void of hot rage. No matter what he did, Bolan knew evil would live on in Somalia. Perhaps continue to thrive throughout the entire region known as the Horn of Africa. But at least, a fat batch of homicidal maniacs could no longer scourge their own countryside. The Black Hawk was down. Time to go. Bolan wished he could have done far more here, spare, at the very least, a few innocent lives. But he would be glad to put this evil place behind. Damn glad. But the nagging question lingered in his mind. What next? You're late. 65 minutes isn't an hour, Stone. We're on a tight schedule here. I'm talking deadlines that are shaved down to seconds. Or have you forgotten mission priority? We can meet you back at Shark Base if your panties are that twisted up. Don't get fucking smart, Stone. We're not going back to Kenya. News to me. I can believe that. By the way, that was quite the floor show I hear you put on. Too bad it didn't make a damn bit of difference, since I understand from my flying aces on your Black Hawk loner that the Gula's cot-chewing shitbags had already wiped out that village. Bolan had turned off his comm link when boarding the Black Hawk wanting only a brief few moments with his own thoughts to bury the weight of where he'd just been, what he'd seen. He had begun to shed the ghosts of the hell he was putting behind when Tsunami had pointed at his own, then the soldier's handheld radio, Collins squawking for him to shag his ass and pick up. 
Now, if he didn't know better, it sounded to Bolin as if Collins was disappointed he was still on the team, alive and kicking. What was that all about anyway, you going in alone? Concern. What? For your troops. Since you were all worked up about anybody coming down with some plague. Took the gamble yourself, I see. Appreciate all that big concern for the men, but I tell you what. The first sign you're sick from something you picked up back there, I don't give a damn if you cough too hard or break out in a sudden sweat. You're off the team. And if I have to, I'll strap a parachute on you myself and drop you in the middle of nowhere. We're two minutes, maybe less, away from... I've got you marked on my screens. Just hustle the fuck up when the Black Hawk touches down. I want to see you sprint up this ramp. Somehow, Bolin didn't picture himself sprinting on the good Major's command. We've got a lot of ground to cover before the next round, and it's going down in a few hours. I'm assuming you've got a few jumps behind you? One or two. You're shitting me, I hope. If you're worried about me breaking my leg or my neck, don't. But if you don't mind, I'll rig my own chute, okay? I wouldn't have it any other way. Oh, and Stone. No more cowboy or crusader shit. We clear? Yeah. If you want to bleed for all the little people that nobody gives a camel steaming pile about, do it on your own dime, or go find a church, light a candle, and finger the rosary. From here on, you better get acquainted with the concepts of team integrity and tactical cohesion. Out. At least three different remarks, two of which were smartass, leaped to Boland's mind about those particular concepts. What the hell was really going on here? With each passing minute and every exchange with Collins turning more brittle and volatile, the soldier was feeling the hair starting to stand up on the back of his neck. Something about Cobra Force 12 was a little off-center. It wasn't the blinding light of any divine truth being revealed, but it damn near felt like a bolt of lightning hitting him between the eyes, seeking to jolt him closer to a dark reality. He searched the faces of the commandos Collins had wanted joined to his hip, but didn't allow the look to linger or penetrate. It was just a suspicion, nagging, growing, but one he decided to keep to himself. Only four of the commandos carried serpent nicknames. What demons lurked behind the masks of tactical integrity, duty, and honor? His gut, rarely wrong, told him not only was there something shady, perhaps even sinister about his so-called teammates, but that this mission was set to come unraveled. He'd play it out to the end of whatever the ride, aware now more than ever he was on his own. But one soldier up against who, how many, and what. His Black Ops handle for Operation Stranglehold, the mission so tagged by Cobra Central, was Gambler. But his real name was... who really knew? The name Harry Smith wanted to come to mind if he chose to replay a childhood that never existed. No one, not even himself, could remember his given name. Even all the classified documents and disks at the NSA and the CIA were so full of deletions on his past operations and his slew of assumed names and handles that not even the super spooks could accurately confirm his true identity. And who cared? He figured he couldn't state precisely who he was, but he knew where he'd been in the world, what he'd done. Most important, he had a full measure of who the man inside was and just what that warrior was prepared to do. Oh, bliss to be, how sweet the light on the horizon of tomorrow. Oh, the riches to be earned and enjoyed. Cobra Command, Pentagon, White House. The members of the entire Intel military infrastructure of the U.S. of A. would soon weep and gnash their teeth in impotent rage when they were gone with the wind. Maybe, just for added chuckles, he'd leave behind a photo or two on a body, a big dung-eating grin, a middle finger salute leaping out of the pics. Sure enough, the day was soon coming when it would pay off beyond anyone's wildest imaginings. No sense in being a deniable expendable, taking all the risks all these years if there was no reward. Deny this. <laughs> Gambler was amused by what he viewed as a role that landed him as the next best thing to being supernatural, up there with the greatest of saints or the most horrific of demons in human skin who had gone before him. After all, they claimed the greatest deceit ever played on the world by the devil was making man believe the devil didn't exist. And that likewise evil didn't exist, that it was only each and every individual human's perception of reality. He could live with that. He had to. 
He was on the eve of pulling off some of the greatest treachery and rebellion since Satan and his legion were cast out of heaven. Mogadishu was just an appetizer. Sudan, on the other hand, was a hunter's paradise. Nothing but choice specials on the menu for their operation. It was a smorgasbord of terrorists, suicide bombers, weapons dealers, assassins, and so on. Hell, there were so many training camps spread all over the largest country in Africa that he figured nothing short of a few nukes could wipe out the legions of international thugs and murderers that came here from as far away as the Philippines for R&R, &R, sharpening skills, planning operations before they were shipped out for jihad. It certainly bolstered his confidence and swelled the old pride that the moment and the trying times ahead would get handled by him, together with the two like-minded and nameless, faceless, almighty black ops marching beside him. They advanced down the narrow concrete corridor, gloomy light thrown about from naked bulbs powered by a generator. And there he was, the man of the hour. The door to Colonel Ayid Bashir's office was open, the lean hawk face with the mustache and neatly trimmed beard glancing up from behind his desk. Gambler felt the grin loosening up now, decided to hold the expression, aware that he, the three of them actually, held all the cards. Who was good enough or bold enough to call their bluff? They were in lockstep with their escort, two soldiers front, two lieutenants pulling up the rear, AK-74s all around. Gambler shot his two comrades a grin. Tim and Jim Smith, Warlock and Cyclops, respectively, were likewise ghosts in the Black Ops machine. He didn't have to question their guts, their experience, their ability to deal with, blast through, or simply walk out the other side of a crisis. There were too many past ops to count, much less recall all the history they had together. But both men bore the scars of war, badges of honor. For instance, Jimbo's handle Cyclops had shot out of his mouth with no hesitation, as if he were proud of his encounter with the Afghan landmine that had blown off half his face and sheared off the left ear with hot shrapnel tearing out the eye. Warlock had had a close combat encounter with a Yemeni terrorist who didn't like getting a light load of Semtex and Stingers and who was fond of knives. The purple scar ran from the knuckle of the middle finger all the way to his bicep. The story went that not only had Warlock deflected the initial sweep of the Yemeni's blade, using his arm as a shield, but also he'd ripped the knife out of his hand before the guy had Allah Akbar out of his mouth. Warlock had dropped the Yemeni with a right that any heavyweight would be proud of, and then he'd gone to work, performing surgery on the poor bastard, even as he nearly bled out himself. Warlock loathed and feared knives to this day, unless, of course, he did the cutting. There would be no knife play tonight, Gambler knew. Three Berettas would be the weapons of choice to use when the vibrating signal came through on their pagers. The three of them had been to the colonel's command post in southern Sudan twice before, ironing out the details for this third visit, where they were supposed to hand Bashir some missiles, warheads packed with VX, which could be fitted on the Russian gunships outside. Unfortunately for the colonel, who was known in the region as Bashir the Crucifier, he would never get his hands on that kind of hardware. Gambler had laid out their individual moves, redefined their roles while they were choppered out of Somalia by company liaisons. So far, the setup was sticking to form. As he approached the door, the vibration trembled on his hip. One minute and counting, and he knew their guy would be on the money. Gambler watched Bashir glance up from whatever intel and maps he'd been perusing, no doubt planning tomorrow's massacre of Nilotes. The colonel sniffed the air. Gambler, glimpsing Warlock, checking his watch, counting off the numbers. Bashir stood and folded his hands behind his back. Well, I trust this time you bring me good news. Gambler ticked off the seconds in his head, Bashir darting a thinly veiled look of contempt over their faces, before anger broke through the expression. What? Why are you standing there grinning like an idiot? I bring you the best of all possible news, Colonel. You are the man of the millennium. We salute you, but we always did. I do not have all night for these shallow attempts to create favor. Spit it out! You! Why do you keep looking at your watch? Warlock tapped the watch, shaking his head, frowning. Then the three of them were grinning at Bashir. Huh? Bashir looked at his men, appeared uncertain whether to laugh or scream in rage, fighting to keep his composure. I watch your American TV sometimes, but the old videos, classic films, I believe you call them, 
But before everything in your country became sex and violence, I can take some joking, strange as it is. I like comedy. Is this some sort of bad Three Stooges routine? No routine. No act. Before Bashir could pry himself from an apparent state of confused revulsion, Gambler heard the rolling thunder, saw the Sudanese colonel and his men freeze, dust floating from the ceiling, walls and floors shaking, as the first wave of explosions rocked the compound. Gambler briefly savored the sound of music that floated from the far eastern edge. On the money. Gambler allowed a moment for his AC-130 Spectre to deliver the bad news to Bashir for him. Then he had the Beretta out and aimed squarely between Bashir's eyes. The gist of the Cobra leader's assault plan on the Sudanese colonel's garrison was a straight aerial bombardment followed by the troops blitzing into the smoke, dropping whatever enemies popped up along the way. Bolin could live with that as long as the key players were in place for the scooping and the AC-130 Spectre smashed the bulk of the enemy on its first and only strafe of the fort. What he didn't much care for was Asp and Mamba assigned to his blue team. It was as if Collins were gluing his serpents up his six, there to monitor his every move and make sure he followed orders. No time to ponder. Bolin was seconds away from plunging into the fires of combat, in charge of blue team, their role defined by Collins. The Spectre was already wreaking havoc on the garrison as the soldier-led blue team on a hard charge across the grassy plain. M16, M203 combo searching for live ones. It was always quite the fearsome sight Bolin knew to behold the devastating hell an AC-130 could dump on a target. Entire sections of designated walls were blown away, leaving behind gaping holes through which to penetrate and get up close and personal. He assumed the Spectre had raised the troop barracks inside those walls, catching most hands asleep at that hour, since Bolin spied any number of dark scarecrow figures sailing for the sky. It was a pummeling that shattered the senses, shook the earth under his feet as the weapons roared and flamed down from the port side of the flying leviathan. The executioner knew that no matter how flayed and shocked and numb, there would be armed survivors somewhere near that firestorm. Bolin would have preferred their 700-foot combat jump land them on the enemy's back door before the specter lowered the boom. A decent surveillance first, swathed in the blackness of night to assess numbers and find any weak points around the garrison where they could slip through quick and quiet. Collins insisted they do it his way. Sat imagery and Collins's humint would have to cut it. While the Spectre soared in to pound the fort, Bolin and his teammates had jumped from the C-130. DZ was roughly 200 yards west of Ground Zero, the night erupting ahead, the sky shimmering from the blasts marching through the compound. While Bolin was to bull blue team into the compound, Collins and his black team would mop up any runners, secure a number of vehicles to the east that were still intact. This was only round one of the Sudanese foray, as mapped out by Collins during the brief in the air. Colonel Ayid Bashir, known as the crucifying colonel for having staked or impaled entire black Christian villages in the south, had been on Bolin's list of bad guys to take care of for some time. Opportunity now beckoned, but the sort of justice Collins was bringing to the colonel and his top lieutenants paled in comparison to what Bolin believed the butcher deserved. From there, assuming they were successful in bagging Bashir and his cronies, commandeered vehicles would take the team to a terrorist training camp some 15 miles northeast as the buzzard flew, where the second assault would be launched. Collins had a big surprise in store for that camp, a fuel-air explosive that was packed with what he called Narcon D. That was coming, a long night ahead for all of them, so Bolin focused on the task at hand. According to his handheld monitor, the three black ops, their beacons flashing bright and strong on the screen, were in the command post, midway down and tucked up against the west wall, waiting to be escorted with prisoners to Collins. Whoever they were, company shooters, Bolin assumed, they had been engaged in some ruse to deliver chemical weapons to Bashir, stringing him along the whole time until the net could be dropped over him by Cobra Force. It sure seemed that Collins could make all the right moves, armed with all the answers, every critical piece of intelligence at his beck and call. For some reason, that bothered Bolin. Senses choked with a mesh of fumes, everything from burning fuel to eviscerated bodies strewn before him. The executioner led Blue Team into the smoke. They were dancing around as rubble and bodies hit the ground when Bolin hit the trigger of his assault rifle. Bolin fanned off to the left. Ten or more went down as Blue Team opened up in concert. 
Sudanese hard cases flung in all directions under the blistering auto fire. Whoever this vaunted trio the good major had bragged on, Bolin already had a mental picture of three more carbon copies of Collins. That too indicated not everything was as he was led to believe. It was a moment to savor all the sweat and blood to get it this far, seeing the light flare on in the colonel's eyes, Bashir standing there, torn between outrage and terror, the man looking set to soil himself. <laughs> Freeze! Do you want to explain yourself? Nothing to explain, Colonel. We screwed you. On your knees. Put your hands behind your back. Bashir hesitated, <coughs> so Gambler delivered a crack over his skull with the butt of his pistol, buckling his knees, then shoving him down onto the floor. Warlock and Cyclops were all over their own catches, relieving them of their assault rifles, fastening on the plastic cuffs, binding their hands behind their backs. All set or so Gambler hoped, aware they were hardly on their way home free. With the compound under siege, he could be sure a few of Bashir's more loyal following would have something to say about them skipping off with the crucifying colonel. I do not know what you think you're doing, but you yeah, are not yeah. to win. Gambler fixed the cuffs on Bashir and hauled him to a standing position. <coughs> you're thinking you got a hundred men ready to cut us to ribbons when we walk out of here. But you hear that sound, colonel? That's a specter out there. You ever seen one of those monsters at work? No? You'll see what it can do on the way out. And those hundred plus soldiers you think will come running to your rescue? Most of them were blown to hell where they slept in their bunks. They say even the devil needs friends. Guess you've been chosen to be our pal. Gambler was hauling Bashir to the door when he heard, then saw the commotion. They were sliding into view, maybe 15 Sudanese soldiers, assault rifles out, shadows and flickering light that threatened to wink out from the sheer shock rattle of the specters pounding. Colonel, are you here? Are you all right? <laughs> you are safe. Hey, assholes. Gambler locked an arm around Bashir's throat, <laughs> lugging his human shield into the doorway. You can see I've got the good colonel, so I suggest you throw down your weapons and let us be on our way. They are not to leave here alive! Wrong thing to say, pal. Warlock, get on the blower, and please inform me Cobra Leader is in the neighborhood. If Wildcard thought he was doing all the dirty work, he hadn't said it, but Stone's quiet compliance with the battle scheme still left Collins wondering. Blue Team was shouldering the brunt of the killing, taking on the greater risks by being the first and only ones through the fort's door, but Collins and his black team weren't exactly looking at a stroll on the beach. It was a faint hope, something about Stone's feeling more wrong with each turn on the mission, but Collins wouldn't mind if the man caught a bullet inside the walls. Patience. Maybe later. Collins veered in from his southeast vector, closing in on the motor pool, pouring out a blanket of hot lead that mowed down the first wave of armed shadows, beating a path for the smattering of APCs, Jeeps, and Hummers. Like a well-oiled machine, with Collins charging point, Black Team fanned out in a skirmish line, leapfrogging from vehicles, five assault rifles flaming away as the second wave of Sudanese soldiers burst out of the gate. Whatever vehicles they didn't need would be wasted by the Spectre on a second flyby. Gambler the Cobra leader, come in. Move it down the line. Find us a few rides and power them up. When his troops were gone, Collins hunkered beside a Hummer, unclipping the handheld radio off his belt. He thumbed the button. Cobra leader, go ahead. I hope you're in the ballpark, Cobra leader. We've got problems blocking our way out of the CP. Roughly 15 irate Sudanese. I'll handle it. Collins was about to sign off, raise stone, when he heard the din of weapons fire blast out of the radio. Sounds like the cavalry just arrived, Gambler. Roger that, Cobra leader. Appreciate your promptness. And I'll see you in a few. Cobra leader out. No point in calling Wildcard. The damn guy was way ahead of him. Well, the night was young, and the contingent of terrorists on the back burner could prove a nastier chore than a bunch of shell-shocked Sudanese rabble. Not only that, but Collins kept thinking Wildcard might just have that accident by friendly fire yet. You three cover our six. I'll go in on point. Bolan caught a look in Asp's eyes, wondered briefly if that was defiance or something else, but the trio peeled off to comply with his order. What the hell is going on with them? The executioner gave the compound a quick search, a second's flare of paranoia warning him it would be best to watch his own six. 
then saw his rear guard take concealment behind a Toyota Land Cruiser that was miraculously unscathed. The trio of Cobra Commandos began selecting the few armed runners on the loose, chopping them down with concentrated three-round bursts. Enemy return fire brief and wild, the night just about over for the enemy. Two more shadows, reeling in the smoking rubble of what had been their barracks, were blown off their feet by the next Cobra Triburst. Bolin hand-signaled Roadrunner and Brick to take flank on the opposite side of the doorway. Roller and Bulldozer to fall in behind him. A check inside the doorway, and the soldier found both sides locked in the standoff. Last warning! Put the fucking guns down and get on the floor! I'll shoot this asshole colonel of yours and we'll take our chances! You are not walking out of here! I'm here to tell you, asshole, you are fucking with the wrong Yankees! I'll save you for last and gut you like a fish! Bolin primed a frag grenade, guessed there were a squad or so of Sudanese dead ahead 20 yards. They had split up, having the force to each side of the hallway, a few muzzles of assault rifles poking out of the doorway closest to their intended point of entry. The tricky part would come if Gambler and his pals decided to throw some rounds into the chaos, a ricochet or even a straight shot catching Bolin as he bowled into the fight. No risk, no victory. <clears throat> a warning would have been nice, but Gambler had human cover just in case some shrapnel came tearing his way. Bashir flinched, Gambler hauling him back deeper inside the office. He watched the smoke, Warlock and Cyclops squeezing beside him. The smoke was hanging thick, Sudanese snakes writhing around, then the shooting started. He saw a big guy who moved like lightning, a pro for damn sure. Gambler watched him work. Three commandos raced in behind the big shooter, combined auto fire eating up whatever was crawling or kneeling. Blood spattered the scarred walls, bodies spinning, toppling, the big shooter hitting the doorway where a few Sudanese rats might be hiding. No hesitation, no wasted move, the big shooter flamed away with his M16. Sweeping the room, leaving no doubt in Gambler's mind their immediate problems were over. One Sudanese was crabbing his way, a big bloody slug sliding out of the smoke when the big shooter put a round in the back of his head. Sweet. Nice work, guy. What I call Grand Slamming it. You must be the Gambler. Gambler was about to show the big shooter a winning smile, then saw something in those icy blue eyes that froze him. What the hell was he looking at like that? That would be me. And you are? Stone. Shake a leg. I don't want to keep your buddy Collins waiting. Gambler looked at the big shooter as he turned away and melted into the smoke. What was that he just heard? A little tone in the voice? A badass and smartass package on the team? Gambler shoved Bashir ahead, thinking things were just about to get real interesting. This stone didn't fit the bill of the black ops who had signed on for what was really going to go down. Gambler read the man as a serious problem. And a definite liability. A walking, killing thorn in the side who would have to be dealt with in no uncertain terms at some point. I assume all of you have been introduced to the new guy? You could say that. Sorta. Of, kinda. Yeah, we all got warm and fuzzy together back at the CP. Bolin was making his way toward Collins when Gambler, Warlock, and Cyclops handed their prisoners off to other Cobra Commandos. The C-130 was waiting to take the latest round of bad guys. It was time to shake things up a little, light a fire, the executioner decided, his gut getting more knotted with bad instinct with each phase. He turned to ask, You. Next time I give you an order, you better shag your ass like it's on fire. We clear? Bolin watched the commando's jaw drop, asked, looking to Collins. He's clear. Now move it out, soldier. What was that all about, Colonel? You tell me. Collins worked a look down the trio of black ops. Grab a seat in my ride, Stone. We've got a lot of work still to do. I don't want to have to hang around Sudan any longer than necessary. Bolin hung back a moment as Collins marched off toward a Hummer, then fell in. He couldn't shake the ominous feeling the Cobra leader wanted him retired from the mission, and in permanent terms. Abdulaziz Naid had endured too much pain and suffering, horror and humiliation at the hands of the infidels to waste away now in Sudan. Hate and the hunger for revenge had kept him alive up to that point. But he wanted more than burning in the fires of unsated vengeance or wallowing in fantasy about all the death and destruction he wished to wreak on America. What he needed was blood. 
He needed action, not sweating out the daily grind of physical training and tactical exercises, sweeping stone hovels with his AK, shooting up paper targets, or learning how to mix the components for pure TNT, or how to build a dirty bomb. His pure anger and the certainty that he was chosen by God for greatness demanded far more than the sharpening of skills on hostage takedowns, or trying to stay awake and look interested during the long hours of classes given by their various appointed leaders on urban warfare, among other tactics in dispensing justice on their enemies. But when would he be called? Sure, he knew he was one of the lucky to have escaped Afghanistan when the Americans had turned most of the country into a smoking crater with their ferocious and cowardly bombing campaign. He had lost and left behind slews of fellow Muslim fighters, many of whom had been either buried alive or vaporized by incendiary bombs in the caves. Holy warriors he now believed were in paradise, smiling down and urging him to avenge them. Beyond the rage, he felt a moment's pang of sorrow, an awareness he had forsaken much and so far achieved very little. He had a wife and six children in Pakistan after all, and wondered if they were even still alive. He would never see his family again unless he wished to risk venturing into Karachi and take a chance on being arrested by Pakistani authorities who had proved themselves traitors as they had thrown themselves in league with the Americans. Loss, he thought, seemed to be the way of his life, but he was tired of losing. It was time to strike back. It seemed like only yesterday, that harrowing trek northwest through Afghanistan, Iranian sympathizers whisking him and a band of fighters safely into their country. From the beginning they had been informed they would be shipped to Sudan, under the protective umbrella of Colonel Bashir, whose own loyalties to Islamic Jihad were suspect. Naid was certain he was motivated to grant them all safe haven as long as the cash kept coming. They had been told they were to train harder, pray more, and with feverish passion implore God to keep them strong and faithful. A big event was in store for all of them. Their Iranian benefactor had said a lot, but told them little. He moved through the night, away from his camo-netted tent, watching the deep shadows around the perimeter where light glowing from the few strung bulbs powered by the generator was swallowed by the nooks and crannies of the surrounding hills. Lugging his AK-74, he looked up the hill, peering into the dark. As he spotted the winking eye of a cigarette in the dark, he softly cursed the sentry he was about to relieve. That pinpoint of light could serve as a beacon to any enemy hiding in the scrubland beyond their camp. But there would be no point in chastising the man, for in this part of Sudan they were protected by Bashir and his soldiers. Sentry duty was long, hard, boring. As long as none of them were caught napping, a cigarette couldn't do too much damage. They were 63 strong, heavily armed, all of them brothers in jihad, even though they came from various countries. Their goal was the same, complete and utter destruction of America and Israel. He skirted past the target range, felt the grin pull at his lips at the sight of current and former American presidents, paper targets riddled with bullet holes. Someday, with the help of Allah, Quick but hardly quiet, flinching as stones rattled under his boots, he saw the sentry pitch away the smoke, ash and flame arcing away. The man there, then gone, melting back into some cubbyhole. Something felt wrong. In here! The voice hissed out of the black hole. Closing, Naid strained to bring the face into view. There was just enough moon and starlight for him to make out the bearded visage of Musif the Yemeni. What is it? Shh! Keep your voice down! Naid followed Musif's stare to the south, looked back, found the Yemeni searching the black sky. I thought I heard something. I thought I saw something move out there. Naid kept scouring the plain, the sky, and the hill's ridgeline. He didn't see or hear anything. You've been up here too long. Go get some sleep. Hmm. Perhaps you are right. Go then. Musif was climbing out of the hole, Naid feeling the hackles rising on the back of his neck as he sensed some presence in the night, began scouring the ridgeline. For a second, he believed he was simply affected by Musif's paranoia. <coughs> Naid realized what was happening, but he knew it was too late to stop it. It didn't seem right, and there was an instant where he wanted to curse this abominable injustice, aware he would never taste the glory of revenge against the infidels. The tall black figure appeared to materialize out of the very earth when Naid framed him through his haze of terror and outrage. He was taking up slack on the AK's trigger when he heard that dreaded coughing noise again. 
felt the hammer blow between his eyes that turned the night into impenetrable blackness. The executioner used the cigarette as his guide. Two double taps from his sound-suppressed Beretta and both sentries were down. If Collins's intel was on the money, Bolin was alone on the ridge, but he searched his surroundings just the same, senses tuned to any sound or movement all around. No point in getting carried away with any newfound trust in Collins, since Bolin was the one hung out there to dry if it went to hell before the show started. The decision for the soldier to go it alone and take down the sentries came straight from Collins on the ride in. Again, the executioner didn't trust the battle scheme, full of holes and any number of dire possibilities, but he was grateful to some extent to be the odd man out, trusting his own skills, breathing clean air away from the others. Which left him wondering if Collins was thinking in the heat of battle maybe he'd catch some errant friendly fire. He had accepted his role, neither too eager nor showing any surprise, though he hid his suspicion that Collins was suddenly going against the grain, using Wildcard as a solo act when the man had been espousing the virtues of teamwork up to then. If there was something devious behind this sudden shift in strategy, then Bolin would treat his so-called teammates the same as any terrorist here. He might be getting paranoid, but Bolin didn't think so. He couldn't remember the last time his gut instinct had been wrong. They had ridden across the plain, two Hummers and one APC, coming up on the enemy's south end, the commandeered vehicles now parked in a wadi, all of them waiting on the C-130 to drop its package. All the maps, sat imagery, and high-tech apparatus at the Cobra leader's disposal were paving the way. So far, so good. But this outing was meant to reel in the biggest number of human sharks yet. Aside from his weapons, handheld, spare clips, and grenades, Bolin was also weighted down with a nylon satchel choked with plastic cuffs. Sixty-plus terrorists were supposed to go down under a cloud of sleeping gas, Narcon D. A small fuel-air explosive would disperse the potent tranquilizer over the entire camp, or so the plan went. If it was up to Bolin, he'd just as soon bomb the place off the planet with a dose of thermite, but he understood Collins's explanation that there might be a mother load of valuable intelligence stored at the camp. The Major talked about training videos, storehouses of explosives, and other agents that might be used to build bombs. He went on about training manuals, the need to get inside their heads and learn about any operations on the table. Collins wanted facts and figures, and every shred of intel on hand. He wanted a lot as far as Bolin was concerned. Sudan, he knew, was littered with dozens of camps just like this one. What was to say there was anything even here remotely smacking of valuable intelligence? If there was, and Colin seemed certain the gold mine was in the camp, how did the Major know? It was something of a monstrous joke that terrorists could train, arm themselves, and operate right under full view of Western eyes in the sky. They came here from as far away as Indonesia, the worst of the worst, and Bolin had to wonder why this particular camp was chosen. No mistake, Sudan was an outlaw nation, and the explanation from Collins for targeting this bunch was they were paying tribute to Bashir to claim real estate here. Bottom line, Collins was looking to connect all the intelligence dots. Well, he had been given his 30 minutes, and no more to leg it on the sentries. Framed by heat sensors in the hands of the latest edition of Black Ops. Aware the smallest beam of light could still reflect off his skin, Bolin had smeared his face, neck, and hands with black war paint. He had done his part, beating the clock by six minutes. Two cashiered out, and it looked to Bolin as if he was all alone up there. Again, Collins's intel was proving so good it struck Bolin as damn near divine. It seemed every step of the mission was orchestrated, contrived. Or was the Major really that good? Bolin scanned his surroundings while waiting for the C-130 to release the bomb, which would be rolled right off the cargo ramp, floating to Earth by parachute. Wind, altitude, weight of package, and rate of descent were factored in by Collins' supercomputers, the blast preset to go off a hundred feet above the camp. If the package sailed past the camp and detonated beyond the perimeter, or a roving terrorist spotted it coming down and they ran like hell, or the terrorists had protective masks on hand, then things would get interesting, in that Chinese curse kind of way. Stowing the Beretta, Bolin snugged on his gas mask, then unslung his assault rifle. It was a sprawling camp, situated in a valley, ringed by low black hills. Tents, large and small, were all camo-draped, surrounding a terrorist training center complete with stone mock-ups, target ranges, and a PT course. 
Toyota Land Cruisers and motorbikes spread around the perimeter. Not much light, but Collins said his guys would arc a few flares over the camp. Bolin was settling in beside the dead when he spotted several armed shadows streaming from tents. He sensed the agitation down there, silently urging the C-130 to show when the handheld radio on one of his victims crackled. We'll see! We'll see! The soldier gripped his assault rifle, scoured the sky south when he made out the faint rumble, spotted the black bulk of the Hercules. It was sailing in, maybe 5,000 feet overhead, when he saw the canopy open. The way the enemy was scurrying about, Boland suspected Collins was about to find the mother of all monkey wrenches hurled into his plan. Mustafa Alzari found the order outrageous at first. That was two days ago, when their Iranian sponsor had called over the secured line, informing him they would be attacked and arrested. They were to give up peacefully. The assault on the camp would be non-lethal. They were to comply with whatever was demanded of them by their captors. The Iranian told him to fear not, keep the faith. The most glorious victory of Islam to date was just ahead, and he and his comrades in Sudan were to accept what would appear to be an ominous fate. God would take care of them, lead them to a glory they could never imagine, or so the Iranian cryptically stated. Two days to think about it, since the Iranian didn't seem willing to answer his questions, and the more Alzari mulled it over, the more he found the strange request absurd. Naturally, he had gone to Bashir, their guardian in Sudan, but the colonel had laughed off his anxiety and concerns. They were in Sudan, the colonel stated. Why worry? Not even the Western imperialist warmongers dared to even set one foot inside his country. He had wanted to push the matter, but instead quietly gathered his top lieutenants, put them on high alert. No point in shaking the nerves of the rest of the fighters under his command. He went about his business, training, teaching class, secure in the knowledge he was indeed in a country so isolated, so feared by even the most brazen of Western warmongers, he decided to take Bashir at his word. He heard the commotion beyond the flap of his tent. He was marching outside, taking in the numbers of his men suddenly up and flailing about all over the camp. He heard how there was no response from Bashir when Habib had tried to call the garrison for their normal nightly check-in. He saw three of his men moving toward the hill, calling out to the sentry who was supposed to be up there. He felt the fear cutting through him, aware there was all of a sudden too much mystery swathing the night for all of this to be mere coincidence. He heard the rumbling overhead next, looking skyward with the others when he saw the object floating to earth. The massive dark shape sailing overhead, even at the high altitude, was unmistakable. He had seen enough C-130s, Spectres and B-52s in Afghanistan to know they were being attacked. And as a searchlight was framed on the object falling to earth, he knew that long slender object was a missile attached to the parachute. Run! Alzari knew that if that was one of those fuel air explosives coming down, there wouldn't be enough time to flee the terrible fires about to be unleashed. Still, he had to try, bolting, sprinting for all he was worth, working on a silent feverish prayer to God to spare him the fires of the coming hell. Nolan tagged the threesome with a raking burst left to right, the eruption of auto fire from the camp confirming the fear he sensed from the camp proper that they were being hit. He moved off toward the east. The enemy was now on high alert, shadows racing out of the tents, weapons up and ready, RPGs wielded here and there. They were pointing at the sky, a few of them fleeing from the descending package, other terrorists holding their ground, firing their AKs skyward. The night lit up next as the flares sizzled in, igniting an umbrella of white-red light. Then the package blew. The executioner caught a few runners on the fly, then took in the cloud of Narcon D. The way it blew, Bolin could be sure there would be more fighters than sleepers when the smoke settled. The gray-white cloud ballooned, swelling out, but from the deep southern perimeter. Maybe 10 to 15 terrorists were falling, a few more reeling around as the wave rolled over them. But Collins' guys up in the Herc had missed their mark. The executioner knew they were all in for a long and bloody night. The moment had all the earmarks of a horrendous disaster. Somehow, Collins' two guys on board the Herc had either misread their screens, miscalculated math that was nearly done down to the inch for them, or a sudden gust of wind had blown the shoot-off target. Where it was supposed to blow dead center in the camp, the Narcon D had nearly gone off in his face. The shockwave of the detonation alone nearly dropped him in his tracks. God damn it! Collins's M16 was out and ready, but he was nearly blinded in the cloud, so there was no clear shot. Something, one of his guys, bumped into him. 
Collins knew Wildcard was out there taking care of business or being taken care of. The cloud's dispersal would cover one square city block, and if the enemy spotted them when they finally burst out of the cloud, they had lost the edge. Communication, other than the handheld radios, was out the window, since the comlinks couldn't snug on under the masks. It would take ten minutes at the outside for the cloud's tranquilizing potency to diminish to the point that they could shed their protective gear. By then, Collins knew they could all be dead. It was a goat screw beyond his own worst miscalculations. He had a brief moment where he saw the future, felt the coming stab of bitter anger wiping egg off his face. Stone standing there, looking at him, as silent as a statue, but itching to say, I told you so. Whoever he jolted into, Collins shoved him in the direction away from the wrath of the most blistering retorts of auto fire. He could see flare light now, armed shadows cropping up, his guys taking his cue on instinct and following his vector. Collins was drawing target acquisition, nearly out of the cloud. Turning, he found one of his own, a spurt of blood shooting out of his chest, the impact spinning him, then toppling him on his back. If Cobra Force was smothered in the Narcon D cloud, Bolin knew for the moment he was 100% on his own. But what was new? The longer the campaign ground on, the larger he felt that bullseye growing on his back. No time now to concern himself with what Cobra did or didn't do. The executioner was advancing down the hill, drilling precision bursts into the closest hard men, spinning them around, human compasses dead on their feet, spraying blood. Bolin chose the RPG threats next as they popped into his gun sights. Bolin eased into a narrow depression, alert for any new players who showed up in masks or toted M16s. Whatever Collins' original scheme, it was all but shot to hell. Everyone was essentially on his own. Bolin brought up the M16, hosing down anything he found in caftans, smocks, skull caps, or headcloth. Forget any gold mine of intel. Bolin knew he and Cobra Force were in for the fight of their lives. He chased down a pair of runners fleeing westward, stitching them up the spine. The rising bursts finally blowing off skull caps in dark eruptions of blood and brain matter. Then Bolin sighted the first casualties for Cobra. The survivors were bullying their way out of the cloud, far to the west, a line of auto fire punching out through the smoke, connecting with enemy flesh. Bolin spotted one, then two bodies in masks being dragged and dumped behind a land cruiser. The executioner decided to stick to the far eastern edge, aware that Collins would be in a state of perhaps mindless rage over the loss of two men. Couple that with his bad gut feeling about the others, and Bolin figured it best to lone wolf the action. The executioner lurched up out of the hole and waded into the slaughter zone. Alzari could hardly be positive this attack was non-lethal, as foretold by the Iranian, since his own men were dying all around him. Either way, with all the shooting and the crunching din of explosions all over the camp, he wasn't taking any chances. It was sheer dumb luck the AK-74 was within easy reach. One of the trio of his fighters racing for the hill had been blown off his feet by an invisible shooter, the weapon flung back in his direction. He was picking it up when the cloud washed over him, tentacles of gas, tasteless and odorless, flung in his face. The assault rifle was in his hands, eyes tearing all of a sudden, when his legs began to buckle, head swimming in nausea, sight fuzzy. For a moment, he couldn't believe this was happening, a gas bomb. It could be a nerve agent for all he knew, dropping over the camp. It was wrong to the point of absurd, even betrayal, he considered, that the Iranian had known about this assault and not clued him in on any of the finer details. He knew the more gruesome particulars about nerve agents, such as VX and Sarin, having specifically worked with them in a laboratory in Afghanistan. If he was in fact dying, it was painless, quick and clean. There was no vomit spewing from his mouth, no convulsions as if he were hooked up to live electrical wires. No bowels cutting loose, no labored breathing. He was collapsing, a boneless heap of rubber, when he saw the masked invaders surge out of the cloud. A few of his men were holding on, firing wild bursts toward them when they were riddled with auto fire. The world was turning hazy next, sight and sound fading fast, when he saw one of the black-clad masked shooters roll his way. It was a feeble attempt, senses going numb, but he scrabbled his hands for the assault rifle. Looks like your lucky night, asshole. The AK was in Alzari's hands, coming up, when the boot shot out of nowhere and slammed him in the jaw. <clears throat> Collins controlled his rage as he stripped off the masks. 
Two of his men were down. His fingers were checking for a pulse, finding none. Asp and Roadrunner were history. He wouldn't leave them behind on the battlefield, of course, provided any of them walked away in one piece. Then he considered secret knowledge. There was, after all, some good news here, but nobody outside the inner loop would need to know what the upshot was. Collins found himself hunkered beside a land cruiser, his men raking the campgrounds with relentless autofire. Gambler, warlock, and cyclops, sticking together as he knew they would, were nailing terrorists without discrimination, blasting anything that moved or was already out cold from the Narcon D. Collins had recognized Mustafa Alzari, a chemical wizard with connections to North Korean operatives who could land the Muslim world some very nasty ingredients for scraping together a weapon of mass destruction. One to the jaw, and Collins had Alzari laid out and cuffed. He called out to his men. I need ten live ones. No more. Collins had come in wanting to haul off more, but he'd take what he could get at that point. Whether they were first or second tier terrorists didn't really matter any longer. Personal survival was tantamount to mission success. Besides, he had the camp commander, and if the bastard didn't want to talk, he could spill other guts or blood to loosen Alzari's tongue. He checked the eastern end of the camp, where Stone was proving himself a one-man wrecking crew. There were more bodies and body parts, more wreckage strewed around the unmistakable big masked shooter than even Collins could have believed the guy capable of racking up. The sight of Gambler and pals wasting valuable human pumping rounds into figures clearly punch drunk and writhing on the ground grabbed his immediate attention he ran up to gambler hey i need a few live ones gambler was consumed by bloodlust understandable given the circumstances and the fact they were up against the worst of the worst but there were a few top dogs he needed found why don't you go help stone and collins knew what gambler was asking but shook his head we just lost two men anybody on our payroll ask so i need every shooter at least until the finish line is in sight. Yeah. Gambler marched off to assist Stone, who was having a field day butchering the enemy. What a waste of superior talent it would prove, Collins thought. Ten ass-kickers like Wildcard, and he figured he could conquer the world. Then he realized that soon enough, he was going to do just that. Three terrorists came charging out of nowhere. Bolin focused on waxing three mauled hard men to his three o'clock, nearly missed the threat boring in from ahead. One lapse was all it would take, but their mouths alerted the soldier to the sudden new danger. A swarm of lead hornets chased Bolin to cover behind a land cruiser, slugs drumming the vehicle, blasting out windows, showering glass. He hit the ground on his stomach, extended the assault rifle flat out beneath the chassis, and blew them down with a raking burst that chopped them off at the ankles. The executioner fed his M16 a fresh clip and took in the furious action at the western end where Cobra Force appeared to have bailed themselves out of the frying pan. Bolin was sliding around the front of the land cruiser when he nearly ran over a masked shooter. The glacier blue eyes inside the bubbled holes of the mask told him it was Gambler. The gunner left Bolin to look for enemy survivors. Auto fire lashed the air, and Bolin turned to tag two rabbits fleeing for the hills. You want to give us a hand tidying up, Stone? No time to stand there and pat yourself on the back, even though you did some damn nice work here. Collins' mask was off. Bolin looked over at Gambler, now with his mask off, who was kicking at a dead terrorist. His mouth twisted in a grin. On a slow-turning march, Bolin began his own search of the campgrounds, a burning land cruiser coupled with another flare igniting in the sky overhead, providing ample light to give the hell zone a walkthrough. Any live ones you find, Stone, I want them cuffed and dumped into these vehicles. We're out of here and on a herc in ten minutes. Collins signaled Bolin that he could likewise shed his own protective gear. The other members of Cobra Force were towing bodies, snapping cuffs on survivors, slapping drowsy terrorists back to reality. It was over, at least here. Bolin went through the motions of an obligatory search for prisoners, but kept one eye on the movements of Collins, Gambler, and Buddies as they interrogated their prisoners. God only knew what they were really all about, but Bolin sensed a clear and present malevolence about the trio of black ops. I, I don't know where these manuals are that you're talking about! Ah! Anybody else want to keep secrets? <laughs> Look at this guy. He's got a face you just want to smack around. So, how about you, honey? Answer the question. Well, you're the next one on the way to hell. Bolin turned away, went on his search, checking bodies, weapon ready for any terrorist Lazarus rising from the dead with a weapon. 
He watched Gambler as he manhandled a prisoner into the largest of the tents. Moments later, Gambler reappeared with a bulging nylon satchel. Boland slowly moved back toward the others, watched the action, listened. Prisoners were dumped into land cruisers. The executioner gave the camp and the surrounding night one last search. Nothing stirred, groaned, or twitched. He saw Collins walking up to him, met him halfway. Collins seemed to give the carnage an approving look. You don't look too happy, Stone. You lost two men? Yeah, Aspen Roadrunner. I think you'd be the one with a longer face, Major. Shit happens. Indeed it does. What next? Interrogation, once we get them chained down on the Herc. I gather that's where it gets real interesting. Hey, maybe our methods for getting information from these scumbags doesn't jive with most folks' sense of morality and fair play. What I'm saying is, are you gonna have a problem with how I let those three handle the Q&A session? Boland probably would, since torture and cold-blooded murder wasn't how he handled business. At least as standard operating procedure. But there was some method to the madness. If they were going to extract valuable information about terrorist operations, future plans for strikes, and what the enemy had coined big events, some pain would have to be inflicted, perhaps even some bloodshed. It was the way of the real world. It's your show, Collins. Let's shake a leg, Stone. I've got a specter on the way. They're ready to burn this place off the earth. When we board, I'm going to lay out the rest of the mission for you, including where we're eventually going to take this bunch for trial. As far as I'm concerned, you've proved your mettle. Boland said nothing as Collins turned and walked away. Maybe Collins believed he'd just hung out the welcome aboard sign, but Boland was hardly flattered, much less about to embrace the change in attitude. And so it began. Boland grabbed a cup of bad coffee, settled in, claiming one of the several bolted-down chairs. He counted 26 terrorists altogether, headcloths, skullcaps, turbans, tunics, African caftans, and so forth, distinguishing independent countries of origin. It had been something of a monumental struggle, manhandling the prisoners to the bench. Between threats and beatings and blood spilled from rifle butts to the head and face, but Cobra got them chained down. Let me be perfectly clear. You aren't going to paradise. You aren't going to a warm yellow planet. You aren't going to a sandy beach to work on your tan and unwind while you hatch your next chicken shit scheme to murder Israelis or Americans. There will be no flight schools, no lap dances in South Florida, no 79 virgins waiting for you on the other end of this magic carpet ride. Bolan had silently begged off the whole brutal process, drawing funny looks from gambler and cronies. It had been clear to Bolan the trio of black ops got the most jollies from abusing the prisoners beyond the necessary rough persuasion to accept their lot. Boland filed them away as sadists. Whatever else they were, he was sure they would reveal in time. The prisoners' hands were now cuffed to the long steel bench, their feet manacled together. Faces ranged from seething anger to utter disbelief to the sort of sociopathic hatred he'd seen countless times before in the eyes of the fanatic. A few of the bad guys appeared shell-shocked from the shellacking they'd received, thousand-mile stairs fixed on the far wall. They might be in the bag now, but the real danger was just ahead. The prisoners would be caged animals, raging for a way to break out and devour their captors. Collins had the intro session started, a slow pace, back and forth, hands behind his back, the star of the show. Gambler, Warlock, and Cyclops stood behind the Major, a few feet of space between them, looking pleased with the floor show so far. Asp and Roadrunner were getting zipped up in rubber bags. Bolin wasn't sure how they would be shipped back to the States, but was fairly certain Collins had allowed for casualties and had it figured out in advance. They were ten minutes in the air, and the way the Hercules had swung around, Bolin believed they were heading south, figured the next stop was the base in Kenya. Beyond that, Collins had yet to fill him in. While Collins paced and spoke, Bolin watched, sipped his coffee. A few of the Cobra commandos stood guard, M-16s out and aimed at the prisoners, while other commandos went to the computer bays, hauling out whatever intel had been seized at the camp. The one-eyed op worked on a smoke, a strange grin on his face, eager, no doubt, to shake some more nerves with on-the-spot executions. You are now prisoners of the United States government, POWs, but stamped as illegal combatants. You will be questioned thoroughly and extensively, and you will comply. I know you'll have many questions. 
Bear in mind, as much as you believe your Allah knows your heart... The devil knows it equally as well. Every dark thought, every secret desire. Every malicious intent. Bottom line, boys and girls, you cannot fool us. You will give us what we want. We know you better than you know yourselves. It was a sick sing-song routine. The Three Stooges, only with guns and malice and bigotry in their hearts. Collins lit a cigarette, held up a hand, and silenced the trio. You are going to be detained. For how long is up to each of you? How much information you provide may determine in the long run whether or not you are convicted of crimes against humanity. Depending on what we learn about you and the nature of your evils, you may be hung at the end of your trial. Filthy American pig! Who said that? Who the fuck said that? No one said that, huh? Guess I'll just have to pick one as an example. Complainers, smart mouths, and foul language will not be tolerated on this joyride. Collins nodded, and Cyclops brought the Beretta out of its holster and walked up to a terrorist Collins pointed at. Jeez, Cyclops, use your knife from now on, and take care of that noise. The blade was out, Bolan feeling his gut clench. Shut up! Shut up! The commandos rushed to the bench, pointing assault rifles at the prisoners and cracking a skull or two. The prisoners began to simmer down. Bolan hadn't signed on for torture and indiscriminate cold-blooded murder of even the worst of the worst. It was far from any moral cowardice that froze Bolan from acting out his rage and putting an end to this horror show. He decided to let the sick drama unfold as it would. Beyond a scintilla of doubt, and there had been some up to then, he now knew Collins and Cobra were just as bad as the men they imprisoned. They were vicious, merciless predators. They could wrap themselves up in the stars and stripes all they wanted, but murder of helpless combatants, illegal or otherwise, simply ranked them as evil. The moment also told Bolan he wasn't one of them, never had been, never would be. And they could write that in stone. He would keep it to himself, but he would hold them every bit as accountable to retribution and swift justice as they wanted to hold the enemy. Any of you other sons of dirty whores want a taste? Cyclops wiped his blade off on the caftan of the terrorist sitting next to the victim and getting sobbed in geysering crimson. The cut had been so deep Bolan could tell he'd nearly decapitated the terrorist. They left him there, chained and spouting blood. Now I believe I was laying out your sorry futures. From a metal table, the Major picked up a yellow tablet of paper. Whether you spill your guts by mouth or on paper, you're gonna tell us everything. How it gets done is up to you. But you are gonna give up every mullah, imam, or goat-humping whore you have ever spoken with in your miserable lives. Your words will eventually be written down. And no, for you there will be no six-figure advance out of New York City for your tales of woe and sorrow as seen through the narrow and rapidly closing windows of your soulless, murderous lives. You, each and every one of you, were not born and raised in a promised land. You have paved your own roads to hell, and hell is where you are going. Don't worry, soon there will be more joining you, so you are going to have plenty of company. Collins grinned down the line, then flicked his cigarette, winging it off a bearded face. Any questions? Collins spun on his heels, Gambler falling in behind. Cyclops and Warlock remained with the prisoners. Bolan watched as the two ops opened small pouches, began fixing patches with numbers on the shoulder of each prisoner. Enjoy the floor show, Colonel? Immensely. You being smart? Never. Collins shook a cigarette out of the pack, offered one to Bolan, who declined. You ever wake up someday, Stone? And not like who or what you see in the mirror? You ever wonder if sometimes your life should have been different? Well, that occasion, but not too often. We're all only human. Or inhuman. Bolan said nothing, though he wanted to point out exactly who back there was the more inhuman. We've got a lot of work to do, Colonel. We hit Kenya, we'll iron out the details for the next stint. We're going on a little vacation to the Seychelles. Just you, me, and Gambler. Come on, let's go see what goodies we grabbed up from the homeboys back there. Bolan kept the suspicion off his face about the next round, but the itch between his shoulder blades just got worse. There was a whole lot of doubt in his mind that a trip to the island nation of the Seychelles was going to be a day at the beach. Khalik Kunani was a long way from home, and he was disturbed. 
It wasn't the first time he'd left his country, a cutout delivering intelligence or marching orders or money from his Ayatollah to a group of fighters. Before, whether it was Chechnya, Kabul, Karachi or Paris, he had met with brother Muslims to outline future operations against the infidels, drop off money and intelligence and shore up resolve. Now he had been ordered to work with the enemy, as different a mission as heaven was to hell. Precisely who they were, he wasn't sure. His entire task swathed in grim mystery. Anxiety sure to dog him for days to come. Kunami had never met them, or even viewed a photo of these shadow men. The homing beacon fixed to his belt beneath his cashmere topcoat would lead them to him, or so he had been told. And the briefcase in his hand was bringing to the enemy that which they so valued, and was apparently their sole reason for coming over to the right side. Money. 300 million U.S. dollars, to be exact, was to be delivered to these nameless, faceless Westerners. It was all electronic funds, but he had the access codes to the bank accounts that would prove the transfers had been made. It had been a long journey from Tehran, but jumping nerves and running adrenaline kept his weariness at bay. He had stayed in Istanbul for a day, then flown on by a private charter to Sicily. He had been ordered to take his time, shake any tales, proceed with cautious optimism, meeting with fellow Muslim cutouts who had moved him on safely to the next leg of his sojourn. In Sicily, a boat had been waiting, hauling him the 60 miles south to Malta. Halfway to North Africa now, he vaguely entertained the notion of sailing on from the capital city of Valletta, turning his back on some plan that not even he was privy to in detail. But Kunani knew to shirk his duty was not only a certain death sentence, but also he would risk his immortal soul by not carrying out the will of God as spoken through his Ayatollah. He had never questioned the Ayatollah's judgment before now, but he couldn't help but wonder about the sanity of working with the enemy. Wishing he were armed, he shucked up his coat against the chilly morning air breezing in off Grand Harbor. A dirty light was just now breaking over the ships and boats of various size and duties. Kunani was on schedule, according to his watch, as he continued west, angling away from the docks, melting into the shadows, swaddling the first rows of grimy stone buildings. Shadows were coming to life all around him, his nerves talking back to him louder with each passing moment. He wondered when and how many of his contacts would suddenly move out of any number of alleys and courtyards in the fortified city of towers and ramparts, a maze of imposing architecture he was sure that had helped the Maltese drive away invaders over the centuries. Gunani stopped as he suddenly felt a presence closing in on him from behind. Are you enjoying your stay in Malta? Gunani jumped. It was his contact. Slowly he turned, saw a muscular, dark-haired man in a black bomber jacket. Hard to say what nationality, but Kunani assumed he was of Western origin. He repeated the words he had memorized. That remains to be seen. This way. Kunani followed his contact into an alley. His heart racing, he braced to attack should he discover his Ayatollah had been betrayed. The contact led him to a nondescript stone building midway down the alley. A door was opened, and the contact held his arm out. Kunani hesitated in the doorway, then ventured inside. He was met by another dark man who beckoned him to follow down the hallway. Light flickered from a doorway at the far end, and Kunani was ushered through. It appeared to be some sort of command and control center. Kunani took in the banks of computers, other screens with digital readouts, a computerized wall map of the world. A big gray-haired man walked up out of the shadows, displaying a shoulder-holstered pistol. I assume you have it? Kunani set the briefcase on a metal table, clicked through the dial, opened it up. He produced the CD-ROM, handed it to the gray man. The gray man handed it off to a subordinate who inserted the disc into a computer. The access codes. Kunani watched as the fingers of the shadow man flew over the keyboard. Three hundred million. The down payment. As agreed upon, another three million will be deposited when this event is underway. Another three million when I have returned to Iran with the merchandise, whatever that is. I was informed by my sponsor that the rest of the agreed upon price of a billion dollars will be turned over in cash, in person, when the item promised to my sponsor is delivered to him. Gunani felt a flash of resentment as the gray man ignored him, watching only the computer monitor. Confirmation, mister? It's there, sir. Three hundred mil. 
The gray man smiled, and Kunani was chilled for a moment by the lifeless eyes that stared at him. Okay. Looks like we're in business. May I ask... No, you may not. You can call me the contact. That's all you need to know. You will be our guest here, so why don't you get settled in, grab some food, some shut-eye. A lot is going to happen very soon, and I don't know when you or any of us will sleep or eat again once this thing starts. The gray man turned away, and Kunani felt his contact from the alley coming up behind him. This way. Kunani held his ground, the questions piling up now more than ever. He wasn't sure how much sleep he would get in the house of the enemy, and he felt a sudden urge to pray. Oh man, welcome to paradise. Have I arrived or what? Bolin checked what he believed was yearning on Collins's face. Would have sworn next the Cobra leader was even getting a little misty-eyed beneath his black Blues Brothers shades. Paradise. The soldier, sitting at the midway point on a bench in the large motorized outboard, followed Collins's stare to shore. It was a beautiful sight to behold. The sun was up and blazing, peeking in and out of the scudding white clouds. The calmest and bluest green water Bolin had ever seen, sparkling like a vast bed of diamonds. Palm and Takamaka trees rose from the white sand, a kaleidoscope of exotic birds fluttering here and there among the lush tropical vegetation. Gulls strafed the surface for breakfast to the west, while a school of dolphins cavorted to the east, sleek torpedoes glistening as they arced in and out of sunlight. Schooners and what had to be a hundred-plus-foot yacht were sluicing toward the harbor of Grand Isles. But the three of them were going to beach the boat in a remote cove, their beachhead on the island of Pralan, where an SUV was waiting for them, courtesy of company ops. Water sprayed in his face as Gambler guided them toward the shore in the Zodiac inflatable boat. It was unclear to Bolin how they were going to proceed, though most of the details had already been spelled out, at least as far as the numbers and strategy went. Most of the night had been spent in the base in Kenya, viewing training videos, poring over manuals that covered the usual nightmare aspects of murder and mayhem being dreamed up by terrorists, but with a few new frightening twists that involved chemical and biological agents. There were instructions for developing bombs on the spot using materials that could be bought at any hardware store. There were videos where black hooded instructors taught hand-to-hand -hand combat, hostage takedown, fired small and large arms, wired C4 to cell phones as remote detonators, displayed the proper and most aggressive way to use knives and other sharp objects on dummies with poster faces of well-known American politicians and celebrities. One especially disturbing video had shown a goat thrashing in death throes as a white cloud was pumped into a room, but there was no mention of what the chemical had been. With all the material they had seized in Sudan, Bolin knew it would take days, perhaps even weeks, to uncover future operations. He was never one to look beyond the next battlefront, but depending on how the rest of the mission went, Bolin decided he could have Ragnola flex some official muscle and land the Intel gold mine, or copies thereof, in the hands of the cyber team at Stony Man Farm. No telling, really, what might turn up, but whatever intelligence could be stolen and studied always put the warrior one step ahead of the enemy. Then there was Collins, giving Bolin once again the distinct impression he was holding back or holding on to something only he was meant to know. For all his talk about filling in Colonel Stone on the rest of the mission and cluing him in as to the final destination of the prisoners, it didn't happen. Bolin decided to sit back, aware the next few moments could be his last chance for some time to relax and take in the sights. If nothing else, the three of them were certainly decked out as if they were going to spend the day on the golf course or sip Mai Tais poolside at some resort. Dark aviator shades covered gamblers and Boland's eyes, and they sported wildly colored aloha shirts with flowers, flamingos, and scantily clad island girls. Black slacks of Italian silk for Boland with black slip-on shoes. Gambler went with white pants and alligator shoes. Collins sticking to khakis and white loafers, the wardrobe provided courtesy of the Cobra leader. The nylon bags on the deck would soon dispel anybody's notion they were in Pralin for fun and games. The hardware was basic, mini Uzis all around, Beretta sidearms, commando daggers, and a smattering of frag, flashbang, and incendiary grenades, with two canisters packed with Narcon D and three gas masks. Collins's contacts on the island had nailed down the location of Iranian extremists and had them under watch. 
There were two hits on the scorecard. Enemy numbers totaling 15, could be more, split between a hotel suite in Grand Bas and a remote rainforest pocket at the eastern edge of the island. Collins claimed they were going in hard and fast, two faces committed to memory for the cuffed stuff, but said during the final brief he didn't want to be running around Pralin, shooting and blowing up the island, drawing a lot of attention to themselves. They had left their Gulfstream ride, parked back on the main island of Mahe. On an airfield the Major had informed him was an American intelligence base, which agency the Major wasn't even sure God knew. Out of all the 115 islands that comprised the archipelago in the vast expanse of the Indian Ocean, Bolin was curious as to how Collins knew exactly where the Iranian fundamentalists were holed up. The Cobra leader had simply told Bolin they'd been working on it for some time. They just knew. But of course. Using his GPS monitor, Gambler steered them into a cove thick with swaddling palm trees. With birds calling and the sun beating down on his neck, Bolin felt coral rock scrape the bottom of the outboard. They were out, the soldier helping his teammates haul the outboard up the sandy bank where Gambler took the mooring line and tied it around the base of a palm tree. Personal weapons bag in hand, Bolin, suddenly feeling that itch between his shoulder blades as they were now stepping back into the ring for the next round, hung back. Gambler was giving him that strange look again. Collins was staring down the shoreline, then out to sea. I tell you what, gentlemen. You ever feel like you've worked and sweated, or in our cases, shed blood and risked our lives for Uncle Sam for so long and so many times that you've earned the right to cut yourself a slice of paradise? Ever think, screw it all, I'm gonna take what I can now and live the good life. Bolin said nothing, but his gut was rumbling loud and angry. Instinct warning him Collins had just revealed something dark and hungry about himself. All the time. One of these days, and one of these nights, there shall be an all the time. The look melted on the Cobra leader's face, and the dark hunger in the eyes came back. Let's go kick some butt. Bolin hesitated, Collins and Gambler moving past the warrior. They might be in paradise, but Bolin was sure that in the coming hours, the fires of hell would blow through the Seychelles. You want to join us, Colonel? Welcome to paradise. Zarik Hamadan had a gut feeling the party was over, but he'd suspected that the good times were never meant to keep on rolling, even before he set foot on this island paradise. It was strange how he'd been ordered, a top lieutenant in the global jihad, to essentially cool his heels in the closest thing to heaven on earth he could imagine and wait for his marching orders from their ayatollah. So he was now far away from his homeland, surrounding himself with all the sinful pleasures his religion denounced and despised as trappings of the devil. But he had been told to go to the Seychelles, enjoy himself while he could. A big event was soon to happen. Be patient, have faith, be strong. The usual mantra, yes, but who could disobey the Ayatollah? So he had played hard, bringing along European playmates, a few ounces of cocaine and several cases of scotch whiskey in the Learjet that had left Riyadh six weeks ago. Trouble was, he was having great difficulty enjoying the good times these days when he was juiced with anxiety all the time. The Saudis could get away with it, lopping off the heads of drug dealers and addicts, publicly flogging women of loose morals, all sinners guilty until proven innocent, then jet off for a weekend in Paris or Amsterdam or London, gambling and drinking, drugging and whoring. There had been a time when he would have found that an abominable hypocrisy in the eyes of God, an evil lie that betrayed the strict tenets of the Quran. Six weeks in the Seychelles, though, and he wasn't so sure. He was only a man, after all, with needs and wants. Could be the Saudis had the right idea. Do as I say, not as I do. He was out of the pool, one of his Swedish playmates bringing him a towel and a glass of champagne. He dismissed her with a squeeze of her buttocks. Playtime was over. He needed to go to the suite, place calls to various contacts and cutouts who would get in touch with their leader. He needed to know something. All the indulgence was fine, but he was antsy for answers. And being a man of action, a fighter who both planned and carried out operations against the enemy, he needed to get back out in the battlefield. Toweled off, killing the drink, he spotted Baluk, his big guard, mingling with some of the locals near the bar. 
He caught his eye, waved him over, slipped into his sandals and Hawaiian shirt, and began walking for the back entrance to the lobby on the far side of the pool. He took his cell phone, dialed up to the suite. Four, then five rings, and he found himself becoming angry, aware his men were up there, most likely huffing blow and perhaps catching an early morning hummer from one of the Euro strumpets. Yes. Hamadan froze, felt his jaw clench, ears buzzing with rage as he tuned in to the party antics. Ahmad actually sounded annoyed he had to answer the phone. Oh, but it was time to put an end to the nonsense. Get rid of the whores. Hamadan watched Baluk move toward him, looking miffed that he had to leave his new lady friends at the bar. I am coming up, and I want them gone by the time I get there. And turn off that racket. We have work to do. Hamadan dropped the cell phone in his pocket. It was time to announce to all of them it was back to work in no uncertain terms. A warrior needed to stay sharp, focused, alert, aware his destiny was far greater than wallowing around in the sludge of self-indulgence. He was moving past the bar when three men seemed to materialize out of the vegetation that surrounded the cabana. It was just a feeling, but something didn't look right about the trio. For a fleeting second, he had the feeling they knew who and what he was, that they had come looking expressly for him. Or were his nerves simply shot, too much of everything Paradise had to offer dulling the warrior's senses, replacing martial talent with simple paranoia and fear? Right then, not even he could be sure what was real or imagined. They were dressed for Paradise, sure enough, checking out the site's poolside, one of them easing toward the bar as if to order. The one with the black sunglasses ogling a few of the bathing beauties— but there was something in the way the tall, dark one moved that left Hamadan wondering if he was being stalked. Sure, the island was a tourist magnet, and they came from all over Europe, the Middle East, provided their wallets were fat, and rich Westerners were a common sight. Paradise wasn't meant for the poor, unless they bust tables or cleaned rooms. He looked away from the trio, picking up the pace, sweeping past the gaggle of couples just rousing to hit the pool or the hotel restaurant for a late breakfast of Bloody Marys and stuffed lobster. He was somewhat comforted by the fact Baluk carried a browning high power beneath his white sports coat, but suddenly wished he was armed. He was tempted to look back over his shoulder, but if he was being followed, he didn't want to betray his suspicions. If he wasn't, then he would feel foolish. The lobby was bustling with tourist traffic. In his heightened state of anxiety, the polished chrome, the white marble of countertops and floor seemed to drive hot needles into his eyes as the sunlight knifed through the ceiling window. He beelined for the bank of elevators, found one of them opening just as he stepped up, the car disgorging a mosaic of peoples and cultures from the island and the world over. He was inside, keying the slot that would take him to the top floor, turning, grateful to be alone, on his way up top to shake up the troops, when Hamadan saw his worst suspicions become reality. The trio of strangers strolled into the car. It was a frozen moment. A glimpse of the sound-suppressed weapon, the doors closing, and Hamadan heard the soft chug. He didn't have to look to know Baluk was on his way to true paradise as he heard him fall and tasted the blood that had spattered on his lips. One of the trio was on Hamadan before he could do more than blink. His gun, with its silencer, pointed dead center in his face. Who are you? We ain't tour guides, fella. Unless you want to take a trip into the Twilight Zone. How many in the suite? Bolin armed himself. Sound suppressors already fixed on his Mini Uzi and Beretta 93R. It would be awkward, hitting the enemy while draping the nylon satchel over his head, hanging it from the other shoulder. But there was no choice. Seven. Give me the elevator key card. Colin snatched the proffered key from Hamadan's trembling hand and tossed it to Gambler. Any guests? No. No whores? I sent them out of the suite. The doors, they open in or out? In. I'll need the keys. You won't need them. They are left unlocked. Cocky little shits. Yeah, well, even terrorist scum needs to unwind once in a while. But all this lax time is about to get a few of them killed. Turn around, asshole. Anything cute? You shout a warning? And I'll pump one through your head. Makes me sick just to look at you. And if he's lied about the doors? Then frag him. He lies. He ends up like his pal here. Cullen spun Hamadan, fastened the plastic cuffs. You know the drill, gentlemen. Stick to the plan by the numbers. I get in position, I'll give you a three count. Let's hit and get. Look alive. If there's a jihad goon waiting when these doors open, drop him. The doors opened, Bolin lifting both weapons, braced for armed competition, waiting or lurking in the hall. 
It was clear, bowling out and taking point against his better judgment as he led Gambler to the main double doors at the far south end. Collins would go in through the north doors that led down an alcove to the kitchen and dining area. The living room was for the soldier and Gambler to sweep. If it played true to the blueprints Collins had gotten from his island contacts, the idea was to catch them in a scissors pinch. Bolin flanked one side of the doors, wedged the Beretta in the waistband at the small of his back, Gambler on the other, the soldier eyeballing his black ops counterpart. He looked down the hall where Collins was in position, the soldier suddenly not trusting the setup in the least. For one thing, it was damn convenient that Collins was going in with Hamadan as his human body armor, while plastering Gambler to his rear. That itch was back, so strong now, the soldier was hearing bells and whistles, but there was no one to watch his back but himself. Gambler showed three fingers, counted down. The executioner grabbed the handle, twisted, opened, and went in, leading the way and searching for targets, his movements masked by the sound of a lesbian scene playing at full volume and in living color on the giant screen TV in the suite. As Gambler watched Bolin rush the door and take point, he made up his mind. Gambler was going to do it his way. Hell with it. If Major Collins had a problem with the call, he'd live with the end result and come to see reason why it was done here and now. First, the body would have to be left behind in the suite, since they couldn't very well lug a bloody corpse all over Grand Anse, with tourists and locals gawking and gaping at them on their way out of town. Second, they were so far away from the real world, the corpse might never see U.S. soil, especially if a few bucks could be spread around to some eager Seychellois hands to make sure the body was buried at sea. Last, but certainly not least, he just plain didn't trust or like the man he knew as Stone. He didn't have a problem with going through the motions of the mission with the other commandos who weren't on board for the full ride. In time, they would receive the same treatment. But he read this stone guy as something way different, something more than a standard-issue black ops commando. What? He wasn't sure. And what's more, he didn't care. Gambler only knew he had to put one in the back of the guy's head. End of story. They were in, advancing down the foyer when Stone got it started, blasting away with both barrels, scanning the room, taking cover and concealment wherever he could, behind palm trees or couches, shooting, advancing, breathing steady, hurling up a fat mahogany table as return fire sought him out, thick wood absorbing rounds with a thundering drumbeat. There was a chance that the Iranians would take care of Gambler's problem for him, but it was a damn remote one given the way the Iranians were being shot to shit. Gambler figured he could at least make it look good, marching down the short flight of steps, drilling a burst of 9mm scorchers into a pistol-brandishing fanatic on the far side of the suite. He cored him with a rising burst, hammering him backwards, arms flailing into the giant screen TV. Gambler watched as Stone caught another fundamentalist, too slow on the draw. The body crashed through a coffee table littered with party goodies. Gambler counted up four bad guys down and out, then heard the din of weapons fire from the north end of the suite. If all went well, Collins would get bogged down for a few critical seconds, never see the curtain fall on this wild card character. He sighted on Bolin. If it played out that way, Gambler saw himself being able to shrug it off. Shit happened, Major. One of the bad guys nailed him. It sounded like a solid plan, but Stone was alternating his attention to one Iranian dashing for a hallway across the suite and looking back his way. The guy was probably one of the best shooting ops he'd ever seen, but he was no mind reader. Gambler let him get the chase started, allowed for ten or so feet lag time, then charted his own hunt on an angle to Boland's right flank as the big guy sprayed auto-fire down the hall. Gambler was lifting his weapon when he spotted his TV star rising from the smoke and glass. What the fuck? Gambler chugged two rounds into his forehead, shattering the skull like a rotten eggshell. Stone had just cut down the last of the extremists, or at least those armed combatants within sight, and was changing clips in his mini-Uzi. Never a better opportunity, Gambler decided, and swung his weapon up, finger taking up slack on the trigger. Bolin knew it was coming, and he was ready, and in the executioner's world, traitors were shown no mercy, no exceptions. Out of the corner of his eye, Bolin read the look, the gun hand swinging up, no mistaking where it was aimed. One swift pivot, and the executioner hit the Beretta's trigger. A 9mm parabellum shocker drilled in dead center between Gambler's eyes. <coughs> the moment seemed to suspend itself before Bolin. It was no more than a second, but Gambler was a statue, a strange expression of confusion and betrayal paralyzing his face before he toppled to his back. Time and again, pure and simple gut instinct had paid off, saving Bolin's life. When the stakes were life and death, there were no second chances. 
Boland checked the carnage, turning when he spotted Collins hauling his prisoner into the living room. The look on the Cobra leader's face told Bolin he'd seen what happened. Bolin jerked a nod at Gambler, then aimed his Beretta at Collins. Do you want to explain that? Whoa, hold up, Colonel. Collins didn't have to look real hard at Stone's face to know his life depended on how he played the next few seconds. The big question was, would the man know, or even sense, Collins had an inkling Gambler had wanted to take him out since first laying eyes on him? I saw it happen, Stone. You did. Collins stood there, Boland's eyes boring into him, measuring the soul inside the man, and Collins began to feel his knees shake. He clawed his hand harder into Hamadan's shoulder to steady himself. I think I can explain. You can. Collins stared into the ugly snout of the sound suppressor. You mind taking that out of my face? I do. Listen, that guy, and not even I know who he really was, or what agency he worked for, was acting on his own. He was? God damn it, I had nothing to do with it. I didn't know how much he wanted to kill you. Until now. Yeah. How convenient. God damn you, Stone. I... I... We are walking out of here now. No, we're not, Collins. Not until I know why your boy wanted to shoot me in the back of the head. You'd have to ask him. Little hard to do now. No shit. What's going on here, Collins? What's this mission really all about? Collins managed to steady his breathing held Stone's stare, unwilling to flinch and wilt under the penetrating drill of those blue eyes. He shook Hamadan some. It's about a bunch of murdering scumbags like this here beauty who wish only to wipe out Americans and Jews. It's about rounding up some of the worst of the worst to be interrogated so we know what said scumbags are planning and then to stand trial for crimes and atrocities against the human race. Beyond that, hell... I might go on CNN with proof for anyone straddling the fence that the so-called religion of Islam is a sham, a whopping lie, little more than a doctrine of violence, hate, and intolerance. That's it. End of story. Whatever paranoid fantasies you might be having, I'm here to tell you I'm an American, a soldier who is committed solely to his duty. And I have a job to do, and I'm going to do it. What that one over there was up to, I have not the first fucking clue. You take it or leave it. And his other two stooges? I'll deal with them when we get back. I'll remove them from the rest of this mission, if that would ease any fears. It's not them I think I should be afraid of. Me, then, Stone? Okay. If you think I'm some treasonous bastard out to wax your butt because we knocked heads at the start, and pull the trigger. Collins waited for the chug, the look in Stone's eyes hardening. I'll watch you from here on, and if I even think I see you... Don't even finish that remark. Look, if I were you, I'd feel the same damn way. So, what happened here was just some aberration? With Gambler dead, we'll never know for sure, will we? But I'll stand here and look you straight in the eye and state with a clean conscience that, yes, it was an aberration. End of story. And discussion. You either believe me or shoot me. Collins felt his heart pound. Stone stood silent, looking as if he were debating the matter. How many did you take out? Two. The Beretta lowered. Then we're done here. Let's go, Major. We've got work to do. I'll lead the way. And drive. Whatever. Collins held his breath, but took his fear and anger out on Hamadan, shoving the Iranian toward the foyer. Although he knew it wouldn't happen, what with Stone's honor and all that crusader crap... He still waited for the bullet to core into the back of his skull. It didn't come, and that left Collins wondering if and when it ever would, not sure if the man had bought his act. Stone had to know his hours were numbered in single digits. Collins knew what had to be done, the late and unlamented gambler having already tipped his hand, but Collins was sure that unlike gambler, he would choose the right time and place. Every fiber in Boland's being screamed that Collins was lying. Gambler had failed, but Collins or another Cobra commando would try again. Fair enough. In his world, where there was only blood, death, and mayhem, Boland had also encountered deceit and backstabbing. Sometimes it was done for a twisted ideology or revenge, but more often than not, it boiled down to love of money. A sixth sense about the darker driving forces of human nature had developed, and Bolin considered himself a better-than-decent judge of character. Collins had shown him all the signs designed to convince him that everybody else had something to hide except him and the thousand-pound gorilla on his shoulders. 
There was the trembling he'd seen in the Major's knees, the voice breaking just enough while it strained for cool, calm, and collected, the brain churning in high gear behind the eyes, selecting the right words. There was the forcing himself past any hesitation when the spotlight hit him in the eyes, fighting through the terror that he'd been caught, dumping the blame on Gambler. There was bluster, posturing, the defiance that was part and parcel of the liar attempting to create his own truth and sell it. Collins fancied himself just a little smarter, better, and tougher. There was more than enough to tell the executioner that not only was everything not as it seemed, but everything about this mission had changed. A line had been drawn in the sand. Right up to Gambler's coup, whether it was personal or something else, Collins had claimed to know everything about every player on both sides, with the possible exception of the near fiasco in Sudan. It made no sense that Collins would suddenly claim ignorance and wash his hands of one of his illustrious human black ops, write him off as a bad seed. Bolin was sure there was some darker agenda on the Major's table, but the executioner was stuck right in the middle of whatever it was, with no option but to brazen it out and be ready. With no choice but to forge ahead, Bolin would dangle the noose for Collins, watch the man every step of the way with an instinct so finely honed over the years he might as well have eyes in the back of his head. If the Major hung himself, so be it. The soldier was on his own. He had been ever since coming on board Cobra Force. Okay, Colonel, this is where we get off. You got the game plan down? Bolin was in the back seat. Collins was driving, looking at Bolin in the mirror. Hamadan was in the shotgun seat. The Iranian was looking surly, but had given them the intel they needed during the hour-plus drive to hit the extremist outpost near the beach. Eight fanatics were at the end of the trail, a hundred yards or so from where they sat. Ghazi Katani was their prime target, his face memorized from intel pics. The only motion and heat sensors and cameras were at the edge of the clearing, before the thatch and bamboo compound rose from a sandy beach bristling with palm and casuarina trees. Bolin had already perused the sat picks. There was a wharf stretching away from the beach, leading to a speedboat and schooner, and a narrow trail that ran parallel to the main road. Collins informed him when this was wrapped, they would get picked up by a chopper flown back to Mahe. Simple. Maybe. The strategy had a few flaws. Their prisoner was to march down the trail, cuffed, and announce himself while the two of them advanced on opposite sides toward the compound. When the enemy showed, it was pop and drop, bag the big game, and hit the beach for evac. Bolin pictured Hamadan shouting a warning, figuring eight against two were pretty decent odds. Once the shooting started, Bolin saw the enemy scattering into the jungle or bolting for the beach, driving away in the speedboat. Beyond that, they weren't exactly camouflaged for a jungle hit, their flaming aloha shirts, easy bullseyes. And no advance through a jungle was ever soundless. There were twigs to watch, brush to evade branches and hanging vines and such to avoid. They were birds and animals, spooked by human presence to sound the alarm. Bolin took his satchel, looped the strap over his head, settled it on his shoulder. He deposited a frag grenade in his pants pocket. Stone, you with me? He met Collins's look in the rearview mirror. I've got it. We okay, me and you? We cool, back in business? The Major was feeling Bolin out. He wanted reassurance they were back on the same team that whatever happened with Gambler was all just some bizarre mishap. Sure. We're just peachy. Let's do it, then. Collins turned to Hamadan. Get out! Anything cute and you're the first one to go. I don't need you that bad. Bolin was out the door, Miniuzi and Beretta leading the way toward his point of penetration into the rainforest. Hamadan was shoved away from the SUV, Collins giving him a swift kick in the rear. <clears throat> Bolin checked for the path of least resistance into and beyond the thick vegetation, found it, and slipped himself into the sliver of dirt path. He scanned the rainforest, darting ahead, crouched as wings fluttered. Hamadan was walking ahead in a sort of waddle shuffle, glancing at Collins, who vanished into the forest. Bolin kept moving, glancing from Hamadan to where Collins had melted out of sight. I don't need you that bad. The executioner couldn't help but wonder to whom Collins had referred. Ghazi Katani was feeling grateful for the simple things in life. It was quite the pleasant change compared to the anxiety and worry that had gripped him during his first few weeks on the island. Before he had landed on Pralin, 
He had many reservations about leaving behind the safety and comfort of the familiar surroundings of Iran for an island in the middle of nowhere, shipped off by their leader to some remote corner of the planet, as if he and the others were criminals in hiding. It took some adjustment then, whiling away the days fishing and swimming, snorkeling and boating around the islands on pleasure cruises with the local women, feasting on some of the best seafood he could have imagined. Sometimes the contingent on Perlin brought in Seychellois women to help them pass away the lonely nights in orgies he would have deemed sinful to the extreme back in Iran. All the creature comforts and then some in the large beach house, including fully stocked bar and refrigerator, satellite televisions, videos, computers, and high-tech necessities for contact with the other fighters in the global jihad. So he had decided, why worry? Life right now was one big party. He was indulging in a cigarette and afternoon brandy as he watched for the tenth time an American movie about five Elvis impersonators robbing a casino in Las Vegas. It was his favorite movie, but he found it somewhat ironic that as much as he hated America and all things Western, he idolized their films. Any confusion as to how he really felt about Americans didn't last long whenever he watched the five Elvises shoot up the casino, killing anyone, Americans of course, who got in their way. He was catching a nice buzz, revved up by the violent movie. Settled in and relaxed for the first time on this island heaven, he figured he could count his blessings, far away from the stress and strife of his wholly chosen path, viewing it all as a vacation, praising their great leader for singling him out for this much-deserved R&R. He was on call, of course, and the strange orders from their leader were what had both puzzled and frightened him at first. Some will have to die so that others will live. Bear in mind, the global jihad is God's will, and it is greater than the life of any one man. However, I tell you this in private, away from the others. As one of my top and most trusted lieutenants, your life will be spared. Men will be coming for you where you are going, but they are part of the great plan. You must not be afraid. Since it has already been arranged, you will merely be captured only for a short time. Then you will be free, and you will see the full glory of Islam. I am asking you now, do you have the courage and the faith to obey me and Allah without question? What could Katani have said other than yes, their leader had spoken? The weeks had crawled by in tension and fear in the beginning, but prayer had buoyed his faith and calmed his nerves so that he could now accept whatever the future held. Island life wasn't so bad, after all. Hey, what are you doing here? Katani got out of his chair. He considered arming himself. Then he saw Hamadan through the window. Zarik, he has brought drugs. Or maybe women. Katani started moving to the door. He wasn't two steps out on the porch when he saw two, then three of his men dropping onto the trail, long fingers of scarlet jetting from their skulls. Then two more of his men flew away on the fireball. Part of his mind screamed this wasn't happening. If this was part of the great plan, it still galled Katani that he was supposed to stand by while his Muslim brothers were slain before his eyes. He'd been told he would be spared, but he wasn't taking any chances. The AK-47 was inside, a dozen long steps that would feel like an eternity the way his men were getting chopped down by some invisible invader. Katani wheeled toward the doorway. Going somewhere? Collins aimed the sound-suppressed Beretta between Katani's eyes. You are the one? I am to be captured? I am to be spared? Collins made his decision on the spot. I don't need you that bad. Wait, what do you mean? <laughs> Collins left Katani there, sprawled at his feet, a flimsy explanation forming in his head that he would give to Stone about the execution. It was damn good that he had reached Katani first. The Iranian had some idea about the future. Whatever he knew had gone to the grave with him. The moment of danger back at the suite had passed, but Collins knew he still had to string Stone along. What better way to prove the man was in no imminent threat of death at his hand than by jumping into the fight and pasting a few runners scattering in flight? Collins moved down the porch, a few wild rounds past him, slashing off a piece of wooden beam. He was lining up another Iranian beach boy when he saw Hamadan bolting down the trail. Colonel, get Hamadan! Bolin saw their prisoner in flight, scurrying back down the trail. Bolin charged up on Hamadan's rear and brought the butt of the Beretta down on the back of his head. Hamadan dropped to his knees, and Bolin began manhandling him back down the trail. As a lone extremist backpedaled down the wharf, the warrior saw Collins giving chase. 
He left Collins to take care of the final problem as he spotted the body on the porch, senses tuned to any sound from inside the large beach house. Holding Hamadan by the arm, Boland peered inside the beach compound. The only sound was the television blaring with the sounds of Hollywood gunfire. The carnage littering the grounds briefly struck Bolin as surreal as he watched the celluloid battle. It happened like that sometimes. Coming out the other side of any armed engagement was never a given. But when the adrenaline began to slow, a strange dreamlike quality could descend on the world around him. It never lasted more than a second or two, but the feeling of being temporarily drained, even numb, disoriented or disembodied was still there. Bolin went to the body of Katani, shot once between the eyes. He could find no weapon, so why the execution? This was supposed to be the big game they had come here to snare. Why just gun down an unarmed enemy who had supposedly made the Cobra capture list? Bolin couldn't wait to hear what snow job Collins would offer for this. The moment of wonder proved a mental lapse. No. The leg sweep came out of nowhere, the soldier taking the blow to the back of his knee. His leg buckled as the headbutt was craning down. Bolin whipped his face away, but he took the blow on the side of his skull. Ugh. Bills and lights shot through his brain, and Hamadan wrenched free. Bolin exploded into a charge. Three long strides, and the executioner clamped a hand into Hamadan's shoulder. He ran the Iranian another two steps down the porch, then bounced his face off a beam. Ugh. He let Hamadan drop, the Iranian rolling over, staring up with eyes blazing in hate and defiance. Go on. Kill me. If you think I am going to be some prisoner of the Americans, you are wrong. Never. I will kill you the first chance I get. Do it. You murdered the others. Kill me. Bolin felt the Beretta lift a few inches. He wasn't quite sure what was possessing him, bringing on a sudden murderous impulse. But he was tempted to shoot. It passed, as he knew it would. Being an animal was easy. It was being human that was tough. Get up. The Iranian shimmied to his feet as Collins rounded the corner. Problems, Colonel? Nothing I couldn't handle. Bolin glanced over his shoulder at Katani. Him? I decided I didn't need him that bad. Grab our boy here, Colonel. I just called in our ride. They were in the Gulf Stream, airborne from Mahe, Collins on his radio. Bolin knew something very ugly waited in the near future, and it didn't involve hunting down the enemy. He decided to hold his tongue, let Collins call the shots, and go with the flow. Collins walked up and offered a cigarette. Bolin declined it and the proffered shot of booze from the Major's silver flask. Hamadan had been handed over to what Collins called his cleanup crew on Pralin. Whatever intelligence could be found at the beach house would become the property of Collins's cleanup ops. Whatever became of the body of Gambler, well, Bolin didn't give much of a damn. It was a strange state of mind the executioner found himself in, caring but not caring, patient but impatient to reach or discover what waited at the end of the line. Warlock and Cyclops flew ahead with the prisoners. They're in charge of the interrogation. That came from up top. If there are any prisoners left to talk to by the time they get them to wherever they're going. A Greek island. That's where they'll be detained. And that's where the tribunal will eventually be held. Let me guess. The Greeks don't know anything. They know, or at least the ones who should. It was a hard sell, the way I heard it. But they finally agreed to let us in. The island, Camp Zero, is the sole property of the United States government. Black ops all the way, Colonel. This is something from beginning to end you won't see splashed all over world headlines. You look like hell, Colonel. I got some sandwiches, bottled water, and cold beer in the fridge. Why don't you eat? Grab a nap while there's time. Lebanon is up next. From here on, it doesn't get any easier. Hamid Bouri wanted peace on earth, goodwill toward all men. There was no violence in his heart toward those outside the Muslim faith, no matter how much he might disagree with them, or how much they might despise him and his faith. It wasn't even part of his character to take up arms against foreigners who might desire to impose their will on the people of the Middle East. As far as he was concerned, the sins of other men were theirs to own before the judgment of God when they left the world. Live and let live, he believed. If only that were true. He still had to live in Lebanon. And no man, peacemaker or warrior, he thought, was ever allowed the luxury of choosing not to choose. He prayed five times daily without fail for a paradise on earth, free of violence and hatred and war. 
even though he knew it was little more than a dream. Considering the darker side of human nature, he feared the future of mankind was bleak at best, dire at worst. His own country was still a seething cauldron of violence and ancient hatreds and religious intolerance, surrounded by other nations that could well push the entire region beyond critical mass. With what was coming this night, he had to ask God one last time for help and guidance, to watch over, protect, and ensure the safety of his own corner of the world. He was a family man, after all, with a wife and four children, whose futures and safety he had to consider. It pained him greatly that his decision might very well have put their lives in danger. To his family and neighbors he was a simple farmer, a herder of goats and sheep, and the rumors of his brief affiliation with Hamas and Hezbollah were gone with brutal men long since dead and unlamented. Those days had been merely a charade in order to survive in the Muslim quarter of Beirut, the younger Buri never firing a weapon in anger. He was grateful that his soul was still unstained by bloodshed, the taking of life. He had inherited fertile land in the Baka Valley from his father and removed himself and his family from the strife and violence of the city. The warring factions and the extremists might have laid down their weapons in Beirut, but the danger had followed him to the Baka. Lately there were more guns, more black-hooded terrorists in the countryside than he could count. With what he knew was a growing threat to the internal security of his country, the dream was losing its glowing allure. He no longer felt such a simple man with basic needs, wishing only to plow his wheat and see his children grow to have children. The fear now mounted that his country would once again fracture in civil war or feel the wrath of invading armies. He wasn't sure whether he had made the choice or if the choice had been made for him. As he crouched in a gully, searching the black skies above the snow-capped ridges of the mountains, he wished for a moment he was armed and pondered how his past had led him to this moment. Long ago he had been an information broker for Mossad and CIA agents. It was dangerous work, spying on his fellow countrymen. He had believed that by relocating to the Baka he would never have to tread those shark-infested waters again. How wrong he had been proven. Roughly three months ago he had been approached by two men in Basri, one of them with a thick Israeli accent, the other a foreigner with a hideous scar on his hand. He was to gather whatever information he could on the Arnu camp in the Baka. They seemed to know every detail about his life from birth to the present, and that had shaken him to the core. They knew he had cousins who were in Hamas and Hezbollah. They knew he valued his family more than anything in the world. They could make his life a living hell if he didn't cooperate by putting out the word that he was a Mossad informant. The lives of his family would be numbered in hours. After listening to their spiel, with its thinly veiled threats and its harsh demands, he had agreed. It wasn't so much out of fear as from a growing sense of urgency that his country had to be cleansed of extremists. So they gave him a small laptop with secured email, along with the promise of a cash reward if his services proved useful to them. They had also given him a homing beacon, a GPS module, and a night vision scope to spy on the camp at night. He was to report in and check his messages daily, await further orders. He was to monitor the countryside and assess the number of terrorists, using his own canvas-covered truck to track the invaders. He already knew about the sprawling Arnu camp to the northeast, but the cave and the foothills of the mountains at the southern edge of the valley had been a recent discovery. He had been ordered to monitor the comings and goings of the extremists in that cave. He had counted no more than five at any one time. He had no idea how deep the cave went or what was inside, but an email had come back only last night telling him not to worry about it. They knew. That last cryptic message had told him tonight was the night. He was to hunker down approximately a mile south of the cave, three hundred feet up the slope of the foothills, and wait. So there he was, alone and shivering in the dark in his sheepskin coat, waiting on a group of foreign commandos, risking his entire world. It was a given these night invaders were coming to kill the terrorists. He was ashamed for a moment by the sudden flash of violent desire in his heart, a hope they left no one in the cave or the camp alive. He checked the homing beacon clipped to his belt. The light was flashing red, telling him it was online. 
The gnawing fear now was that he would be discovered before the commandos arrived, that he perhaps was even being stalked right then by the extremists in the cave. He checked the foothills again, alert for shadows, wondering how the invaders would come to him. With all the checkpoints and Syrian military outposts, he couldn't picture them just driving in, not unless they numbered in the hundreds and came in tanks. No, he'd been told they needed a vehicle. The sky, then. He was looking up, peering at the scudding clouds, when he felt the muzzle of a weapon jammed into the back of his skull. <gasps> You'd better be Hamid. Welcome to my humble country. That'll work. You understand what will happen to you if you don't play it straight with us? Perfectly. Hamid turned and faced the big commando. His face, neck, and hands were covered in black war paint. There was a massive assault rifle in his hands with an attached rocket launcher. The invader weighted down with spare clips, grenades, and a sidearm. The eyes peered through the dark, and Bori felt the freeze ripple through him. Bori knew he had nothing to hide, but he couldn't help but wonder right then if he was on the side of the angels, or if these commandos would prove themselves devils in human skin, march him to his own death. God be with me. The recruitment, grooming, and handling of unsavory characters on the other side was how covert ops succeeded in thrashing the enemy inside their borders. They could be gunrunners, drug mules, even terrorists who wanted out or were looking to turn a quick buck. They were betraying their own, untrustworthy until they proved themselves. Bola knew it was the way of the black ops world, gaining information on the enemy by using the enemy. And there was no point in standing around debating if Hamid could be trusted or was steering them into an ambush. They were on the ground and moving. The executioner had touched down at the end of the halo first, using his GPS and homing beacon tuned in to the informant's transponder. He had reached Buri first, landing roughly 2,000 yards south of the man, silently padding down the slope, using cedar trees for momentary cover and surveillance of his surroundings while on the advance. It ground up critical time, 32 minutes before the Cobra commandos were gathered, Hamid grilled again, and they were off and stalking through the night. It was 0334 by the time Bolin, leading Gator and Wallbanger down the rocky slope, reached the ledge over the cave's entrance. He signaled his teammates to pull up as the sentry suddenly stepped into view, working on a smoke. Bolin assessed the entire play, liking and trusting it even less after the near-fatal encounter in Seychelles. Again, it was the major show, Collins detailing the strike since the moment they were wheels up in Kenya. Their latest mobile base was near the Israeli-Lebanese border. The commanding officer, Colonel David Ben Yehudin, greeted Cobra Force with less than a warm reception. Apparently, the IDF and Mossad had their orders from up top, though, and the Israelis were on standby, ready to unload an airstrike on the Arnu camp, paving the way for a Cobra ground assault. It was Boland's task to take down the cave and occupants and destroy whatever arms cache was buried inside. According to both Collins and Yehudin, the Syrian army was using heavy machinery to dig out caves and tunnels in the mountains. Whether they were storing weapons and explosives or preparing to dig in and ride out some massive air assault, no one could be sure. A potential suicide bomber, though, had been snatched up in Jerusalem weeks before. He had been cooperating with both Mossad and American intelligence agents working in the shadows of the Cobra campaign, handing over information about the camp and the cave. Supposedly, the tunnel ran some 200 feet straight ahead into the foothills and veered left, a reverse L. Another 30 feet down, and militants, no more than six, were posted to guard a massive cache of assault rifles, grenades, and explosives. Bolin was watching his own 12 and 6 again, it struck him as curious that Collins had pasted two non-serpent commandos to his hip, the soldier again disturbed by the feeling he wasn't meant to make it out of the country, that the three of them were sacrificial lambs. Penetrating caves for an armed engagement was no easy chore to start with. Any number of dangers, booby traps, landmines, and so forth, could rear up, with nooks and crannies concealing the enemy. The would-be bomber swore the cave wasn't rigged with mines or sensors and tripwires. According to Collins, it was a straight shot to the depot. Collins wanted the roof brought down on the cave, and Wallbanger lugged the C-4 and incendiary packages for the blast-and-burn job. Boland didn't have a problem with that. The less destructive capability the enemy had, the better. Still, gut instinct said there was a bullseye painted on his back. First, he was peeled off from the bulk of the force moving in on the camp. 
Then, when they sealed the cave here, they would be forced to drive in on the camp, commandeering the land cruiser parked in front of the cave. They were supposed to link up with the others while the bombs fell and Collins was off and running. The air show should wipe out most of the militants at Arnu. Close to 200 extremists were up for the doomsday touch. The standing order from Collins was to burn down every armed extremist. No prisoners unless they threw their hands up and made the job that much easier. Alone again, feeling it deep in his gut, the executioner laid down his M16 M203 combo. Drawing himself onto a knee, he pulled the sound-suppressed Beretta 93R. He pointed at the sentry, who flicked the cigarette away, then unzipped to relieve himself. The whirl of a hand, the arranged tornado signal, and they knew it was a go after the sentry was taken out. The executioner acquired his target. Don't talk. Hamid Buri looked over at the black-clad, war-painted commando, not liking what he saw or heard in the least. He felt his gut clench and his heart sink, fear gripping him as he stared into eyes that held no life. He knew it was over, and he cried inside, aware he would never see his family again. There was something about this man he couldn't trust. It was as if he were looking at a sack of flesh with no soul, unlike the other commando, who seemed to have something else beyond the war face, something far greater and far more noble burning deep inside. Hamid Buri knew he was looking at his own death beside him. The one time this commando in the passenger seat had looked at him, or through him, Buri felt a chill walk down his spine, a whisper of doom insisting that he was expendable. This commando had a cold voice and the dead eyes of a serpent, looked and spoke to him as if he were so much garbage to be crumpled up and tossed aside when he was no longer useful. Buri had seen and been around enough cold-blooded killers to know when he was in the presence of evil. Lights off on the van, Buri was winding them ahead through the wadi, cedars dotting the lunar landscape up the slopes, the night illuminated in a ghostly green hue through his NVD goggles. Three of the invaders had been left behind to penetrate the cave, do whatever they were going to do, while he provided taxi service for the rest. Four of the commandos were in the truck, with four more heavily armed shadows lurching in his rear and side mirrors as they trailed, scouring the ridgelines for any threat. He had been ordered to maintain a steady ten miles per hour, the near-invisible rear guard running along, falling farther behind but keeping a pace that told him they were in top physical condition. Don't look at me. Watch where you're going. I won't tell you again. Something in the voice said it all. Silently, Buri began to pray. Park it. Kill the engine. Buri did as he was told. The Serpent Commando motioned for the others to go. They were out, melting into the night, charging the hill that would take them to the camp. Buri stripped off his night vision goggles, laid them down between the seats. He was sick for a second, painfully aware that he had not sided with the angels. There was evil alive and walking in the Baka. Perhaps the invaders had come here to erase an abomination that was simply on earth to cause grief and misery. Perhaps it took some form of evil to defeat a greater evil. Perhaps God, in his infinite wisdom, didn't need to explain his plan to a simple farmer. He didn't see the Serpent Commando do it. He just sensed instead the pistol coming out, a sound suppressor being attached. Buri could have fought the Serpent Commando, lunging over and grabbing the gun. But even if he killed him, there were other men with automatic weapons who would turn back and kill him. Buri shut his eyes, a smile tight on his mouth. It was over, but someday he would see his family in heaven. May God have mercy on your soul. What? May peace and mercy be unto those who seek it. <laughs> you know, if God cared so much, the world wouldn't be such a fucked up place. Buri turned his head toward the serpent as the commando lifted the pistol. Appreciate the lift. Bolin had barely leaped off the ledge and landed, flanked by Wallbanger and Gator after getting the all-clear hand signal from the Cobra commandos, when he sensed how wrong it all felt. Sure, they were painted in red, five stationary targets in all at the deepest end of the reverse L on his heat motion sensor, but one look down the narrow cave and his gut told him it was about to go to hell. No question the enemy had the advantage in this situation, and what was to say they likewise didn't have heat and motion sensors at their disposal. Damn, 
Bolin would be the first to admit he hated armed engagements in a cave, turf the enemy had created with every advantage on their side. Nothing he could do about it now. A flamethrower would be nice, or better still, one of those warbirds at the good major's beck and call, simply cleansing the cave with a well-placed laser-guided bunker buster. So much for wishful thinking. Bolin motioned for Gator to guard the entrance, Wallbanger to lag behind during their penetration. Each ventured step was going to prove beyond hazardous, Bolin's gaze flickering from the heat monitor to the floor and walls in search of tripwires and other booby traps. It occurred to the warrior that if Collins did in fact want him out of the way, he just might get his wish. The hole was just large enough for the soldier to slip inside, a single naked bulb midway down providing just enough light to steer his advance. Wallbanger wasn't listening. Bolin motioned for the commando to keep his distance. The executioner wasn't looking to take a bullet for the home team on a reckless whim, but if it went south, he could tell Collins, assuming he walked out, that he'd taken point, done his damnedest to keep his men out of harm's way. Bolin scanned the rocky floor and the breaks in the wall for wires and concealed explosives. The assault rifle was out, one-handed, Bolin maybe fifty paces from the bend when he saw the flurry of movement on his screen. A heartbeat later, he saw the mirror mounted on the wall where the cave cut back in its reverse L. More often than not, low-tech could beat high. Fall back! It was pure luck, but Bolin spotted and flung himself into a narrow crevice slashed down the wall. A swarm of projectiles screamed past the executioner in sense-shattering ricochets, the deafening roar of autofire swelling his brain. Bolin crouched, saw Wallbanger falling, blood spurting from his chest and forehead. There was no choice but to brave the storm if he was going to turn the tide. He was swinging around the edge of the crack when he found one of the two shooters arming a grenade. A lightning shift in aim and Bolin stitched him up the chest, flinging him back in a 180 jig, the grenade rolling up beside the falling body. Stretched out in a prone position, Collins surveyed the massive compound, his troops fanned out on their bellies. They were spread out on the lip of a wadi, a quarter mile due south of the terror camp. Cyclone fence encircled an area that was roughly three city blocks. It was electrified, but it would be cut with rubber-handled hydraulic shears. Guard towers on four points of the compass, watching the valley, the perimeter swaddled in areas by cedar. One look, and he knew the fighter jockeys would have to get it right the first time. Four massive concrete buildings, the sat dishes marking the C&C structure to the west. Figure the other buildings were barracks, training centers, classrooms, over a hundred terrorists to tackle. Then there were machine gun nests, two tracked ZSU 23-4s that would have to go first, enough APCs and land cruisers to fill a giant parking lot. All they had to do was to wait for the compound to start going up in flames. One F-117 Stealth, four F-15Es, two Apaches, and his trusty Spectre were on the way. It was a combo American-Israeli squad of fighter pilots, but there was no mistake in his mind, they were the best of the best. The Israelis wanted this camp erased off the map, nothing left but a smoking memory, as badly as the Americans. A fearsome piece of intelligence had reached Collins about this batch of terrorists. According to the late gambler, there were detailed papers about their mission, or rather, the darker aspects of what would soon go down. If those fell into the wrong hands, he was faced with major problems, his own plans all but scrapped. That wouldn't happen if he had anything to say about it. That was the reason he had dispatched Stone to take down the cave. Of course, it was part of the mission, but wiping out a nest of fanatics hunkered down in a cave was no easy task, and the enemy might get Stone out of the way for him. The face of Amir Habikin, the camp commander, was framed in Collins's memory. He needed the Syrian bastard talking. There were to be no other survivors unless they were out of the deeper circle of the enemy intelligence loop and threw their hands up, begging for mercy. He was tempted to check the black skies, but looked at the illuminated dial of his chronometer. He would hear the explosions before he even saw the payloads on the way. Suddenly there was thunder and lightning rocking the world out of nowhere, the sky falling on the compound with a laser-guided barrage. The night was on fire, one rolling, blazing wave after another, buildings blown to smithereens, but it wouldn't get any easier once they were inside the fence. Bolin had ridden out the grenade blast, hugging cover. 
Now he charged into the boiling smoke, sweeping the cloud with spray and pray auto fire. A glance at his screen painting more terrorists at the deep end of the reverse L, but coming toward him. Arming a frag grenade, Bolin let it fly in a side-armed pitch. <clears throat> he was aiming for a ricochet, and he watched it carom off the far wall. The noise of the explosion, trapped in the tight confines of the cave, split his skull, but he was moving hard and fast to mop it up. Crouched, he hit the edge and wheeled around the corner, holding down the trigger. Two terrorists were reeling about, trying to bring their stuttering assault rifles back online, but Bolin nailed them left to right. Bolin looked at the stacks of crates, and as he walked around the cave, he took care to make sure that all the bodies were in fact dead. Bolin whirled, barely catching the scuffling through the ringing in his ears. Gator materialized out of the smoke cloud. He ignored the angry look on Gator's face, aware the commando was jacked up over the loss of his teammate, searching for a quick release for his pent-up aggression. The executioner brushed past him, moved on to finish his task. Stooping over Wallbanger, he checked for a pulse, but already knew the commando was dead. What the fuck happened, Colonel? You saw it. What am I? We gonna tell the Major. But he's lucky he didn't lose all three of us. Bolin plucked the incendiary package off Wallbanger. Get him out of here and fire up that land cruiser. Move it! <laughs> there was some angry hesitation from Gator, but Bolin checked the tongue lashing as the commando scooped up Wallbanger into a fireman's carry. Bolin put him out of his mind, then trekked back to ignite the fuse that would bring the roof down on this rat's nest. Five more bad guys down, one less weapons cache for terrorists to slaughter the innocent with. Whatever else had happened here, Bolin figured it was a decent coup, all things considered. The written standing orders had been delivered by fellow Syrian cutouts one week ago from their Iranian sponsor. It was so incredible that Amir Habikin had dismissed it as lunacy. Seven long days later, he was still left wondering if the vaunted leader of the global jihad was either insane or was in league with the devil. He was sitting at his desk, perusing the aspects of the proposed plan, wondering once more where the truth ended and the treachery might begin. The more he read and pondered the standing orders, the more curious and anxious he became. Incredible as it sounded, the global jihad leader appeared to have cut some deal with infidels to capture what was more or less a who's who list of well-known freedom fighters. From Somalia to Lebanon to the Gaza Strip, many of the best, the brightest, and the toughest of holy warriors were to allow themselves to be taken prisoner by some faceless, nameless force of Western commandos. That was only the start, however. The insanity got worse. It was so written that a select group would be captured alive, while scores of other holy warriors were to virtually commit suicide in the face of overwhelming force. Personally, he had no desire to end up like so many of his fellow Muslims now imprisoned in Cuba, much less slain by hated enemies he was sworn to kill. The plan didn't end with detainment, but Habikin had no intention of carrying out the orders. It was time, perhaps, to cut the umbilical cord to Iran. What he was being asked to do was madness, pure and simple. There were operations already on the table, and they took absolute and supreme precedence. It had taken too much time, toil, sweat, and money to prepare the infiltration of his freedom fighters into Israel, Western Europe, the United States. Years of preparation had gone into a jihad that would shake the entire world, carve his very name in stone forever as the most holy and fearsome warrior. In twos and threes, his own warriors were slated to go within days, bogus passports stamped with Western names allowing them to slip into the targeted countries. Too much money and training was involved to see it all wasted at the last moment. Holy human time bombs were destined to erupt all over the streets of America, Israel, and Western Europe at the appointed hour. He could see it in his mind, dozens of glorious moments of victory forever seared in the annals of Muslim history. They would stroll into shopping malls, restaurants, and movie theaters. They would stand in lines at banks and post offices, carry briefcases, or wrap themselves up with explosives, bring down entire courthouses. They would walk down crowded streets and take out hundreds of infidels in the blink of an eye. They would slip luggage stuffed with explosives into buses, trains, and jetliners. They would be mass death at the same instant. 
There would be horror and chaos, wailing and gnashing of teeth. Entire transportation systems, rail, bus, plane, highway, would screech to a halt, everything jammed, swimming in blood and terror. There would be no hope, no way out for the enemy, no chance of ever restoring order. Their so-called civilization, as they knew it, would be over, gone to hell where it belonged. The infidels would slaughter and consume one another in panic, riots, looting, and murder in the streets. It was a beautiful vision. And he wasn't about to see it all perish because some wild scheme was dropped in his lap by a questionable ally with an insane agenda. They were entire waves of martyrs, loaded down with explosives, willing to light themselves up in the targeted lands on his word. Key cells were already in place. The date, in fact, was already set, but it would take time to get the other martyr cells situated, final logistics ironed out. Now this madness, or foolishness, stared him in the face. The more Habikin thought about the Iranian, the more he began to believe that the sponsor was perhaps setting him up as a pawn in his mad scheme— Perhaps he was viewed now as expendable, the Iranian wishing him out of the way, wanting all operations and all the glory for himself. With that in mind, it was best if he began covering all of his bases. He was protected by the Syrian army in the Baqa, and he was thinking he should take this crazy scheme directly to General Saladin, get his thoughts, and gauge his reaction. If they were on the same page, then the Iranian had to be cut loose. He was safe enough inside the borders of Lebanon, even against Muslim assassins who might seek to impale his head on a stake if the Iranian felt snubbed. Enough. Habikin rose, gathering the report, shutting it inside his briefcase. One last sip of whiskey, and he was marching for the door, toting the plan. He was in the hall that led to the radar and communication stations, searching for a subordinate to drive him to Saladin's command post when he stopped in his tracks, shaking his head. It was strange, this frozen moment, in which he knew what that sound of thunder was. The enemy had arrived. The dream was over. Amir Habikin wanted to scream in outrage, but there was a blinding supernova in his eyes, and the entire facade of the CNC building was blown through the hallway in a tidal wave of fire and smoke. Ah! Then he was airborne, sailing through blackness and silence. The fireball roiled up out of the compound. Bolin winced at the flash of light, but his mind was on the next battlefield. He was under no grand illusions about their effort to strike back at terrorism. The new war had shifted tactics, going preemptive in world headlines, but it was still the same never-ending battle for the executioner. No matter how many they took out, it was a monumental task to expect even the most skilled and determined force to rid the planet of what the administration tagged as evildoers. There would always be more terrorists when the sun rose the following day. It never stops. Bolin focused on the grim chore at hand, scouring the darkness as the headlights stabbed into the night. Wild card to Cobra leader. Do you read me? I'm a little busy right now. What? We're en route. ETA five minutes. Your cave's been taken care of. Five bad guys and cash burned and buried. Roger that. Good work. Do you have a second to see us painted on your monitor? I'd hate to get waxed by mistake this late in the game. Yeah, but how come I'm only reading two of you? Wallbanger didn't make it. Fuck. You know where to shake and bake. So get your asses here and give us a hand. Out. Bolin knew the battle strategy, but that didn't mean Collins or the Gods of Thunder would stick to the plan. Friendly fire sometimes didn't distinguish between friend or foe. Moments later, Bolin saw the van pop up in the headlights. A figure was slumped in the driver's seat. Pull it over a second. Gator started to bare his teeth, but he focused on the body in the van. Their Lebanese contact had taken one between the eyes. Any thoughts why your boss 86 to him? Gator shrugged. None leaked to mind, Colonel. Maybe the Major knew something about him we didn't. Why does that bother me? You'll have to ask the Major. Move it out. We'll bail at the bottom of the slope. What about Wallbanger? He's not going anywhere. We'll come back and get him later. The executioner was out the door and advancing up the hill, the din of massive explosions swelling the air, urging him on and into the fire. Thunder God, red, white, and blue to Cobra Leader. Let me know something if you'd be so kind. Collins was in and running, angling for the smoking rubble of what was left of the CNC Center when his Apache ace patched through. Thunder God RWB was on the way to help mop up and cover their asses in the wake of the Spectre's brutal touch. 
but Collins was a little too preoccupied at the moment to check in for confirmation. M-16 flaming and dropping two terrorists at 12 o'clock, Collins pulled up behind the overturned wreckage of a land cruiser, flames dancing near his face. <coughs> <coughs> the compound was an inferno, firestorms spiraling in some bizarre tornado twist from fuel and munitions depots. The heat so intense it wanted to suck the air out of his lungs, bitter smoke stinging his eyes, bringing on the tears. There were still plenty of armed problems to take care of, despite the aerial pummeling. Twenty to thirty strong by his reckoning, scattered and scurrying about. F-15Es, the black and near-invisible flat arrowhead that was the stealth, were still swarming the skies overhead, screens sure to be turned into any MiGs brazen or stupid enough to take to the skies. Collins was taking Python and Diamond back on the hunt for Habikin's intel. It would be a miracle if he found it. If anyone after this night bothered to dig through all that rubble and found it, they could have it. Whether or not he found the package, the game plan just got bumped up. There were pressing calls to make, time frames to alter, accounts to verify. But first, he had to survive the night. Go, Thunder God. I've got you painted. One minute and counting before we're on the spot. Still lots of problems for you to take care of, Thunder God. We're in a pinch. Colin spotted a ZSU still intact, muzzle flashes stabbing the night from the east and north towers. The bulk of crazed wounded appearing to scrape themselves off the ground or materializing out of wreckage and smoke to his deep three. Get my Blackhawk in the area. Ten minutes and counting to pick us up. Collins broke for the mountains of rubble. Three terrorists, the ones Collins thought of as wearing checkered underwear wrapped around their heads, poked through a break in the rubble. Collins was climbing the rubble next, peering into the smoke, sparks and electricity snapping from several small fires touched off by the aerial bombardment. When he spotted the battered terrorist, sliding down the hill of rubble, he thrust the muzzle of his M16 into a bloody mask of hatred. A beacon! You see him? The terrorist smiled, jerked a nod over his shoulder. Good luck. The strong make their own luck. <laughs> the executioner saw that the overwhelming force of air firepower had leveled another opponent. Still, the warrior knew no enemy was ever entirely obliterated by saturation bombing alone. It took trained and determined professional soldiers to wade in on foot and smoke the last rat out of its nest. Whatever he might think or suspect about Collins and Cobra, they weren't lacking in martial skill and guts. It took five minutes plus to find the hole in the fence, and by the time Bolin led Gator onto the slaughter ground, he could tell it was winding down. The enormity of the thrashing he found before him told him two things. One, the scope of this operation, so classified and so buried even from the cyber team at Stony Man Farm, was well beyond anything he'd been briefed on. Two, no punches were being pulled. Damn any political backlash or UN harangue, sovereign nations harboring terror armies were not even on short notice. This mission gave new meaning to preemptive strike. The soldier took in the death spasms of the battle, spotting Cobra commandos concealed behind strewed rubble and wreckage on a north by northeast line and staggered fire points, busy hosing down the shattered terror remnants. Whatever they didn't nail with sustained auto fire and rocket propelled grenades, the Apache gunship took care of. Hellfire missiles peppered the ruins, the warbird blazing away with the grim works. The 30mm cannon was pounding the standing guard towers to shredded matchsticks, dismembering a ZSU with a batch of vehicles in the process. It was a dangerous moment nonetheless, as Bolin moved up on their rear, Gator on his right flank. He keyed his comlink. Hold your fire to your six. Still, he braced himself for impulsive reaction. Tsunami whirled in his direction, eyes ablaze with adrenaline. Two other Cobra commandos were swinging M-16s their way. Hold on! It's Wildcard and Gator! Where the fuck is Wallbanger? Bolin simply shook his head. Holiday swung his multi-round launcher toward the rear of his wreckage concealment and popped off another missile toward a pack of shooters firing away behind a land cruiser. There were a few staggering targets left, Bolin hunkering at the demolished nose of a Hummer beside Tsunami. The Executioner joined the others in a long sweep of auto-fire, dropping whatever shadows boiled up or reeled in the smoke. Where's the Major? The Executioner noticed Python and Diamondback were missing and tracked Tsunami's scowl toward at least a city block's worth of rubble. Interesting, the three of them were AWOL from this melee. Combing the demolished building for live ones, or was it something else? 
the executioner decided to investigate. He was up and moving, rolling in a 360, scanning for hostiles. The miracle happened. If Collins was a believer in God, he would have clasped his hands and given thanks for this moment. He was far from saved regardless, but he tugged the briefcase out from between two concrete slabs where it had wedged. <laughs> the strong really do make their own luck. Only the weak and the foolish, the poor and the desperate believed in the mythical nonsense of an almighty supreme being. The strong survived. They won. They created their own destiny, and they did indeed inherit the earth. With his commando dagger, Collins pried the clasps open, threw back the lid. Rifling through the top sheaf of papers, right away, he knew what he was looking at. He was spared for now. Keep your eyes peeled. No one comes in. No one. Our little problem solved, Major. For the moment. And believe me, this isn't little. Collins couldn't believe what he read, his heart thundering in his ears. There were eleven pages clipped together, laying out the job beyond the mission. The great Ayatollah had detailed for Habik in the finer points, weaving in the usual Islamic line about keeping the faith, obedience to Allah's will, and so forth. Bastard had named names down the line on both sides, ran through each leg of the mission, spelled out bottom line what the hell it was really all about from beginning to end. Unfucking believable. There were calls to make, find out if any nervous types were abandoning ship. He didn't think so, since it had come this far. The plug would have been pulled by now if cold feet were shuffling off in the other direction. He had to believe this was simply some insurance policy in case their own side didn't come through. And that made sense as far as the twisted thinking of fanatic Muslims went. Rotten son of a... The other stack of papers he discovered was an operational manual. Keep that, play the big shot who had saved the day for the Western world. One fast but hard perusal, both anxiety and relief propelling him into speed reading mode, and he knew he was looking at routes, times, operatives, strategy, the whole logistical ball of wax for a coming massive jihad. All of it was enciphered, of course, but this particular mathematic code had long since been broken, passed on, and learned by himself and a few of his own people. Some of what he read jibed with what he'd learned about the great Ayatollah's own vision of holy war. Only materiel, a little nastier than C4 and dynamite, would be used. Collins was putting the torch to the evidence when he heard Stone patch through. It's Stone. I'm on my way inside. This fucking guy again. It was all Collins could do to stay calm and respond. Glad you could make it, Colonel Stone. Collins set the rest of the evidence on fire, a few pages at a time to be sure he got them all, then stowed the lighter. Then he slammed the briefcase shut, began to retrace the tortuous path back through the maze of debris. He tried to will the trembling out of his hands. We're coming out, Colonel! Hold your ground! It was Python doing the shouting again, the tone edged up and harried, striking Bolin as if he were being warned to sit tight. Something smelled, and it wasn't the stink of death in the air. Bolin spotted the Blackhawk touching down for evac to the south edge, inside the fencing. Cobra Commandos were now shuffling in a backpedal formation toward the dust storm, preparing to board, weapons fixed and sweeping the ruins for hostiles. Bolin watched as Python and Diamondback reared up over the rubble. They came down the hill, their saws aimed in opposite directions. There was something different in their eyes, but Bolin wasn't sure if he read relief or concern. Major says to hop aboard! We're out of here, Colonel! Company's on the way! Python didn't look at Bolin as the two Commandos passed by the soldier. Standing his ground, Bolin saw Collins pop into view. The assault rifle slung around his shoulder. The Cobra leader worked his way down the rubble in a clumsy descent. The briefcase stoked the soldier's curiosity, the Major glancing his way while he barked into his comm link. Another intel gift from heaven had mysteriously dropped out of the sky and into his lap. Hit him hard! Yeah, yeah, the same run you did here, all of you. I lift off, I want to see the bastard blown clear out into the Mediterranean. When it's done, peel off and cover my Blackhawk. Do it. Out. Problems? Collins pulled up beside Bola. Only an armored Syrian convoy on the way. General Saladin? Yeah. Guess all the noise shook him out of his wet dream. Your races have enough juice left? Four T-72s, two APCs, three Hummers, and a couple of raggedy-ass open troop transports. You might as well bend over and ask how deep. What did you turn up? Bola nodded at the briefcase. Collins smiled. The holy grail of Gia. The holy grail, huh? For some reason, Major, you don't strike me as the religious type. An expression. 
Is that okay with you? By the way, what happened to Wallbanger? Bolin gave Collins the short and bitter. You took point, huh? Kid wouldn't fall back? If you don't believe my version, ask Gator. I just gave you chapter and verse. I didn't say that, Colonel. Where's his body? Down in the Wadi, right where your team failed. Collins hesitated, then scowled back at Bolin. What's with the tone? Oh, I get it. You saw my goodbye kiss to our Lebanese contact. What? You want an explanation? Bolin shrugged. He was dirty. It come to my attention, Colonel Stone, that he was playing both sides. He had assassinated two CIA operatives in Beirut recently, and my orders were to use him like a Kleenex and throw him away. Yeah, if that's news to you, I can't help it. Anything else troubling you? I'll let you know. The executioner stood near the starboard M60 gunner, glimpsed Collins shaking free a cigarette, lighting up as Gator lumbered aboard with Wallbanger draped over his shoulder. Get us out of here, Ace! Bolin emptied his mind of all thought, grateful, if nothing else, for a moment of rest, despite the roaring of the aerial bombardment, the reminder that still more bad men were dying. They were up, nose down, and soaring south for Lion Base. The Holocaust consuming the Syrian patrol was a shimmering veil in the corner of Bolin's eye. He watched as Collins admired the view, puffing, a strange, relaxed smile freezing his expression. The soldier looked away from Collins, ran a gaze over the others. They were either smoking, staring straight ahead, or slumped back with eyes shut, all of them chewing on their own thoughts. Natural and understandable. They were all warriors, and would go the distance in battle, but only the reckless fool or the suicidal really wished to die. Even the savage clung to life. The air was solemn just the same, another of their teammates going home in a rubber bag. The wind whipping through the cabin did little to wipe away the heavy fumes of sweat and cordite and smoke residue pasting their skin and black suits. What's in that briefcase, Colonel, has more than likely just preempted a full-scale jihad from Tel Aviv clear to the U.S. West Coast. I'm not sure if we got lucky or... You say you think I'm not a religious man. But I'm thinking, if there is a god, he was on our side tonight. You wouldn't mind if I took a look? When we hit Camp Zero, you can plow through it all you want. It's gonna be at least two to three days of debriefing by the head shed. SOP. Interrogations of prisoners, that kind of thing. Unless you're in a hurry to get back to the States. No rush. When this is wrapped, I'll take you up on your offer. When we get there, Major, who gets to play Torquemada of the Grand Inquisition? Collins lost a smile, and Boland felt the man measuring him, something savage again lurking behind the eyes. You're a funny guy, Stone. And you know what? Sort of grown up. <laughs> I was thinking of Mo Larry and Curly. Mo, as you call him, is gone, as you know. I'll keep the other two under control, trust me. What happened on the Herc? An aberration. Exactly. Get some rest, Stone, if you can. One more stop to lend our Israeli friends a helping hand with their Palestinian headache. Hell, it's fourth and goal on the one-yard line. Another touchdown, we're in the wind. Bolin turned away and stared into the passing black heart of night. The compound intifada, they might as well hang out a shingle. Terrorists are us. Oh, gentlemen, I can tell you now... I'm gonna leave the promised land a little more hope than it had before. They were in the war room at Lion Base. Bolin and the Cobra Major had done a brief tour with Colonel Yehudin, both given pass and magnetic swipe cards, but granted access only to the main and second levels. They were now one floor below main, one of several nerve centers, the operation here reminding Bolin of the farm, but on a much larger scale. Similar in terms of computer banks, radar and tracking stations, digital wall maps, and video screens. He was certain there was much more than the eye could see. The narrow elevator door with keypad in the far corner told Bolin there was at least one more level below ground, a combination bunker and command and control center. At one time, Stony Man Farms' former tactician, both a former colonel in the Israeli army and intelligence operative, had told him there were seven such fortress command centers housed at strategic intervals around the country. If the small nation came under siege by ballistic missiles packed with chem, bio, or nuclear capability, the military, intelligence, and political elite could live in what were small cities far beneath the Earth's surface with enough provisions for six months, twelve if rationed. 
There were also silos with nuclear missiles in each of these compounds. Enough thermonuclear megatonnage on tap to vaporize the entire Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia. That, unfortunately, included hanging a radioactive cloud over the promised land if the megaton arrows began flying. When choppered into Lion Base, Bolin had seen that unlike the farm, the Israelis didn't bother to conceal SAMs. Entire batteries of missiles were in full view, machine gun nests choking a perimeter sealed off by electrified 20-foot-high fencing. All told, there was enough on hand to hold back and counter-pummel whatever wanted to strike the compound. Shaved, showered, fed, and with a 30-minute combat nap behind him, Bolin and the other Cobra commandos, together with a squad of Israeli shooters, were gathered at the long table in the briefing room. Collins and the short, stocky, bald Colonel Yehudin shared the head of the table, both of them having clicked through a series of mug shots of the bad guys in question and their compound intifada. The initial brief was forty minutes underway, coffee all around, Collins chain-smoking up a storm. Blueprints of the CIQ had been thoroughly detailed on the wall screen, the strike plan laid out. On the surface, it looked and sounded solid to Bolin, but once the shooting started, it was, as usual, a roll of the dice. This time, they were going in with a squad of Israeli commandos. For the Gaza hit, Bolin and Cobra had togged themselves in the standard-issue light brown of the IDF. Same hardware as before, they would simply re-up on ammo. Bolin was perusing his intel package while Collins made his remarks. Yehudin nodded, the old warhorse striking Bolin as a soldier who knew what he was doing from first-hand hard experience. Yes, they are becoming more brazen with each mass murder they commit. Sad but true, we are a nation that might never know peace. Not even I am sure what the solution is. All I know, as a soldier and a Jew, I cannot allow my people to continue to be murdered by terrorists. We will never be safe until every last one of these criminals is exiled, imprisoned, or killed. Collins blew a thick cloud of smoke over the table. <sighs> yeah, well, that said, all I want to know, Colonel, is are my suspects inside? Like a deck of cards, Collins flipped out five 8x11 mug shots in front of Yehudin. Yehudin identified them as two Egyptians, two Syrians, one top Palestinian lieutenant, supposedly in line to replace Chairman Asshole, as Collins called him. Bolin looked at Collins, read something darker, harder, and meaner than ever in his eyes. They might be in the home stretch, but the executioner knew this strike would be no stroll through the park. Again, they were going through the front door, square up the gut on the enemy's turf. This time, however, the opposition was ready. They knew they were coming. Yehudin clicked on a shot of the compound. It was a two-story white building, scarred by bullets, a gaping hole from a 105 millimeter at the far west edge. As more shots, both ground and aerial, snapped by, Bolin counted at least six tanks, the armor having encircled the compound. Other shots displayed buildings, some completely demolished, others simply gutted empty shells from either airstrikes, 105 millimeter pounding, or both. We have had the compound under siege for four days. Electricity, water cut off, this mess splashed all over world headlines. We, the Jews defending our homeland, are the ones at fault. Pity the poor Palestinian butchers. My men have come under sniper fire from the second floor. I've lost two soldiers already. Starving them out does not appear to be a viable option. We have the UN attempting to insinuate themselves into the situation, demanding to take food, water, and medicine inside to these criminals. The usual nonsense from diplomatic paper pushers who know nothing and understand even less about the situation. These terrorists have already stated they will fight to the death, to the last murderer. We know several of them are directly responsible for the recent spate of suicide bombings, marching out young boys no older than ten to do their bloody work. We suspect they even have a bomb-making factory in the basement. Saying they might take us and them out in one big bang? It's always a possibility. Collins scowled and lit another cigarette off the end of his gnawed butt. <sighs> I've seen a few shots of the usual howling mob and stone throwers in the neighborhood. That going to be a problem? Not if we have to spray them with rubber bullets or hit them with tear gas. When we attack, I assure you, my men can and will hold them back. <laughs> I like your style, Colonel. To answer your question, Major, there are 21 terrorists in sight. My orders were to hold off on an airstrike until you arrived. At first, I must confess, I had reservations. Collins lifted an eyebrow. Really? You have changed my opinion with your work. 
The intelligence you brought to me from Lebanon will greatly help us. Perhaps we may even turn the corner against these criminals. <sighs> Glad I, uh, we could be of such invaluable assistance. Speaking of that intelligence, Colonel... I promised Colonel Stone a copy of what I gave you. It shall be done. Okay. Full frontal assault, front and back, top to bottom. Colonel Stone hits the roof. He moves down, and we pinch them in. Me and my guys... We take point, Colonel Yehudin. Since you've been so kind as to give me free reign, I'd like twelve of your best shooters at my disposal. I'm talking room sweepers, to go in behind us. Standard peel off, seal them up, room by room clearing. Frag them, go in blasting. If my targets want to come along for the ride, fine. If not, they die where they stand. If they live and we get something from them, you'll get it back. Understood. And the men you see here before you are some of my best. I'll take Tsunami and Gator with me. Just the three of you? I'd like to keep my end of it as simple as possible. Not a problem? I can live with that. Okay, how about we all meet back here at 0900 for a final brief? Gentlemen, Stone and the rest of my team are dismissed. They can grab some rest in the meantime, Colonel Yehudin. I've got some calls to make. Collins picked the aluminum briefcase off the floor, motioned for Python to follow him up the stairs. Something, Boland sensed, was eating at Collins. Had been since he re-emerged from the demolished C&C area in the Baca. The soldier was out of his chair, intel packet in hand, trailing Collins and Python up the stairs. The steel door slid open as Collins swiped his card. Hitting the hallway on the main floor, Boland saw Collins and Python picking up the pace, a sense of urgency in their strides. Calls, huh? Boland kept his distance, but watched as Collins and Python marched ahead, talking to each other in hushed tones. They veered around the corner, Bolin heading toward the quarters allotted to Cobra Force. He stopped when he saw Collins and Python moving out the door that led to the helipads. Bolin gave it a few seconds, waited until the rest of Cobra Force had moved past, then followed in the Major's wake. He was outside, squinting against the harsh sunlight when he found Collins and Python hopping up in the cabin of the Black Hawk. Collins slid shut the port, then starboard doors. If the Major had seen him watching, then Bolin figured he was being ignored. If ignored, then why? Calls, huh? Bolin felt that itch grind harder than ever between the shoulder blades. He turned and accessed himself back into the building. We've been wondering when you'd call. We may have problems. There's been a change in plans, effective immediately. You're making me shiver and shake. What's up? Warlock felt his heart lurch, spine stiffen like a piece of steel, the whole package of rock tightness forcing him to sit upright in his bolted-down metal chair. Collins sounded edged out, ready to blow a gasket, but there was an undercurrent of suspicion in the Major's tone. Warlock wondered if maybe he'd done something, the sliver of accusation not escaping, ears trained to pick up the smallest sign of deceit in the voice. He was in the comm cubicle of the Hercules, monitoring his state-of-the-art NSA prototype Dragon computer for communications from the others. Calm link on, he looked over his shoulder at Cyclops. First, what's your situation? Grounded, in Serlik. We're still waiting in the Marines. Snafu. Must have caught a right with the Navy. God damn it. How much longer? I was told their briefing should be over soon. Soon? Define soon. Warlock was feeling his nerves stretching taut, snapping back at him like frayed electric lines over this sudden intrigue. He shook loose a cigarette, Cyclops helping himself, lighting them both up. I was told roughly two to three hours before we're wheels up. That might work to our advantage. Okay, I came across a nasty little surprise. I'll bypass the particulars, but it's under control. It involved the bigger picture. It spelled it out. Our... Or rather, your boy may be hedging his bets. How so? I don't know. You tell me. Nothing to tell. Are you, Cobra, and the others still in the game? I've been in contact with the others. All systems are go. What is this? You think... I don't know what to think. But I'm booted up. So why don't you show me something? Warlock snapped his fingers at Cyclops, who was already punching in the access code on his own computer, fingers flying away. You can't explain your nasty little surprise? Not in so much fine detail. That made sense. 
No communication was ever guaranteed 100% secure, not with all the latest in microchip super technology, like the new NSA satellite that was recently put in orbit and designed specifically to intercept satlink comms and emails, and was even capable of eavesdropping on conversations inside a building. It took a good 30 seconds for the information to be relayed, then confirmed. Sweet. Looks like a party. Seychelles, here I come. You've had your look. You know it's there. I need to cut it off. So do it. Talk to me. Stick with the plan. We're almost there. Prep our pigeons at your earliest convenience. When they're locked down, uncuff them. Do not wash them. Do not have them change into uniform. Do not pass out Korans. Stall the head shed. Make excuses. Whatever. You're in charge of getting them situated. When I touch down, set your watch to two hours and ticket. This could alter... Everything, I'm aware. Speaking of that... Do you have everything on board? Yes. Everything? It's all here. Warlock glanced at the large metal bin on the floor against the bulkhead. The hair on the back of his neck, standing up as he thought about what was inside. I was thinking that when you prep the pigeons, you might want to ease them into it with the legend of King Grota and Attila. <laughs> Way ahead of you. What about Colonel Asshole? His time is short. It damn well better be. G was the only... I know how tight the three of you were. It will be handled, and I will tell you how and when. Are we clear? Got it. So then, I'll see you when I see you. Wait a second. I see a brick wall in our future. And? I'm thinking we could all bail. Just walk away, leave him stewing. He saw the numbers. There's plenty. With two of our own out of the game, the split just grew a little fatter. You sound real broken up about your buddy and ass. Just being a realist. The answer is no. Full ride. I make a commitment, I keep it. Besides, we still have something to collect. And they're holding on to two of ours as collateral. What could be worse, they could aim the guns our way, knowing what they know. If that happens, well, I don't need to be sitting on the beach jumping to the shadows of seagulls flying overhead and straining to get a hard on for my island girl because my nerves are screaming at me. You read me? Loud and clear. Later, then. Warlock stripped off the comm link, his thoughts racing with questions. Problems, nasty surprise, change in plans. It was the last thing they needed when the brass ring was right there in front of them. He knew all about loss, the usual rug getting yanked out from under him as a black op. He had risked his life for his country for years now, his eyes long since focused on retirement. As far as he was concerned, the men he worked for, and America, could go straight to hell. If glory was never in the equation, book deals, the hot seat on all the talking head shows, telling the world how much he knew, the least he could do was walk away with a fat wallet. Bottom line was he was in it for the money, and God pity any poor bastard who would deny what was rightfully his. He glanced over his shoulder at Cyclops, could tell the man was seething over a gambler getting popped by stone. Cyclops had to have been reading his thoughts. You're not thinking the Major pulled one over on us? No. I mean, we weren't there. But... I accept the Major's version. I want a piece of stone to hang on my belt. You'll get it. I'd better... Fuck it. What's that mean, fuck it? It means we're too late in the game to start sweating. Ride it out. Take it to the limit. And beyond. They can kiss our asses. We did our time. Hard time for Uncle Sam. Time for Uncle Sam to give us back a little something. Collins isn't the only one with big dreams about an island paradise. Amen. Faisal Hussein was ready to go to God. He had been, in fact, prepared to martyr himself for years, but he had been hanging on, hoping to unleash one last massive wave of martyrs before the Zionists killed him. Either way, it was time to stop marching out others in the cause, have them die and do all of God's work in his place, blowing themselves up in the discos, restaurants, marketplaces, and weddings. He needed to do his own, no small part, if for nothing else but to shore up resolve in those warriors he left behind. His death only meaningful if they continued to fight the Jews until all Zionists were dead or driven into the sea. Standing at the window on the second floor, peering through a crack in the curtain, he braced for the shelling to begin, or that massive rocket attack by helicopters that would bring the roof down. It wasn't a question of if, but when. 
four sleepless days now, and the anxiety was building all around, his men gaunt, reeking of sweat and unwashed flesh, the strain clear in red eyes that had seen virtually no sleep. With no running water, the toilets were backing up, the air foul with the fumes of body waste. The stink was the least of his concerns. Hussein watched the tanks, the hulking armored monsters parked out front, itching to cut loose with his AK-47 if one of the soldiers stepped into view. Two days ago, he'd gotten lucky, his patience rewarded as a soldier finally stepped into his gun sights. A clean headshot, no question the soldier was dead. He found himself surprised the Israelis hadn't responded with instant retaliation. They were tired, hungry, anxious. They had to be patient. The fight would come to them. A true believer accepted his lot as a test from God, no matter how hopeless the moment seemed. A warrior accepted his inevitable death as a sign he was chosen by God. There could be no other way than martyrdom. The good news was they had at least another week's worth of food and bottled water on hand, but the meats and fruit would begin to rot soon. Empty bellies, he knew, made even the hardest of fighting men crumble. But surrender wasn't an option. This was the moment he had been waiting for, full-scale battle with the hated Jew oppressors, a chance to kill as many of them as he could before he soared to paradise. His death would be remembered, hailed a victory even, his face on posters flying high and proud as they mourned him in the streets of Gaza, the West Bank. In death there would be glory. He glanced at Namir as his cousin stepped up beside him. If they storm us as you anticipate, I have prepared quite a surprise for them. They will be coming. It has been too quiet the last day. How many already? Three. One upstairs, one to the back. One in the dining room, as you order. It was a shame they only had so much Semtex and dynamite left, having used up most of what the Syrians had smuggled in the past three weeks. The way it felt, Hussein believed the Israelis would encircle the compound, commandos storming inside, shooting, hurling around grenades. He had survived one such attempt before, despising the memory of himself surrendering instead of dying imprisoned, beaten, tortured. He would erase the feeling of cowardice forever this time. He would never again see the inside of a Zionist jail. He heard the pounding of feet, voices raised in alarm. Turning, he saw one of his men running into the room. Helicopters! Soldiers! Hussein didn't hear the rest of it. The walls shook, the ground floor rattling and rolling so hard he was sure the floor would cave beneath him. They're here! Go with God! No one surrenders! The executioner had three live ones painted on his heat-seeking monitor, just inside the concrete housing of the rooftop stairwell. Bolin was the first one flying past the door gunner, finger curled around the trigger of an assault rifle, when all hell broke loose. A forty or so yard charge to penetration, and Bolin suspected what was coming next. Tsunami and Gator, brandishing saws, trailed Bolin as the fanatic burst onto the roof. He was wrapped in packets and sticks, a shuffling mummy ready to blow them off the roof with a mixed wallop of Semtex and dynamite, screaming out the familiar martyr's cry. Allah Akbar! Hit the deck! Bolin's full-bore auto-fire pounded the wannabe martyr, driving him back in an ungainly jig step. It could have been the giant sat dish or the concrete surveillance structures dotting the roof that saved Bolin and Cobra Company. Debris and smoke shot past them, the air suddenly choked with any number of foul odors. Bolin lurched up, peering into the thick clouds of smoke, the stairwell housing little more than smoking trash, when the thunder of a 105mm shell echoed from below. The roof beneath Bolin's feet shuddered, signaling to the soldier that Collins, Cobra, and the Israelis were making the bull rush inside. Stone. Bolin keyed his comm link. Yeah? I didn't like the sound of what I just heard up top. All present and accounted for, Major. I suggest we abort the mission. What? We just had a close encounter with a suicide bomber. I'm thinking there's more inside, probably waiting behind a closed door or two. There's no fighting back against that kind of play. Keep going. That's an order. I would strongly suggest bailing. Bring the house down with a good 105mm shelling or some Apaches, then see what's left standing. This is the home stretch, Colonel. Stick to the goddamn game plan. Now get your ass in gear. This is a bad idea, Collins. Hey, Stone. How about a little courage, huh? Bolin motioned for Tsunami and Gator to lag behind, ready to arm a frag grenade. I go left, you two go right. For the moment, Bolin found his screen clear of targets. Soon, he figured, that would change. There was no time to argue with Collins. He would help take down the compound, but getting too close to the enemy wasn't an option. 
this was worst case times a thousand. If a man was hell-bent on committing suicide to kill his enemy, there was little that could be done to stop him. Collins and the Israelis were going to lose a few men on this one. There was nothing to do but ride it out, hope, and yes, offer up a quick silent prayer to the gods of war. Collins was looking at body parts and slick puddles of goo when he barreled through the smoke. The 105mm shells had pulverized half of the bottom floor. The beams were hanging matchsticks, doors and walls blown to hell, a torso with legs and dripping intestines hung in a gaping maw straight ahead. In this mess, Collins knew there was no telling how many fanatics had been blasted off the planet. They had taken a direct hit right up the sphincter. What worried Collins now were those suicide bombers. He was grateful Stone had flew him in. He had figured a wicked surprise or two coming in, which was why he waited for Doc Holliday and Lion Team to take point and start kicking down doors. No sense in getting himself smoked now, not when the brass ring was hanging in his face. The choking smoke of explosives and raining plaster nearly blinding him to what was down the hall, Collins claimed the edge for temporary concealment. Sticking to the script, half of the Israeli shooters branched off in both directions to his side. A few of those commandos weighted down with enough Semtex, he figured, to take out two city blocks. The other six Israeli commandos were already announcing their presence to the north, their auto-fire and the crunch of a couple of grenades telling Collins they were making quick work of militants with some heavy-duty room sweeping. Collins glanced at the Israelis to his flanks as they pasted small globs of plastique to doors and primed the charges. When doors ahead burst open and another scent shattering barrage of auto fire erupted down the hallway, fanatics hell bent going down with the compound intifada. Collins figured, why not give the suckers what they so desperately wanted, searching for targets, when Lion Team kicked in a door. A fireball blew out into the hall, engulfing Lion Teeth and Holiday. There was no sense in checking for pulses, since they had both taken the blast right in the face, but this was part of the scheme anyway. Two more out of the way who wouldn't have to be dealt with in short order. It was hell to lose or sacrifice good fighting men like this, and he'd raise a toast to them at some point when he was sitting on a beach, sipping a cold one. He hadn't wanted this particular stint to start with, but he was under orders. To bail might have wafted a bad whiff Washington's way. He didn't plan on bagging any bad guys here, but what Colonel Stone and Yehudin didn't know wasn't his problem. Just blast, burn, and hang back while everybody else did the dirty work. Move! Move! Collins motioned to Python, Mamba, Diamondback, and Brick, throwing a few rounds into the bedlam. If only just for show, he thought. God love America. He was just about home free, and then and only then, maybe, in God he could trust. The terrorists shouting alerted Boland to their presence even before Gator looked up from his screen and flashed four fingers. Boland led the charge down the steps, choked by cordite and blood, forging ahead. The blasts fought him a few critical seconds as he whipped around the corner and spotted a fanatic sans arm. The militant was backpedaling, thick crimson spurting through the smoke and dust when the executioner waxed him with a three-round burst to the chest. According to the blueprints, six rooms on the second floor had to be cleared, including a large area for war council. Boland signaled for Gator and Tsunami to move rearward, north, and start sweeping half the rooms. Using the sensor on his handheld, Boland turned up two targets roughly 15 feet away at 10 o'clock, hunkered down and waiting to galvanize into a suicide dash. Whether they fired in blind panic or heard his approach, Boland couldn't say. The door was blasted to Swiss cheese, wood slivers slashing Boland's face. Pounding, adrenaline coursing through his veins, the soldier swung back, peering into the smoke. His screen was clear where he aimed the sensor. Boland whirled and found Gator and Tsunami hard at work, blazing away. Combat senses on full alert, Boland watched each door, glancing at the heat sensor. No red specters were framed on his screen. It was over, he could tell, at least up top. Moments later, he spotted a figure, partly buried in slabs of wall blown down by frag blasts. Nothing left of the face, but he could tell the body of a small child when he saw it. He listened to the withering auto fire from the first floor, watched the hall. It was a done deal for the compound intifada. Probably nothing left to do but clear a few more rooms. For a moment, he wanted to ponder the horrible dilemma that kept this country from ever knowing peace. How men who
who claimed to believe in God would send out children to commit suicide and murder the innocent. In the final analysis, perhaps it was enough. A few good men were around to at least fight back. Operation Stranglehold was over, at least as far as covert incursions into countries harboring terrorists went. But Bolin hardly felt satisfied with the results. Five countries, almost twice as many engagements, and all they were bringing back to Camp Zero were 24 terrorists. None of the Major's targets inside the compound were left breathing to spill intelligence. Had it been worth the effort? The answer was affirmative. Whatever they could learn from the prisoners could prove invaluable in stemming the tide of terrorism. And a few less butchers on the loose today made tomorrow a little safer. The executioner was standing out front near an M1, waiting for Collins to emerge with what was left of the latest Cobra casualties in a bag. In the distance, he made out the howling of mobs getting worked up into a frenzy. Just another day in the war-torn promised land. The sky was choked with Apaches and Blackhawks, Israeli soldiers hopping out of the bellies of several of the birds, gone to join their comrades in arms to hold back what he could be sure was a raging Palestinian mob. The soldier maintained vigilance for any snipers lurking on the rooftops or claiming shooting holes inside the windows of surrounding apartment buildings. Bolan saw Mamba and Diamondback make their way through the rubble, a body bag each draped over their shoulders. According to Collins, Colonel Yehudan had lost two of his own men. Collins followed his commandos outside, he and his comlink, the Blackhawk, coming in for pickup. Collins walked up to Bolan, teeth gnashed. We lost Lion Teeth and Doc Holliday, one of those suicide bombers. I hope this isn't where you're going to tell me I told you so. Bolan simply shook his head. I'm good, because Colonel Y isn't in the mood either, thinking I somehow fucked up. Bolan kept his expression neutral as Collins peered at him. Nothing to say, Colonel? No. Fine. I hear there are snipers in the area still, and I'd hate to get waxed now that this thing is over. And let's get out of this lousy country. We've got a ride to catch and some suspects to start grilling. Habir Dagula knew he was staring into the faces of something cold, deadly, and lifeless. The two white men were perhaps not even human, or so they at least appeared in his fear-addled state of mind. They were a malevolent presence, no question, inhuman creatures with no regard for human life. Why was his conscience pricking at him, trying to say he was just like them? No, he was different, certain they had no families to support, no allegiance to even their own. He might have taken life himself, killed scores of his own people, but it was in the hope that someday he would rule and save Somalia. He preferred the two whites with their black hoods on. Their silent, laughing eyes seemed to want to tell him something, left him wondering if the future was now. The anxiety, the same churning in his belly he had felt since first encountering them, hit deep again, nearly paralyzing him when they unchained him from the bench, beckoned him to follow. He rubbed chafed wrists and felt his bowels rumble. His bladder was swollen from endless hours of sitting in one position. Soiling himself now, he thought, would be the least of his concerns. Need to take a leak, Javi, before we start? Tagula balked, thinking one eye could actually read his mind. Relax, Dougie. Don't look so constipated. We're here to help. Sort of lay out the future for you and the others. What we call showtime. About that leak? There was an open commode in the rear, and Dagula had watched as the others had been unchained one by one, led by gunpoint to stand or squat over the stainless steel bowl. Several times one eye had undertaken the task, whereas the others flushed the waste out of the ship, the one eye ghoul left it, further fouling the air that was already vile with hanging fumes of sweat, blood, and fear. Dagula gave relieving himself brief consideration, but the hideous spectacle of one eye grinning at him in front of the others convinced him he could hold on until they landed wherever they were going. I can manage. Good. Follow me. <laughs> hey, but if you feel the urge, let me know. They passed the cubicles where a few soldiers were hunched over consoles. They were airborne once again after hours of delay on unknown ground. More soldiers with assault rifles, twenty in all, he counted, had come up the ramp, most of them now standing guard over the others. They led him deep to a dark corner, portside. 
He became uncomfortably aware they were moving him far away from any sign of life. He saw another cubicle, more computer consoles, communications equipment, a soft green light dancing off the partitioned walls. Out of the shadows, one eye slid a large footlocker across the floor, placed it in the open area in front of the cubicle. Take a seat, Dougie. This is where you get that dreaded, we need to have a talk moment. Tagula hesitated, then sat, watched as one eye slid the pistol out of his holster. His heart lurched, the sick grin staring him back but one eye set the weapon on the edge of a table. Scar settled down on a table opposite his comrade, one leg dangling. They lit cigarettes, both blowing thick streams in his face, his eyes tearing at the harsh sting. Then the clouds thinned enough where he could breathe. Scar held out his pack. Want one? One eye swiveled the seat on a bolted-down chair. Go on. Might help you relax. Tagula shook his head. One eye hit him with another cloud between the eyes, but Tagula began to feel something moving, around or beneath him, he wasn't sure. He looked at his feet. Was it the floor, he wondered? The plane shimmying up and down as it hit turbulence, rocking the bin beneath him. Was that a thud he heard inside the box? The exterminator, huh? I'm here to tell you, you ain't no Attila, Dougie. One eye scowled. Nor any King Grota. You ever hear of the Dark Ages King of the Grota clan? Called the Snake Eater? A pause, twin waves of smoke rolling over him, and for a moment the two whites vanished in the clouds. Scar glanced at one eye, frowning. <sighs> Didn't think so. Yeah, why would a charcoal-colored baboon know anything about European history? Doesn't even know about his own. How it was Arabs, the rejected offspring of Abraham, by the way, and not Europeans, who were the greatest enslavers and oppressors of blacks. Kind of ironic, don't you think, that they claim Islamic names and wrap themselves all up in Muslim Brotherhood back in America? Now the racial insults. Dagula fought to keep any expression off his face, but felt the anger now cracking through his mounting fear. Were they simply taunting him? Did they want him to erupt in a rage, give them an excuse to kill him? They smoked in silence for several moments, staring him down, shrouding themselves in clouds. It's called the secret history of the world. It's locked away in a vault deep beneath the Vatican. I know of a close personal friend, once assigned to guard the Pope after the assassination attempt. Well, I'll spare you the details, but he's seen it. It has it all, from what the Garden of Eden really was, where man and woman, excuse me, my political incorrectness, were first born. What the original sin was, meaning what Eve actually did, the entire history of the human race. Every sad or gory or proud, vainglorious or supernatural moment down through the ages to the present and future. Even spells out the exact date of the end of the world. Events leading up to... the horror. And the rapture. Scar lit another cigarette off a dying butt. What that particular event will be is a UFO. Covers the entire sky, four corners of the Earth. Blinding light show. Then poof. The Chosen vanish into the mothership. King Grota is in this book. The Dark Ages King, remember, Hobby. Listen up, this is important. What it was, Attila, King of the Huns, made several massive incursions into Eastern Europe. The original exterminator, Hobby, not a pretender like yourself. <laughs> anyway, Dougie, they swept through Poland several times, got to the border of what is now Germany with every try, then got thrashed by King Grota and his barbarian hordes. Real tough guys to a man they were. I'm talking they doled out a shellacking that was beyond epic. Picture a bunch of little arrow-winging Huns on those little ponies charging thousands of Conans, decked out in leather and fur, swords as long as you are tall. What were the numbers? The Huns always invaded with nothing short of 200,000 strong. Crota's force was one quarter that size. Amazing stuff. Kick the Hun crap out of them. Chase them nearly a thousand miles back into Russia. A river of blood the whole way. <laughs> You're talking a trail of hacked up, decapitated, amputated, castrated Huns that not even two of us can fathom or picture in our wildest wet ones. Love that guy, Grota. You want to take our food? You want to fuck our women, assholes? <laughs> You're going to have to earn it, because if I lose, I won't be around to see or feel the shame and disgrace. Nothing but big swaying balls all around. Except for the two of us here. They don't make them like that anymore. 
The gula was becoming more unnerved, but felt his anger rising over their sick nonsense. The point? Yeah, we're getting there. Jervik, the hill in Poland was called. The last try by Attila was a few weeks before he died. He gave it one last shot, give the men credit where it's due, and it was a whopper. Groda and his men charged down the hill. Same sad story for Attila. This time, Attila makes a fast exit, and Groda holds back. Figures by now Attila's seen the light. But on their way out of Poland, they leave behind a very nasty surprise. They brought cobras with them from the Far East in India. Cobras? Cobras. <laughs> it nearly changed the entire course of human history. Fifteen thousand plus serpents, carried in sacks, all the way from home sweet home. Most of them impregnated females ready to pop. Devious bastard, Attila. Dagula felt the grin nearly cut his lips, then checked it as twin scowls, forming as if on cue, stared him back through the smoke. Skeptical? Thinking it's too cold in Poland or anywhere in Europe for serpents to live? Eh, easy enough to explain. It was summer. They could manage a few more months, but that's all Attila was hoping for. By then, he figured enough of his enemies would be killed off, the countryside crawling with cobras, that he could ride back, kill whatever was left. Didn't work out that way, hobby. See, Attila had torched so much of Poland, destroyed all their crops. No one, not even the Grota clan, who had a few bad years farming because they were so busy running around massacring Huns and saving Europe, had anything to eat. Scar let the silence hang, then smiled. Don't wonder, Hobby. The Grota clan did it. It happened. See, they had never seen such a creature. They were awed and afraid, what with the hood, the fangs, all that. The basic human reaction to snakes. Perfectly understandable. The fear, revulsion. Even the devil is a snake, or so we hear. Me? I don't believe there is a devil. At first, naturally, they didn't realize that Spike could kill. And when a few of them killed over, they knew they had a serious problem. Suspected even they were faced with extinction. Near perfect form of genocide. But the snakes do the dirty work. <laughs> They hunted down the cobras, thousands at a time. Had to. Save themselves from getting bitten first. But you got Grota and clan starving. A man's gotta eat, right? So, they hacked off heads with swords, stomped them, whatever it took. Once trampled, they were skinned, skewered over fires. Grota and clan with bellies probably bloated on drink, then feasted on cobra meat. Written in this Vatican book, they even used cobra venom as a sort of... mixer for their wine. Female eggs cracked open on skillets, scrambled or over easy, all of it. Now, you'd think drinking all that venom would have killed them. Apparently it didn't. Hell, it only made them stronger. Even more ferocious because the Romans were up next. Ah, but that's another story that Hollywood got wrong. All that gladiator crap. One eye flicked away his cigarette, head bobbing. Damn near ate the cobra population to its own extinction. What they didn't consume, the winner got. Dagula couldn't find his voice, his mind racing, wondering about this insane story. They had to be lying, but something in their eyes told him. No, he thought, it couldn't be true. If it was, then how could this fantastic accounting of supposed history be kept from the world? Again, the turbulence, and he would have sworn something was stirring beneath him. They caught the look. Wondering if it's true, Dougie? It is. And don't ask what the point is. It's this. You're the Cobra. We're a couple of King Grotas. Both lost the grins. <laughs> Got the picture now? Are we clear? I'll take your silence in that constipated look as a yes. Now, we're gonna have a talk to a few of the others before we land. Same drill, same option. We're gonna point out, like the Cobras at King Grota's time, we are quite prepared to skin and skewer you over a fire. Only we won't eat you. We'll feed you to your militant pals. Scar fired up another cigarette. Or we can be your rapture, joy in paradise, or left behind to suffer hell on earth. See, in a very short while, I'm telling you we're down to hours, you and the others are going to be free. Tagula felt his head spin. What? Freedom, Dougie, but only if you follow our explicit instructions. One eye was grinning again. Here's what's going to happen. The Cobra Major was embroiled in some intense conversation on his sat link, Bolin wishing he could eavesdrop. The difficulty on that matter, however, was twofold, and the whole display struck the soldier as scripted. 
So what else is new? They were in the Gulf Stream, somewhere over the Mediterranean. Collins in his comm center. Bolan had claimed a seat facing the Major, but Collins kept his back turned. Then there was Python, looking settled and relaxed in the seat next to his boss. Python was working on a beer, puffing up a storm in a chain-smoking routine that would have cleared out Yankee Stadium. Between Collins' position and Python's smoke, lip-reading was impossible. The second problem was the rock music thundering from the boombox between Python's feet. Bolan could sense Python watching him from behind black sunglasses that rendered his eyes invisible. The guy was good. Bolan had to give him that much, acting as if the moment were simply happy hour, unwinding after a long, hard few days of lopping heads, tapping his foot to the music, working on beer and smoke, and rocking his head. If the other commandos were annoyed by the ungodly racket, they were either too exhausted, too lost in thought, or too grateful to simply be alive to give a damn. Something, Bolan sensed, was in the works. And it had nothing to do with what he'd been told by Collins, all that debriefing, interrogating of prisoners business. Bolan needed to touch base with Brugnola as soon as they landed at Camp Zero. The warrior had made sure that he kept his war bag close at hand during each stop, his own sat link buried beneath weapons and gear. Had it been opened when he was occupied in battle, a mini-detector concealed in the bottom of the bag would have alerted him to curious hands. He kept a mini-monitor on his person at all times, and it would flash red if the bag was opened. So far, so good. Bolin eased back in his seat, looked away as Collins shut down his sat link and stood. Turn that shit off! And that's your last beer. What's the matter with you? I don't need you guys breathing beer fumes all over the head shed when we land. Bunch of fucking drunks can't even piss straight. We still have work to do. Bolin was certain it was an act. He watched as Collins went to the small fridge and helped himself to a beer. Stone? Bolin faked an inviting smile. I guess command gets certain perks. You're damn right. You want one? Bolin's gut warned him he needed to stay sharper than ever. I'll pass. Moments later, Collins landed in a seat, faced Bolin. We've got a few hours to hash out the next step of the program. You've already told me. Tour the compound, debrief, days of interrogations. More like weeks, maybe months. What you call the Stooges have already learned we've got some real bad characters on our hands. Here, you're gonna need this. Collins held out a patch of the American flag. Stick that on your left arm. It will allow you free roam of the compound. No marine watchdogs barking to know what your business is. Bolin had already seen this same free pass on the others. He took the Velcro emblem, fastened the straps. He watched Collins watching him. Been a hell of a run, huh, Stone? That it has been. This thing, this war on terrorism, well... I understand the head shed has another round on the drawing board. Something about Indonesia, the Philippines. Bagging a bunch of Abu Sayyaf beauties. You may be interested? Let's see how this one shakes out first. The executioner saw the dark hunger dart through the Cobra leader's eyes. An image of a lion stalking prey flashed to mind. Collins nodded. Yeah, let's do that. It was time. Warlock had the first three marks in his sights, swiveling to his six, the five-man flight crew in black jumpsuits striding his way. Two were on the payroll, but three, navigator, flight engineer, and radio operator loadmaster, were already gone. They just didn't know it yet. Hold up right there, gentlemen. I need a moment with you. They parked it near the satellite intercept tracking station. Warlock then found the last two Marines ready to head down the ramp and trail the prisoners being led to their cage by their fellow Marines. You two Marines, stand fast. Sir? Warlock glanced at Cyclops, the initial play already hashed out between them. Sound suppressors were screwed onto their Berettas. Cyclops had the Tranquilizer T1 loaded with Narcon darts sheathed on his right hip. We need your help lugging some gear. The Marines hesitated, looked at each other. Warlock simmered inside, aware of their orders, Marines sticking to the book. But there was a new clock set by Collins, and if it didn't go down by the numbers in a hurry, they were all stuck and screwed. What is your major malfunction, Marine? Sir, our orders are to remain with the prisoners until they are locked down and Raven 1 can- You see this, son? Cyclops jabbed a finger at the American flag attached to his left arm with Velcro. Yes, sir. I was- I see I need to refresh your memory, Marine. This means whoever wears one of these gives the orders around here. That means whoever has one of these tells you to do something, you step lively. Since I don't see either one of you wearing one... Shoulder those rifles and shag your asses! 
Warlock gave Cyclops the nod. Now, Marines! When the Marines did as they were ordered, Warlock whirled in a 180, Beretta in hand. They were in sync, but there was never any doubt in Warlock's mind. <laughs> Warlock wasn't quite sure what he heard behind him, but he knew it wasn't the Trank gun. Wheeling, he found Cyclops holding the Beretta, spotted neat red holes between the eyes of the Marines. God damn it. What? We were told they wanted ten live Marines. I thought we understood each other. Cyclops shrugged. Plenty more where they came from. Ten, you got that? Breathing. Sure, relax. Warlock kept his glare on Cyclops a moment, then turned the Beretta on Captains Benson and Marshall, who threw their hands up. Whoa, what the hell is this? We had a deal. Just wanted to see you two jump some. What that means is, you two better be worth every penny of 20 million from here on. I want that transponder trashed and five minutes ago. Stay online to our frequency. Not a problem. Though Marshall looked about ready to shit himself, Benson appeared calm, with something almost like defiance in his eyes. You got a problem? You want to say something? Spit it out now, Captain Benson. No problem here. So why don't you look ready to shit yourself like your pilot? How come I think I see some agenda in your eyes? No agenda. I figure you shoot us. Who's going to fly this ship? Trust me, cowboy. If I spot cold feet and some bailing out on your parts, I will shoot you down. And I don't give a rat's ass if we're 30,000 feet up. You know why? Because I can fly this ship my goddamn self. Hey, it's understood. Then drag these bodies into the cubicles. Leave the ramp down, one of you in the cockpit, one back here. Do not let anyone but us inside. I don't hear a yes, sir, ladies. We got it. Warlock holstered his weapon. The war bag draped over his shoulder next, he grabbed the handle on the footlocker. Cyclops took the other strap, lifted, and they were moving. Warlock shot his partner a grin. <laughs> Don't drop it. He spotted the first sign of fear he could ever recall seeing in the man's eye, as Cyclops looked down, checking to see if the lock was secure. As Boland deplaned behind Collins, war bag on his shoulder, M-16 held low beside his leg, he found a reception committee marching toward the runway. A tall man in black with a full head of gray hair led three other black-suited men armed with HK MP5s through the runway lights. Bolin pulled up beside Collins, the other Cobra commando sweeping past. The soldier stole a few moments to take in Camp Zero. The ballpark figure was something like 2,000 Greek islands, most of which were in the Aegean Sea, the remainder scattered west on the Ionian. According to Collins, Camp Zero had claimed a piece of rock deep in the southeast Aegean in the Critico-Pelagos, roughly 120 miles from the southwest shores of Turkey. They were far enough away from commuter ferries with tourists on island-hopping holiday, cruise ships and such, that they might as well have been at the ends of the earth. It was supposedly a covert CIA way station, Greek officials having given American intelligence agencies their blessing when the Cold War was in full swing. Later, with all the tension and beating of war drums between the various countries in the Balkans, it had been expanded to base American troops. It was monitored by cameras, motion sensors, ringing the entire shoreline, the hills likewise alive with supertech detection. A little digging and the farm could confirm the whole slice of information. Boland didn't think it would come down to that. He believed that maybe for once Collins told the truth. The base was snugged in a valley, encompassed by walls of black jagged hills. South was the squat block of Zero Main, the west end of the structure bristling with antennae, sat dishes, and a radio tower. The C-130 was parked at the deep north end of Runway 1, ramped down. The prisoners had been offloaded. There were 26 Marines to guard the detainees. A sleek Bell jet ranger was sitting quietly on the large helipad near Main, no activity around the compound except for the newcomers pulling up before him. Major Collins, good to see you, sir. Mr. Falcone, I'd like you to meet Colonel Stone. He'll be assisting in all processing and questioning of prisoners along with me. Falcone held out his hand. Colonel? Boland shook the proffered hand, nodded, then felt his gut tighten. He would have sworn he was looking at a carbon copy of Collins. CIA? Falcone hesitated, Boland catching Collins, throwing him a look. From this point, Colonel, the CIA will be a large part of what goes on here. Sit rep, Mr. Falcone. Raven 1's ETA is 60 minutes, sir. The prisoners? Caged and ready for processing, Major. Boland felt his mouth tighten. Caged? He felt a growing sense of urgency in the air as he watched Falcone's stare narrowing. Every fiber of his being warned him something was seriously wrong here. Collins checked his watch. Okay, Mr. Falcone. 
I want all the Marines but two in the courtroom for a quick brief before the head shed lands. I'll send two of my own to help watch the prisoners. Yes, sir. Collins ran an eye over the three black-suited men. Where's the rest of Predator 5? There was a brisk breeze, tinged with the briny smell of Aegean sea salt swaddling him. But despite the cool wind, Bolan felt his blood suddenly run hot with adrenaline, instincts kicking into overdrive, combat radar blipping all over his mental screen. With the prisoners, Major. Okay. Help get the Marines situated. Ten minutes. Aye, aye, Major. Come on, Stone. What happened to the Grand Tour? No time, Colonel. Collins strode toward the concrete facing of Zero Main. The head shed will be hopped up when they touch down. Big Shots will want to pick our brains the next 24 hours about the mission. No rest for the weary, Colonel. Just keeping ourselves juiced on bad coffee and smokes. While we can, we need to get somewhat situated ourselves in our home quarters. Dump off our bags. Now, whatever they ask, just tell them the truth about the mission. Bolin watched as Collins glanced at his war bag. What about Gambler trying to put an eye in the back of my head? We'll worry about that if and when it gets to that point. Now, I'm assuming, Colonel, you'd like a little downtime, maybe. You've got a sat link in the bag. You might want to make some calls with before we get started. If you do, better do it now, because you won't get another chance for a while. And I can't guarantee what that while is. Bolin felt his heart thumping against his chest, the tension and heat radiating off Collins. Ragnola needed an update anyway. Twenty minutes should do it. That'll work. Bolan looked at the oversized pistol hung in leather on the Major's right hip. What's with the new addition? What? I know a tranquilizer gun when I see it. <laughs> I have to give you an answer for the obvious? So far, Major, there's been very little about all this that's been obvious. It's for the prisoners. One of them gets out of line. Well, you get the picture. Yeah. Bolan turned as he felt a presence behind him. A soldier was trailing him. Would you like some help with that bag, sir? I'll manage. It was all Collins could do to keep his nerves from showing, sparking out of his skin. The big bastard was the first problem that had to go. He tried to stay cool, keep a poker face as he strode down hallway A, stone right beside him, the concrete walls shining a brilliant white beneath the stark glare of the overheads. He felt his face go flush from the heat of the moment, feared another minute of walking with the bastard in what was damn near a blinding light and he'd break out in a sweat, and stone... Warrior instinct so keen the guy was almost psychic would smell it out. The clock was ticking. Everyone on the team knew their role. All they had to do was execute. They were marching past hallway B when Collins pulled up, decided to put on a show of checking on the two Marines standing watch over the cage. The prisoners were housed in a steel mesh pen, capable of holding at least a hundred prisoners. Mats already distributed, three open commodes. He saw a few hands gripping the mesh, bearded faces and angry eyes aimed at the Marines. Step back. Everything under control, gentlemen? Yes, sir. Collins began leading Stone down the hallway. You don't mind bunking with me, do you, Colonel? Collins thought he saw a grin dance over Stone's lips. You don't snore, do you? Stone didn't say anything, just kept walking. They moved past the iron-barred cell, which Collins planned to make Stone's coffin. Well... It isn't the Hyatt, but we've got satellite TV, wet bar, and our own bathroom and shower. Here we are. Collins pulled up in the open doorway of their quarters, his companion hesitating. After you, Colonel. He saw Stone look over his shoulder, then turn away, easing into their quarters. He had to have sensed it coming, but by the time Stone had gripped his Beretta, Collins had the T-1 out and was chugging a dart. <sighs> it impaled him, dead center in the American flag. Collins knew it would take a few seconds for the Narcon to fully kick in, the bastard clawing for his weapon, hanging on to fight back. <coughs> Two more shots in the stomach. Collins gripped by fear as the big guy fought to stay on his feet. Then he drilled his toe into Stone's groin for safekeeping. <coughs> he watched the man jackknife, then collapse. <laughs> That'll keep you for about an hour, Colonel. Just in case you wake up before we're done, I'll leave someone here to babysit. Bolin wanted to reach up and grab Collins by the throat, the nuts, anything he could get his hands on. But his limbs were swelling with numbness. I'll be back, Colonel. And your buddies Larry and Curly want to have a little chat with you. Seems they're all bent out of shape, you snuffed gambler. I promised them your ass, and your ass they will have. I asked them to save me a piece, but hey, we'll see what happens. No guarantees in life, you know. Sweet dreams, asshole. Your heartbeats are on a one-hour clock.
Boland saw the misty specter of Colin sweep out of the room. Then the haze faded to black. Do not talk! Tagula saw the hope rise in the defiant looks of his fellow Muslims all around. They were wondering if the infidels were speaking the truth. When it would happen, what was happening and why. Who are these haze? The Marines glowered, standing back when Tagula saw the scar and one eye surge into view, pistols with attached sound suppressors up and aimed at the Marines. Shock and confusion hardened the faces of the Marines, assault rifles shimmying up in their hands, uncertain what to do. <laughs> You're relieved of duty. The Marines toppled into the wall, crimson smears and grisly patches of brain matter following their slide to the floor. Tagula was off his mat, the tide of prisoners rushing for the fence. Hold up! Fall back! Tagula watched as they snapped up the fallen M-16s. You are going to be freed, as we promised. You'll be taken straight for the same plane that brought you here. You will not be chained down. If any one of you attempts to fight back at any time, we will shoot down every one of you. We already have what we want. We really don't need you. But we made a promise to one of your leaders, and we intend to keep it. Consider us the Rapture, and you the Chosen. Now, if any of you have a problem with us sending your brothers on to paradise and are itching for revenge, speak up now. They were all seething that these men could so cold-bloodedly kill two of their own before their eyes. Beyond that, all of them had lost scores of fellow fighters during various strikes on their independent groups. Tagula could only hope the others held their tongues, kept their hands to themselves. Move out in twos. I'll lead the way. No talking! Three more infidels appeared by Scar's side, their subguns out and ready to cut loose at the first sign of mutiny. Dagula, front and center. Any of your people get froggy, you're the first to go. You understand, Dagula? Dagula saw Scar key the door open, the others parting to let him pass. Perfectly. Good boy. Colin slipped on his gas mask, HK MP5 in hand. He found Falcone, a.k.a. the Falcon, and two of his Predator commandos standing by the closed doors to the courtroom. Mamba, Python, and Diamond back on his heels, Collins led the way down hallway F, cocking and locking, blood racing, victory in sight. The double doors were closed. Twenty-plus Marines right now sitting in wooden chairs, backs turned to them, Collins knew, facing the American flag and the judge's bench. He felt no pity, no remorse over what he was about to do, what had to be done. Ten were promised for delivery to the Ayatollah, and ten live Marines he would get. Fuck America. This was about him, his money, and this was his time to shine. All that patriotic blubbering, the war-drumming, nationalistic, us-and-them nonsense didn't wash. There were two sides to every conflict, every story, but he was only interested in one side, his own. After hearing about Cyclops' quick dispatch of the two Marines aboard the Herc, he relayed the order again in no uncertain terms. He needed ten breathing Marines. Another of Falcone's predators was right then en route to help lug unconscious and cuffed Marines to the plane. There was only one way in and out of the courtroom, and Collins had the key that would lock them in, sucking on gas, figure 15, 20 seconds tops until they were out. A check of his watch, and he saw they had about 30 minutes to wrap it up until the big shots touched down. There was still the stone matter in the wings, a not-so-little moment Collins was craving every bit as much as Warlock and Cyclops. A real treat was in store for the big bastard. Closing on Falcone, he found the Marines had lined their weapons against the wall, as ordered. He was plucking a Narcon D canister off his webbing when Falcone looked at him. Once we're in the air, sir, you and me need to have a talk. So far, Mr. Falcone, everything is going along swimmingly. Mm. Here, maybe. Collins didn't much care for the sound of that, wondering if there was some problem with the money. Just finish the job. Falcone took a canister, finger curled inside the ring. Mamba, pull one of these puppies. Mamba stepped up, shouldering his HK, sleeping bomb in hand. I go nine. Mamba, twelve. Falcone, three. Diamondback, take the door. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Diamondback. Collins waited until Diamondback twisted the knobs, shoved the doors ahead, then pulled the pin. Three lobs, perfect tosses, halfway around the clock. The Marines sitting ramrod stiff, facing front, until the canisters thumped and rolled and clouds of gas erupted. <laughs> God bless America. That ought to do it. Let's do this. Masks, everyone. 
I need ten people. Collins, painfully aware of time, watched his commandos slap cuffs on ten marines and start hauling them out, then swept into the dissipating cloud. He glanced at Falcone and briefly wondered what the big talk was all about. Collins thought the CIA man looked sick over the chore they had to perform. Whatever it was passed as Falcone began pumping one round each from his Beretta into the skulls of sleeping Marines. Collins shot three at point blank range with his own pistol and looked over at Python, who flashed five fingers twice. Move, move! It's going to take two trips. Aye, aye, Major. After one more headshot, Collins started taking stock of the body count, but Falcone moved up beside him. I think we're finished here, Major. Walk through it once more. Collins started checking the bodies, most of which were stacked near the doors. Out in the hall, Collins shed his mask, chucked it away. He rang up Warlock and Cyclops. What's your situation? They're loaded. Everything under control? I think we made believers out of them. Must have been the tale of King Grota and his snake eaters that got their bowels all twisted. The load is now nothing but meek lambs. Okay. Collins' swift strides hauled him south down hallway F. Meet me and hustle up. You two have ten minutes and no more. <laughs> Collins hastened his strides. It was Stone's turn. It's going to be the sweetest thing in the world. Bolin was looking up, the mist evaporating when the boot speared him in the gut. <laughs> this is for Gambler! Bolin suffered for a flurry of fists and feet, a hurricane of rights, uppercuts, straights, kicks to the ribs, legs, lower back. He felt each and every pile-driving blow, as still more air was driven from already oxygen-starved lungs. Unlike Hollywood, where two fully grown men could bang away at each other for 30 minutes with barely a scratch, in reality, one well-placed punch to the jaw or the side of the head and the legs turned to jelly and gave out. When a man was down on the ground, the other guy had all the advantage. The awful reality now was that Bolin was meant to take the mother of all beatings before they killed him. Payback for gambling, for starters. He was on the ground, at their mercy, and he was messed up, with more to come. A veil of blackness began to descend, and the blows kept coming. He doesn't look so tough now, does he? Bastard's going to pass out. Drag his ass over here. Instinctively, Bolin reached for his sidearms, but found only empty holsters. He lifted his leg, then discovered they'd also taken his commando dagger. Hands next, more like claws, dug into his shoulders, dragged him ahead. He tasted the bitter copper of his own blood, his face burning where deep gashes were already slashed open around his eyes and mouth. If he was going to die, the soldier decided to die on his feet, fighting to the last bitter breath. He craned his head, made out Collins standing by the cell door, the bastard grinning at him through the mist, chucking something up and down in his hand. A combination of fear, adrenaline, superb conditioning, and raw willfulness cleared Bolin's limbs of a good deal of sludge, and he galvanized to his feet. Jesus! Warlock was surprised as hell they hadn't beaten him unconscious as the soldier whiplashed an elbow over his mouth. He followed up with a hammer fist, cracking Cyclops in his good eye, staggering the bastard. A two-foot charge, and Bolin buried his toe in Collins' breadbasket, jackknifed the Cobra leader, nearly dropped him to his knees. The trouble was, Bolin knew he was too far gone, the world threatening to spin out from under him, double vision turning three attackers into six. The punch to the back of his skull erupted another round of shooting stars, the fist to his kidney threatening to spew vomit as he felt the invisible knives tear clear to his sternum, back down to his toes. Hands dug into his shoulders, and Bolin took the edge of the bars to the side of his face. It was a strange, sick feeling of disembodiment next. He felt his legs moving in a sort of bike pedal motion as he was run into the cell, then body slammed through some heavy object. He was face down, pressed against cold concrete. Bolin faded, in and out, barely felt the punches. With the Narcon still cruising through his system, with men who were probably just as skilled with their fists as he was, but who were amped up with murder in their hearts, Bolin knew it was beyond hope. Go get it. We're out of here. Bolin somehow held on, the world spinning off its axis just the same. He shuddered up on an elbow, sharp objects digging into his side. He shimmied up, back against the wall, saw two misty specters outside the bars, the door slamming shut with a snick as it latched. This was it. Bolin waited for the bullet to end it for good, but it never came. As he sucked air back into his burning lungs, deep intakes that told him that somehow, miracle of miracles, no ribs were broken, though every inch of his side and back and stomach ached and burned, his vision cleared enough to find Cyclops at the bars. There was something in his hand, a black satchel. 
I still say you let me at least pump one in his gut, Major. Yeah, he'll be dead soon enough. And this will be sweeter than just letting him bleed to death. What are you waiting for? Toss it. Bolin would have sworn he saw the sack pulsing or thrashing with something inside fighting to get out. The soldier knew what was coming and tensed. Cyclops unknotted the cord, grabbed the bottom of the sack, a flick of the wrist, and Cyclops sent the cobra airborne. <laughs> Bolin watched the serpent as it coiled along the floor, but his vision was blurring from Narcon and the pummeling. He tried to stand, but there was no feeling in his legs, no strength anywhere. He watched the serpent as it wound a foot or so closer, then stopped, rising, as if thinking about something. Satisfied he was a goner, the commandos vanished without a word. Bolin fought to stay awake. The cobra inched closer, tongue flicking. Bolin fighting with every fiber of willpower he could muster to keep from passing out as its hood fanned out and the serpent rose higher. As he led the way toward the runway where the sleek VIP Gulfstream was taxiing to a stop, Collins resisted the temptation to rub his stomach. The bastard had nearly speared the kick clear back to his spine, and Collins wondered if he'd be pissing blood the next few days. Damn, but he had to give Stone his due. He had taken a beating that no man should have walked away from, and Collins had the bruised and bloodied knuckles to show for more than a few wallops to the guy's face and head. Sure, like a cop who knew how to use just enough force to subdue a scumbag perp without inflicting obvious injuries, they had pulled back some on their punches. He wanted Stone to live just long enough for the Cobra to get him. It was never really the act of dying itself that was so terrible. Not for him, and certainly not for a man of Stone's caliber. The guy, nothing but balls and heart, all warrior. It was the moments before, during which a man knew he was going to die, that could prove the worst. The waiting for the end to come, with nothing he could do to stop it. The thorn in his side had been removed. Warlock looked pleased, but the bitter sheen in the eye of Cyclops told him the man wasn't too happy with the results. What? I don't like knowing the bastard might still be breathing. Oh, give it up. That snake was going right for him. Cooped up in those sacks as long as they were and getting riled up the whole time. Those things will sink their fangs into the first live flesh they see. I don't know. He's finished. That's the last I want to hear about it. Collins picked up the pace, HK subgun off his shoulder, Python and Falcone turning their way. You know what to do, gentlemen. Quick and clean. Any crap from them? Bust them over the head. I want them cuffed, stuffed, and loaded up. Two minutes. Collins waited as the hatch opened, ramp unfolding. They deplaned, single file, briefcases in hand, four of Washington's intelligence elite. He recognized a pudgy face or two from the talk shows, so-called experts who could shoot their mouths off but never said a damn thing worth remembering, always dancing around the critical questions, swaddling themselves in national security. Oh, but they looked and smelled good, all perfumed and pink and polished, dark cashmere coats, the expressions chiseled with self-importance, the grim seriousness of the task at hand of drilling, indicting, and judging terror mongers. That wasn't going to happen. They didn't know it yet, but they were in a world of shit beyond their worst nightmares. They were looking around, unsure, probably sensed something in the air, wondering why subguns were up and aimed their way. Collins waited until the bald bulldog was down and rolling up between his fellow elitists. Python was up the steps, subgun out and ready. General Aberdeen? What is the meaning of this? The meaning, General, is that you four are under arrest. You're insane! Well, that could be, General. But one man's insanity is another man's vision of what has to be made right in the world. You are being arrested and detained for crimes and atrocities committed against all Islamic peoples. You are going to be tried and most likely executed for said crimes. Collins saw them gathering breath to protest, but Warlock and Cyclops were slamming their subjects off their skulls, driving them to their knees. What is this all about? Hands behind your back. Do it now or I will shoot you in the balls. I shit you not. Collins saw Cyclops grinning as he fastened the plastic cuffs on Aberdeen's hands. You're crazy. You'll never get We've away with this. We've already gotten away with it, General. Bolin knew he'd get only one shot to try to save himself. If he missed the first time, it was over. If it was a spitting adder, he was finished. He would be blinded first, then bitten, some of the deadliest snake venom in the world coursing through his punished body. Slowly, staring into black orbs no larger than pinheads, 
Bolin reached behind, fingers curling around a thick piece of wood. The way the tip jabbed in his side, he knew his fall against the cell's table had sheared off a strip as sharp as a spike. Would it be enough? Figured distance was a short lunge of three feet, but in his punished condition, his eyes wanted to blur. The black cobra appeared nearly kissing close. It rose several inches higher, body coiling tighter. The creature struck, propelling itself forward, and Bolin felt his hand clamp flesh. He had it now, squeezing with his remaining strength just inches below the hood. Then he had the snake on the floor, boot pinned on its fat serpentine body as he brought the sharpened stake down. Instinct told Bolin it was dead. Spent, the executioner felt his legs melting. Then he collapsed onto the wall, sinking on his haunches. He nearly slipped away into dark bliss, but clung to the real world, wondering how he was going to get out of the cage. I'm telling you God's honest truth! Collins had the muzzle of his HK subgun jammed in Captain Marshall's belly. He looked at the bruise on the pilot's jaw, the man's arms above his head, eyes brimming with fear. Just clocked you and sashayed on out the door? Cold cocked me! I never saw it coming! And you had no inkling your buddy was set to abandon ship? Clueless. Guess now you maybe think you're gonna get his cut. I'm happy with ten, but whatever you think is right, Major. Collins looked at his troops. How come this is the first I'm hearing about Benson vanishing into the night? How come none of you bothered to tell me? Someone? Anyone? We didn't know until now. We assumed he was in the cockpit. We could do a quick sweep at a compound. Collins gave that some consideration. The problem was the AWOL Herc jockey could be anywhere. The hills were pocked with caves, an ancient lattice of tunnels dug out by the Greeks dating back to the time of Alexander. No. Python, front and center. I take it the transponder's history, Marshal. All taken care of. Sir? I want you to sit with Captain Marshall. Do not leave the cockpit for any reason. You have to take a leak or a dump, do it right there next to him. Aye, aye, Major. Python here was a navigator on a Spectre during the Gulf War. You touch anything but the wheel and the stick for the landing gear, he'll know about it. Now move out and get us in the air. Something glittered. Bolin, bracing himself against the wall, stood, searching the hall floor in front of the bars. With the slightest movement, white-hot pain tore through every inch of his body, set fire to every nerve ending. No broken bones, but the blood was still flowing from deep gashes along his eyebrows that would need suturing, assuming he got out of the cell in the near future. Medical attention was actually the last of his concerns. Even still, there wasn't one inch on his body that wasn't aching with raw fire pulsing from the terrible beating. The inside of his mouth and cheeks was a series of craters, the soldier hacking out thick, gummy blood as he shuddered ahead, forcing himself to focus at the object on the floor. Most of his vision had returned, but the haze still danced in and out, pain throbbing right behind his eyes so hard it felt as if his eyeballs would pop out from the pressure. Hand on the wall, he shuffled three steps past the pulped cobra body, breathing steady, spitting blood. He shoved himself off the wall, amazed for a moment he could stand at all, but willing his legs to stay locked beneath him. <laughs> oh, you gotta be kidding me. Bending, he slipped an arm between the bars and palmed the key. He drew it back, figured in all the excitement Collins had simply dropped the key. Then Bolin recalled the kick to the bastard's gut. That was when he had lost it, most likely. No matter. Bolin reached around, inserted the key, and unlocked the door. Then he saw it, freezing in mid-stride, the last two feet of black tail sliding out of sight as the snake vanished down hallway B. Beyond the serpent life, the executioner sensed the utter stillness of death all over the building. Not good. Cobras on the loose, no telling where they'd crop up, but he was soon vacating the premises. First he entered his quarters. Mistake two was the enemy leaving his war bag behind, M-16 still leaning against the wall. Oh, but they were laughing now, feeling good. But once he put in the call to Brignola, he would make sure the man from Justice pulled out all the stops, called in every marker, the farm using every bit of high-tech skill at its command and disposal to scour the earth. Make no mistake, the soldier would hunt them down. Bolin faltered, weaving. Suddenly he felt sick, the world gyrating, wall shimmying. <laughs> As busted up as he was, unconsciousness threatening him with every step, 
He knew he wasn't going to make it out the door anytime soon. M16 in hand, checking the load and finding a full clip, it was all he could do to sweep the bathroom, the entire quarters for lurking cobras. Clear. He shut the door just as he heard a distant rumble and the hallway lights blinked out. They had blown the generator. Stumbling around blind in the hall with serpents crawling all over the place wasn't an option. He palmed his lighter, flicked the lid, went and kicked his war bag a few times. They assumed the cobra would have done its deadly work for them by now, but he wouldn't put it past the bastards to stow a serpent in the bag. Satisfied it was free of venomous creatures, he was about to zip it open and pull out his sat link when a wave of nausea washed over him, driving fiery needles deep into his brain. <sighs> You won't get away with this. Someone will find you, and you'll wish you'd never been born. The Marines had to have known what was coming, as Cyclops thumbed all but two rounds out of the clip. Collins turned to a terrorist. You, take this. Two shots, two Marines. Two freebies. You pick up. Figure it's the least we owe you. The terrorist stood, uncertain, but took the weapon. No tricks. Just don't do these four. Yeah, they're big TV stars back in America. <laughs> Despite their hands cuffed behind their backs, legs manacled together, Cullen saw Aberdeen and his three companions start to rise as a group, Warlock, Cyclops, and Diamondback slamming suddenly over their heads, driving them to their haunches. Collins nudged the terrorist as he strode up to the Marines. Go on. You'll pay for this, Collins. I swear to Almighty God. I've already been paid, General. Any more squawking out of you, and I might just decide you're not worth the trouble of keeping alive. Do it. A sound brought Bolin back to consciousness. He swung his legs off the bunk. Assault rifle in hand, he watched as the door creaked open, the flame of a lighter wavering, the muzzle of a weapon poking into the darkness. Lose the weapon. Do it now. Easy. I'm not one of them. Are you alone? Just me. Everyone else here is dead. Collins? Gone with the prisoners. I mean, they're new prisoners, General Aberdeen and about ten Marines. Keep that flame on your face. What's your name? Benson, Captain, United States Air Force. Pilot? Retired. Fly for the company now. Get in here and sit down. Shut the door behind you. Boland slid a wooden chair across the floor. The lean figure in a black jumpsuit stepped in, closed the door, then sat, the flame from the lighter showing Boland a middle-aged, graying flight jockey. Collins did that? He had a little help from his friends Warlock and Cyclops, but yeah... They danced a hell of a number on me. You come across any cobras on the way in? Six. I shot them. Collins even threw two of his own men into a cell with a few snakes. Who? I think their handles were a tsunami and brick. I was right about one thing, anyway. What was that? The serpent handles. Those were the ones who were in on whatever this is about. They flew off in the Herc, Benson? They did. I was their co-pilot. You fell into bed with some rotten company. I woke up before it was too late. You telling me you grew a conscience? I'm telling you I made a mistake. Seems to be a lot of that going around lately. Well, I may be a few bad things, but a traitor to my country isn't one of them. You must be Colonel Stone. That would be me. What's your story? No story. They recruited me about six months ago. I was handpicked by the Pentagon's Cobra Command, which is actually run by Collins. Collins has some dirt on me. Pictures of me and a woman other than my wife. The usual sins. That sounds like his style. What's this about? It's about dumping off the head shed and ten marines to one of the world's most notorious terrorists. Now, where I heard it, there's going to be a sort of reverse military tribunal for the Americans. Confessions of crimes committed against all Islamic peoples. All of it videotaped right down to their executions. You'll probably see it on Al Jazeera soon enough. Let me guess. Collins and the rest are in it for the money. One billion dollars, to be exact. Who's paying? Harim Salon. I've heard the name. So, you know where they're going? I know exactly where they're going. Iran. Bolin felt himself wobble. Colonel, why don't you let me clean you up a little? When we get out of here, what's out front to fly? There's the Gulf Stream. That's got a good first aid kit on it. Just get us to Inserlik. Bola nearly pitched off his feet. Benson jumped up, threw an arm around the soldier. 
Colonel, I think you need to lie down for a while. No time. You can stitch me up once we're on the plane. Can you manage your bag, or would you like me to carry it? You carry it. I'll watch for snakes on the way out. Let me be clear on something, Benson. I've had a bad night, and I'd better not find out that you're not playing it straight. Understood, Colonel. Bullen remembered he had been passed out before Benson appeared. Uh, what time is it, Benson? The uh, sun just came up. Gives him about a four-hour head start. When we get to the plane, I'll help you sweep it for snakes. Yeah. I can't think of anything worse than snakes on the plane. Bolin dredged up every bit of strength he could, shuffled for the door, clacked open his lighter, M16 poised to shoot the first serpent he came across. Soon, the executioner would be hunting snakes of the human variety, and woe unto Collins and whatever was left of Cobra Force when he caught up to them. Payback was as close as tomorrow. Now, what is your major malfunction, Mr. Falcone? Oh, just a little matter of a hundred million to collect and the fact that our Russian pals seem to have dropped off the face of the earth. The Russians were your department. Part of our deal for the rest of the money was for delivery of those Russian VX briefcases to the Ayatollah of Rock and Rolla. You changed the schedule by a full two days. Two days from now is when I am supposed to contact the Russians. No sooner. So what are you saying? I'm saying, Major, when we land in Iran, I don't think the Ayatollah will just wire the rest of the money to our accounts and bid us a nice day. So we sit tight for two days. Sample the Ayatollah's hospitality. Help the head shed and the Marines get settled into their new home. While the entire might of the United States military and intelligence agencies are hunting for us. You don't think this bird can be spotted and tracked? That's why my men are right now creating ghost ships for any spy eyes. It's another little marvel, courtesy of high-tech supercomputers. We go one way, any military installations tracking us find their screen showing us going in the opposite direction. Look, it will be at least two days before anybody discovers what happened at Camp Zero, since part of the plan was radio silence with Washington, which I arranged through my contacts at the Pentagon. By then, the Russians deliver the VX packages. We get our money, everyone goes their separate ways. Passports, new identities... Ah, you hope it goes down that way. Mr. Falcone, we are in way too deep now to start fretting like a bunch of old hags over things that haven't happened yet. <sighs> the Iranians are fanatics, Major. I'm amazed they even bought into this scheme. What do you mean? I mean, what's to stop them from either taking us prisoner like the others, or just killing us on the spot? <laughs> Me, Mr. Falcone, that's what would stop them. You want out? What? If you want out, I can go and open the door right now. Are you threatening me, Major? This is my deal, too. No threat. I merely asked a simple question. When I want out, I'll let you know. Two days, the Russians don't touch base, and I walk. We clear? Oh, yeah. We're clear, all right. With a cleaned, sutured, and sterilized but brutally punished face, Bolin found himself in the air with Benson at the helm of the Gulf Stream. He settled the sat link on a table, sipped bottled water, fighting to keep it down. The soldier knew he would wear the war wounds from this one for some time to come, but it was far from over. The worst for somebody was waiting on the other end in Iran, and Bolin was hell-bent on winning the next round. Quickly, he dialed up Brignola. Allowing for the time difference, he tried the big fed at his suburban Virginia home, rousing Brignola from sleep. Hey, Stryker, I was getting worried. Your worries have only started. Stryker, you all right? You don't sound so hot. I sound about the way I look. What gives? Bolin gave the bitter and the short of it to Brignola, finally told him he was on his way to the American air base at Encerlik. When he finished updating Brignola, he wasn't sure the Big Fed was still there. What a mess. Doesn't even begin to define it, Hal. Bastards. Doesn't even begin to define them, either. Now, this is what I want, and this is how I want to play it. Get a pen. Here's the laundry list of what I need. Bolin spelled out the hardware he would need, wanted Brignola to get the farm on this ASAP, marshal up every resource he could to make it happen. He knew where they were headed, and Brignola knew all about Harin Salan. A satellite would be parked over the region within the hour. 
You realize, Stryker, if this comes to public light... No time to stew over this one, Al. Get the man right away. Presidential directives for me across the board. I'm going in. Other than a flying armada, you're going in alone, Stryker. We don't even know yet how many will be on the ground. I started this alone. I might as well finish it alone. Okay. I've got a lot of work to do and no time in which to do it. You get to Inserlik, call me. This guy Collins, he's the worst kind of rat bastard, Stryker. How this all happened, nail his ass. Count on it. I'm thinking, Hal, he had a lot of help in some circles your way, or he couldn't have taken it this far. We're on the same page. Problem is, Stryker, unless someone talks, we may never shine the light on all responsible parties. I'm keeping the faith. I'll be in touch. Be careful, Stryker. Bolan slumped back in his seat, wincing against fresh waves of pain coursing through his body. He had some time on his hands before they landed, and he had no doubt Bragnola would work his usual logistical sorcery. The rest, Bolan knew, was up to him. They're here. Bring them to me. They insist on keeping their weapons. But of course. How many prisoners? Eight. A paltry number, considering how many of our own were lost. Indeed. Take the prisoners to the quarters arranged. Have your own men stand guard. Do not unchain them. Do not feed or water them. We will treat them as the savages they are. Salan understood why Kalk didn't like the idea of infidels roaming freely about the place, armed to the teeth. Westerners who had slaughtered many Muslims before their plane touched down on the runway. There were many things his men didn't understand these days, but they were paid to obey. They served his will, since his will was merely a divine instrument of God. Lately, he heard the rumors whispered behind his back that it was near blasphemy, borderline madness, for faithful servants of Islam to be in league with Western devils. And he caught the looks more frequently now whenever they entered the great hall, where he sat with his legs folded on top of the white marble table, listening to American rock and roll and drinking Coca-Cola, occasionally slipping some American movie into the video machine, one that was usually rife with sex and violence. Recently, after he had decided to go ahead and hold hands with the devil to further jihad, he had gathered his flock of disciples and gently attempted to explain that to defeat the enemy, they had to understand that enemy. Besides, they owed their ayatollah certain indulgences. This was his palace, left to him by his father, one of the original oil magnates decades ago, when the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company was created. These days, Salan imported heroin from Afghanistan, refining drugs in the bowels of the palace that were then shipped to Lebanon, then to Europe and America. Let the infidels poison themselves. He didn't care. Their lust for drugs provided more cash than he could spend in five lifetimes, arming his troops and bringing the vision of acquiring weapons of mass destruction closer to reality by the day. He smiled, sipped his soda. If they thought him mad, so be it, since it was said madness and genius were kissing cousins. His palace, his music, his world. Soon it would be his show of defiance to the great Satan, interrogating the prisoners, filming for all the world their cowardice, evil and treachery, as he put them under the knife and skinned them alive. Soon, when he had the requisite hardware delivered by the infidels, part of the deal, America would know horror. The entire Muslim world had been under the boot heel of the great Satan for too long. Soon, he would crush his enemies, but not before he tried and executed the Americans who were now his prisoners. They're going to want to know about their money. These jackals murdered many of our brothers in arms. Somali, Sudanese, Lebanese. They were still of Islam. You intend to play host to these devils? I intend to perhaps give them just enough rope by which to hang themselves. The money is my concern, a mere grain of sand in the desert if it furthers our cause. Let us hear them out. They did as I had asked. How can you possibly trust men who so blithely betray their own? Who said I trusted them? Collins didn't believe what he was seeing and hearing. Leading his men into a massive conference room with walls, dome ceiling, and table gleaming white marble, he tried to keep his expression neutral. He had heard about the eccentricities of Harin Salan, but this was more than he'd expected. He balked at the sights and sounds, Python and Falcone nearly walking up his back, Warlock throwing him a look, a sneer forming on his lips. 
Ayatollah Salam was a diminutive figure, five feet tops, with a white turban and white robe, with a flowing white beard and a snowy complexion. He sat at the head of the table, legs crossed. Ten men in black robes wearing black hoods stood at the conference table. The major found the black hoods a little unsettling. The burning eyes aimed their way, sizing all of them up, the assault rifles close at hand. The sooner Collins put Iran behind, the happier he'd be. But with the latest news about the Russians, two days could feel like an eternity and might just become that if the Ivans didn't come through. He stole a look at stereo speakers that were ten feet tall if they were a foot, vibrating teak pounding out the rock. Whatever his views on the Western world, the Ayatollah apparently liked his music. It figured, made a twisted sort of sense. Collins had yet to meet a fanatic who didn't talk out of both sides of his mouth. The strict tenets of their religion meant for the other guy, while those in charge partied like there was no tomorrow. Gentlemen, be seated. What? Collins pointed at his ear. Slowly, a weird smile on his lips, Salon lifted his remote and lowered the din. First, in keeping with our original deal, it is a mere courtesy on my part that you and your men are allowed to keep your weapons. Let's get down to business. Mr. Falcone here says it will be two days before he can reach the Russians and arrange delivery of your merchandise. Really? We had some minor problems. One of our people in Bekaa knew a little more about the operation than he should have. I'm talking detailed records, naming names. It threw our whole schedule off. That's why we landed earlier than I wanted to. That was not of my doing. Whatever, we're talking two days. Then it will be two days before you see the rest of your money. We sort of figured as much. The men that were left with you? You'll be reunited with your CIA comrades in a few minutes when my men take you to your quarters. I will have food and water sent to you. I do hope the Russians do not let you down. I would be gravely disappointed since you have already been paid the bulk of your money. It'll happen. See that it does. That will be all for now. Collins rose, gripping his HK subgun, watched as Salon shut his eyes, smiling, and turned the volume back up. House of the what? <laughs> holy. House of the holy. <laughs> the executioner was in some of the most terrible physical pain he could recall enduring in some time. But he was feeling as angry and amped up as ever. He didn't have time to nurse wounds or dwell on the pain. The enemy had landed and he was busy crunching numbers, laying out the final attack strategy. On a lightning presidential directive, Bolin had been granted full access to the American air base in Encirlik, no questions. Colonel Stone was in charge, and he would get whatever he needed to chase down Collins. The intelligence and black ops wheels were churning. Every piece of hardware the soldier needed scrambled and dropped off by the time he landed and turned Benson over to the CIA for interrogation. The executioner had claimed a private office adjacent to the special ops war room. Right then, an attack team, a combination CIA and Green Berets, was in the war room, nailing down the logistics to get Bolin launched. He was poring over every piece of pertinent intel, the skies over the dasht lut desert region in southeastern Iran swarming with American reconnaissance aircraft. Along with recon photos, sat pics were flying across his table at lightning speed, at least four satellites parked over the region, leaving no piece of rock or stretch of sand unmonitored. Bolin had a fighter squadron of F-15Es and a Spectre at his disposal, his own ride to the LZ, a C-141 Starlifter. At first, Brignola had told him the President was so enraged over the treachery that he had balked at sending Bolin in alone. How Brignola convinced the man to cut him loose, Bolin wasn't sure, but it was happening. Figure one more deniable expendable if it went to hell on the ground in Iran, and the political powers in Wonderland could simply wash their hands of the whole fiasco and call it a rogue operation. It happened all too often. The house that heroin money built. It'll be the house of the damned by the time I'm through. Amen to that, Stryker. According to the CIA and the DEA, Salon exports something in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 metric tons of heroin to the West every year. Ironic, don't you think? You mean, in a country like Iran, where if you get caught with a marijuana joint, they'll march you out to the village square and lop your head off? And all the mullahs just turn a blind eye to a major narcotics trafficker in their own backyard. I imagine they get their cut, or tribute, to see no evil. Besides, we know drug money finances terrorism. 
Bolin checked his watch. He needed to wrap it up with Brignola, engage his fighter pilots and Spectre crew in one last brief. Okay, Hal. I want constant set imagery of the House of the Dam shot to me as soon as you get it. The way it's shaping up for my first look, they've taken the head shed and the marines to quarters at the far edge of the compound. I'm seeing Collins and snakes traipsing the grounds, all of them armed. It looks like they have their own quarters. The word I get here is that there are no servants, no women, no family members in the palace proper, which means I can bring the roof down, wade in, and blast away. So you hope. Not that I doubt your ability, but you're talking 80-plus targets between Collins' and Salon's men. That's why I'm bringing along the Spectre. And believe me, I've got one angry heart. The man has given you two hours on the ground, Striker. Remember that. If you don't nail it down by then... You told me. They send in the special forces. For now, it's your show. Fear not, Hal. Bring back the head of this Collins snake. I'm not planning on leaving him that much. Sounds like I can make book on that. I'll be in touch when I'm in the air. The executioner was so close to the enemy now, he thought he could damn near hear Collins chuckling. Hobby Kalk no longer bothered to concern himself over the sanity of the great leader. The Ayatollah was either truly insane or he was blessed by God with an extraordinary vision for the future of Islam. He could perhaps even see the future, a great victory for all Muslims. The Ayatollah was leading the global jihad to glory, their enemies trampled underfoot like the serpents that they were. Kalk was merely a foot soldier in jihad after all, and left the bigger questions of madness or genius to the will of God. Time always sorted out the mystery and showed to the world at large what mortal men and great men of vision were really all about. He had a job to do right then, working with the demolition team to mine the length of the C-130. As he looked at the banks of computers and other high-tech wonder machines, he was stabbed by regret that such magnificent and ultra-sophisticated tracking and intelligence-gathering tools were destined to become scrap when the massive bird was blown apart. They could sorely use this equipment, and the infidels would teach them how to use it. Before, of course, they were killed. Again, he was in no position to question orders. His men found two more bodies of dead marines stashed in the comm center, which would make four total for the bonfire that would be filmed outside. But it was the two Muslims executed and left on the floorboards where they had been slaughtered that drew his ire. It galled him that Ayatollah Salan had chosen a path that cost the lives of so many fine Muslim warriors. Revenge, though, was soon coming. Again, he decided not to question the wisdom or the sanity of his Ayatollah as his men dragged the bodies down the ramp into the lengthening shadows of dusk. Once he was down the ramp, he saw the main camera mounted on its tripod in the distance, the four corpses hauled, jouncing and bumping over broken ground for several hundred yards, then dumped on the ground. He saw them next, the armed infidel devils, climbing the rise of the hill near their quarters, looking his way, wondering. He hoped they enjoyed the show. Mentally, he reviewed the message as he stepped up before the camera, the statement written by the Ayatollah committed to memory. Is it on? Yes, Pavi. Kulk waited until the bodies were settled behind him, an American flag draped over their corpses, then stared into the camera. He felt the smile harden his mouth line, aware how ominous he looked in his black hood, his assault rifle canted across his chest. What the hell? Collins topped the rise, wondering what was going on himself, following Python's stare toward the activity near and inside the Herc. The Cobra leader pulled up and followed his men, along with Falcone and his second-in-command, Cooper. Fuck. I really didn't want to have to see this. Those are American Marines, after all. So I'll find a vomit bag for you. Toughen the fuck up. This is the home stretch. This isn't good, Collins. Collins glanced toward the firing range, took in the sniper activity, then watched the scene on the plateau floor. They had set up to film... A black hood in front of the main camera, other hoods dousing the American flag over the bodies with gasoline. Then a pack of matches flared up and a fire was started. Two more fanatics toted video cams, one of them aimed toward the Herc. I guess Al Jazeera will be getting a special delivery from the Ayatollah. Jihad on prime time, only I can't imagine they have any gals that look quite like what you see on CNN. I can't see their own version of Paul Azan wrapped up in a chador. You think this is funny, Collins? Hardly. It will be damn painful if your Russian comrades don't come through. And if they don't, 
Then we'd blast our way out of this shit old country. And do what? That's the rest of the demo team coming out of the Herc now. What? Shit. Yeah, that's right, Collins. They're getting ready to blow our ride clear across the border and dump it all over a rock. We've been sitting in that stone hovel for a week now. Shit in a hole, a few scraps of bread, and a bowl of water every day. Maybe you noticed how your Muslim cargo was whisked away to the palace? Right now, they're sipping tea and relaxing in a pool. What he's saying is I somehow don't think we were ever meant to leave Iran. We're gonna end up having our nuts fed to us in front of a camera, just like the head shed and those marines you brought to the Ayatollah. Fuck them. If I have to, I'll kill them all my goddamn self and let Allah sort them out. Touchdown from 10,000 feet up, jarred Bolan to the bone. The Starlifter had sailed in from the northwest, jamming whatever radar and surveillance works the enemy had. The weapons bin was off the ramp seconds ahead of Bolan, opening up from the static line. Then he was on the ground, stripping off his chute pack. The new Beretta 93R with attached sound suppressor was out, scanning the ridge line, but his infrared heat monitor turned up no sign of life in the general vicinity. If the situation on the screens of his flight crew changed, or sat recon showed the prisoners had been moved to the palace, White Eagle 1 would patch through the comlink. The black cosmetics stung a little where his flesh had been stitched up, but it was no time to worry about pain. He moved, silent and swift, in a northwest vector, melting into the darkening shadows, GPS module in hand, the so-called House of the Holy 2.5 clicks beyond the rise and planted on the plateau. The transponder was painting him on the screens of his fighter jockeys, and he knew he was on their clock. Thirty-eight minutes and counting to be exact, the soldier punched in the homing beacon for his weapons bin. Five hundred yards later, he found it and keyed it open. The executioner loaded himself down for war. The enemy didn't know it yet, but the House of the Holy was about to go up in flames. We are the holy warriors of the global jihad. Pavikal paused, his senses swarmed by the sickly sweet stench of cooking flesh. He listened to the flames, staring into the camera, allowed the silence to linger a few more moments. This was his moment to shine. Behind me are American Marines, evil instruments of the great Satan, who would further impose its will on all oppressed Muslim people the world over. The great Satan and its Zionist pawns will soon be unable to continue to rape the earth of its natural resources force their will on the Muslim world and carry on with their greed and their lust. They will know horror and great suffering and sorrow for their sins. In the name of God, who is all-powerful and all-wise, we are issuing a global fatwa to our brother Muslim freedom fighters to kill infidels around the world. Wherever an infidel is found, the infidel must die. These Marines came to my humble country to murder Muslims. And their fate is now the fires of hell, as you see behind me. In the days to come, the infidels will taste the terrible scourge of the wrath of Islam for all the atrocities they have committed against Muslims. America will perish soon in fire, and their Zionist bootlickers will be annihilated in the weeks to come. America and Israel and their demonic allies will soon cease to exist. Your judgment is at hand. Allah Akbar! Dagula felt the air of rising anticipation mingled with anxiety as the Ayatollah stepped into the large parlor room. They had just finished praying, lifting themselves off their mats now, facing the massive opening as one force, where the small Iranian stood, barefoot and running a curious look over the group. The Sudanese colonel, Ayid or something or other, faced the Ayatollah. This is what your emissaries promised us as the big event? Captured by American commandos? My compound raised, my soldiers massacred. Do you know how many of us have died in the interest of your big event? Are you aware that they executed Muslims on the plane and before our eyes? That the Americans you appear to be in league with displayed hatred towards all of us? Would murder any of us without blinking an eye? Dagula screwed up his own courage to ask the question that weighed most heavily on his own mind. Are we your guests, or your prisoners? An inscrutable smile framed the bearded face. Both. Neither. And I am aware of everything that has transpired. You have had an arduous journey, I grant you. You have kept the faith of Islam, and God will reward you for your faithfulness. You will be fed well. 
you will be my guests here. I suggest you rest, for the times ahead will be perilous. There is much work to do, a jihad to win. Should you wish to remain and join the ranks of global jihad, that is your choice. If not, I will return you to your country of origin. Tagula wasn't sure he cared much for the sound of those last words. He was certain they were being issued an ultimatum. Over the years, he had heard a lot about this Ayatollah, a reclusive and mysterious figure who sold heroin to finance his empire. He had never once even seen a picture, even heard a description of the spiritual leader. Now he found himself somewhat amazed how the small Iranian, who looked more Western than Muslim, could wield such power, send out men who would so willingly go to their deaths for him. Habir Dugula found himself craving to return to Somalia, Whatever madness went on under this roof, he wanted no part of it. He wanted to go home. He was wondering how he might broach the subject of return to Somalia, about to step up when a terrorist in a black hood materialized beside the Ayatollah, whispering in his ear. The snow-white complexion seemed to darken with rage. I will return. Collins watched in horror as the C-130 belched apart in thunder and flames. Stem to stern, something like close to a billion dollars worth of America's most highly advanced radar, tracking, sat interceptors, and deception relay gone. Blown all over the desert, vanishing in a cloud of fire. Is there any doubt now, Major, what the future holds for us? A terrible rage boiled up in Collins as he watched the contingent of black-hooded fanatics marching away from the Holocaust. Some bastard still filming the destruction for Al Jazeera or whoever. That's it. It was far from over. They still had 900 million, already electronically dispersed around the globe in various numbered accounts. The Russians were on their own. Hell, everybody was on their own. He, his men, had come too far, killed too many, risked too much to stand on the sidelines and watch it all go up in fire and smoke. All of you with me. Time to go have a few choice words with the Ayatollah. Are you nuts, Collins? We're out number seven, eight or more to one. If, if you're thinking of fighting your way out of here. Show some balls. If you want to stay here, I'll make sure those of us who do the killing and maybe the bleeding and walk out of here in one piece help themselves to a slice of your pie. <laughs> <laughs> Collins wheeled, marching down the incline, the domed mosque and series of minarets rising from the palace, little more than blurs in the tunnel vision of red rage. It took a few moments, adrenaline pumping so hard he wasn't sure what he saw. Then he spotted the contingent of terrorists in their black hoods moving their way, another five or so stepping away from the walled courtyard. The great leader wants to speak with you. There is news. I'm afraid it is not good. Yeah, well, I want to talk to his turban holiness. Collins looked skyward, hearing the distant but rapidly growing scream of fighter jets, then spotted the black shapes of warbirds streaking in, missiles already flaming. The Cobra leader watched the terrorists turn toward the first series of eruptions, briefly wondered what bad news they'd been bringing. All bets are off, I guess. <laughs> What's another hundred million anyway? They were as brazen and willful an evil lot as the executioner could recall coming across in either recent or distant memory. And they had only just begun to pay the price. Poland was racing against the clock, under 60 ticks. New Dragon Squad was en route and ready to cut loose to bring down the roof on the House of the Holy. When the C-130 blew up across the plateau, it signaled the beginning of the end for the damned on two fronts. The soldier was moving out and down a rocky incline, guided by firelight and cutting a wide berth on the six of the hard force in black hoods when the fireball lit up the night with all the sudden swollen and blinding force of the sun exploding. Moments earlier, he had spied the group of maybe 12 or 13 on the distant northern rise, arms flapping, mouths working overtime, guys bent out of shape over the devil only knew what. Bolin had been tempted to take a peek through his infrared binocs. Then the dazzling umbrella of firelight clearly illuminated the unmistakable angry face of Collins. Warlock, Cyclops, and the survivors of Cobra Force were embroiled in a serious discussion among themselves, then turned their anger on a contingent of black hoods marching their way. 22 pounds of firepower in his hands and leading his charge into the night. 200 rounds of 5.56 millimeter full metal jackets good to go in the squad automatic weapon. And the executioner was beelining a straight north vector for the prisoner quarters. 
first to get the prisoners freed and moving, rescue one in the form of an oversized high-tech Gulfstream 3 built to NSA specs, five minutes and counting to touchdown to the west. Then the gloves were off. Two more box mags clipped to his webbing for the saw. An M16 M203 combo hung from one shoulder and a multi-round projectile launcher with 12 40 millimeter frag bombs down the chutes. Couple that with his standard sidearms, another ring of 40 millimeter hell bombs in the instant release ring clip, a dozen hand grenades in an assortment of flash stun, incendiary and fragmentation. If it proved to be not enough, he knew he was in a world of hurt. The first leg might go off without a hitch, hitting the south side of the prisoner quarters, the enemy none the wiser to his near invisible advance on the rear. The Black Hoods who had blown the Herc were jogging up the blind side of Cobra Force when something snapped inside Collins and all hell broke loose in that direction. The savages on both sides went at it. If nothing else, Bolin figured they would shave the odds in his favor by flinging themselves into a mindless wild bunch routine. The executioner was carrying a heavy load of killing power, but figured the only way to lighten his burden was to start using up ammo. With plenty of targets, that shouldn't be much of a problem. The air assault was so orchestrated, so lightning quick and outrageous, meant to vaporize, eviscerate and blow away so many of them on the ground and in the palace right out of the gate, that it struck Collins as a page torn right out of his own bloody manual. He was so pumped up on fury and adrenaline he almost laughed. Their own side had found them, and now was hitting the palace with everything they had. Flaming steel arrows of doom rained from the sky and detonated on the roof, minarets disappearing under the barrage. Not his problem. Let the Muslim bastards inside the palace burn or get buried beneath the roof. There would be fewer fanatics he'd have to kill on the way out. Where there was grim will, there would be a way out. No way he was dying now, when his own cut of that 900 mil was growing by the second. He saw the huge dome of the mosque that rose from the palace lost in a cloud of white fire that dazzled his eyes. He looked away, aware if he was blind for even a split second he was finished. He might just be dead in the next few moments anyway. He felt hot sickness spatter his face, tasted the coppery taint spraying his mouth as he bared his teeth. He glimpsed blood spurting from the shattered skulls of Falcone and Cooper, too slow on the draw to tackle this onslaught of bullets being flung their way. Get the prisoner! Bolin opted to go with the sound-suppressed Beretta 93R, set down the saw, then crouched at the edge of the stone hovel where the Marines and Headshed were detained. Both warring factions were still grinding away with blazing weapons, shadows spinning and falling up the gently sloping incline. The yammering of the saw might alert his adversaries to his presence, and he wasn't quite ready to announce himself. Three Black Hoods came running out the front door, AK-74s up and aimed toward the pitched battle along and beyond the rise. Bolin grabbed the saw by the handle, stole a glance at the warring savages, found them too swept up in their own murderous fury to be aware of the newcomer. He closed in on the doorway, light spilling through the opening. Stay still! Stay back or I'll shoot you! Bolin searched the body quickly and found the keys. Move out! Bolin read the snarls and angry eyes for what they were. Marines who wanted to be uncuffed and armed so they could get into the fight. Move it out, now! Uncuff us! Hurry up! Get us out of here! Yeah, I want a piece of these bastards! Bolin looked into the surging mass of prisoners shuffling in leg irons, picking out the Marine general whose face he'd committed to memory back at Encerling. Never deep. Get them under control. Out the door to your three o'clock, down the back end to the airfield. Your ride is landing now. Go! Harin Salan was simmering with grave doubts and gnawing fear as he waited for Pabi Kalk to bring the infidels to him. He managed to keep up the calm and commanding appearance of the spiritual leader of Global Jihad, but the news he'd just received was coursing waves of anger and even panic through his body. They had just received word from their own sources that General Gerges had been arrested by a joint FSK American FBI team as he was heading for his plane with his cache of VX briefcases. Was this the end of the dream of global jihad? Or was this merely a test of his faith, resolve and courage? It was time to light a fire, figuratively and literally, under the feet of the infidels. They would be disarmed first, the order given to shoot two of them if they resisted. 
With the numbers of fighters he sent to swarm them, the infidels, both greedy and perhaps intimidated that they were on foreign soil, would discover there was no way out, no hope but to cooperate. He balked at the sound and turned, his men freezing behind him. Bolan waited until the last of the prisoners was around the corner, then unleashed the saw. Holding back on the trigger, the executioner moved out and up, sweeping the saw back and forth, black-hooded fanatics flying away under the terrible driving force of the lead hellstorm. Warlock topped the rise. He cut loose, but he found the shattered remnants of fanatics being blown away right before his eyes. He figured a full-blown assault by at least a platoon of American Special Forces was underway. As he moved into the shimmering fire glow along the ridgeline, he presumed the prisoners were already freed. Still, he had to try. He had to know for certain. The way it was shaping up, none of them would leave Iran alive anyway. No way in hell would he just lay down his arms to be snapped up by a bunch of pissed off American commandos and dumped in a cell for the rest of his life. Better to die a lion than live a sheep. With Cyclops on his three o'clock, Warlock eased off the trigger, searching his flanks. No fucking way! What are you- Warlock swiveled his head toward Cyclops, his comrade drawing target acquisition, but whatever he saw had stymied his reflexes. <laughs> Warlock felt his heart lurch, bent on spraying and praying as he topped the rise. He expected to find a couple dozen commandos, hit the trigger, and shoot where Cyclops had fired. But there was nothing ahead except a shimmying veil of firelight. It was nearly laughable. Cyclops gunned down by... what? A ghost? Looking for me, Warlock? Warlock felt his lips stretch in a taut grin, even though he felt his heart leap into his mouth. He was turning toward the familiar voice of the ghost that had cut down Cyclops, but his gut warned him he was way too late. Ah! Striker to White Eagle leader. Bolin was up and over the rise, saw leading the way as he spotted five armed shadows barreling for the wall that ran the length of a courtyard, and the executioner had a good notion of who was on the run. The House of the Holy was engulfed in flames, but Bolin wanted to make sure nothing walked out of the fire and rubble. He didn't need to see the Ayatollah go down for the count, figured he was now most certainly cooked meat. The fighter jets had unloaded warheads packed with enough thermite to set fire to a couple of city blocks. Whatever they didn't get, the Spectre would take out with one last grinding strafe. Right then, Bolin still had mop-up of his own to take care of. White Eagle here, Striker. What do you have? Give me another hard run of the Holy House. Raise Dragon Ship, but have my Spectre give me 15 minutes to sweep the perimeter for stragglers. Aye, aye, Striker. The Executioner gauged the range to his fleeing snakes, unslung the multi-round projectile launcher, and settled down on one knee. The heat from the fire roaring from the ruins of the palace was so intense it wanted to suck the air from Collins's lungs. He figured there was no choice but to sweat it out, head for the area reserved for terror training. A vehicle or two should still be intact there, and he thought there was a helipad out back. With Python, Mamba, and Diamondback on his heels, Collins wanted to believe the worst was over, that they would make it out of Iran. They were being chased, that much he knew, having seen Cyclops and Warlock shot down near the top of the ridgeline. Whatever cropped up in their path, Muslim terrorist or American commando, it was history. He hugged the wall, moving swiftly ahead, the bitter stench of toasted flesh inside the ruins swelling his senses with nausea. He was almost afraid to look back, discovered just how many commandos were gunning for them, but chanced it. He turned toward the slaughter ground up the hill, spied the lone shadow crouched in a kneeling position. What the fuck? Collins heard the next wave of missiles screaming more fireballs through the ruins, making sure any live ones still writhing around in that mess were nailed for good. Hell, he would have done the same, but he didn't much care for being on the receiving end of this shellacking from above. Collins figured out next what the lone figure was wielding in his hands. He was up, grabbing the top of the wall to throw himself over and to cover, then realized he was too late. The blast hurled Collins into the wall, pinning him there for a moment like some bug under a microscope. He dropped to the ground. He saw the world shimmy in the thundering racket of the air assault. He nearly succumbed to darkness, but sensed the lone shadow on the move, and knew he needed to find his weapon. Bolan slowed his pace as he advanced on the sprawled bodies. He held back until the last of the fighter jets had streaked on, then waded into the carnage. The 40mm warhead had impacted near the head of the pack, 
sent them flying in all directions. He spotted three bodies, recognized Python and Mamba. Collins was coming around. It's me, Major. Stone. It's over, Collins. Look, Stone. There's a lot of money. Ten million. You let me walk away. The sweep took all of six minutes. There was no way he knew anything could walk out of the inferno he was now putting behind him. It was all Boland could do to retrace his path, stay on his feet. He didn't give Collins or the others a glance as he moved past them. He was putting distance between himself and the House of the Dam when the specter dropped from the sky to mop up. Bolin felt the plane's motion change and fought his way back to consciousness behind closed eyes. Gradually it came back, the mission from A to Ugly Z. He reckoned they had landed at Andrews Air Force Base, but for some reason he wasn't sure of his surroundings, owed the fog to exhaustion, dehydration, the pulsing inside his skull. He recalled he had gotten a pass thanks to Brignola for any lengthy debrief at Encerlic. Beyond that, everything was a blur. Colonel Stone, are you okay? He pried open his eyes and focused on the black-suited co-pilot standing over him. You're home, Colonel. Home. <sighs> Bolin rose slowly from his seat and moved slowly toward the hatch. You need some help, Colonel? I'll manage. As Bolin stepped past him, he wasn't sure if that was compassion or curiosity on the pilot's face. The executioner squinted at the harsh sunlight stabbing through the Gulf Stream's hatch. One slow step at a time, he moved down the ladder ramp, spotted Hal Brignola waiting at the bottom. He faced his old friend, too damn tired and hurting to speak, too drained to the core of his soul over the evil he had seen and survived. He was grateful Brignola didn't make a point of scrutinizing his battered face. You eat anything lately, Stryker? I can't remember. But right now I feel like a couple of cold beers. Then take me to the farm. I feel like I could sleep for days. Understood. If you like, I could wake up the chef, keep you company over little chow. I don't know, Hal. For right now, I'd rather be alone. This one was tough. I wasn't sure I was going to make it. I had doubts. You're only human, Stryker. I often worry about that myself. But we're always glad when you come home.